Hello, good morning and welcome to WeatherTech Raceway, Laguna Seca and the 2023 Rolex Monterey Motorsport Reunion. We are bringing you what is the best car show that you're going to see anywhere in the world right now. And I'm pleased to say that I'm not on my own doing it because I'm going to be joined for the duration of this fantastic event by the man who will add the colour and the commentary in the announcer booth, the one and only Mr. Johnny Green. Johnny, great to see you. Great to Uh, in the middle of August, some of the greatest cars in the world, probably the biggest historic motor racing event in the world. And remember, it's not just the two days we're going to be covering here on our live stream. It's a whole week of uh, auctions, of concourses. Uh, so many people come to bear on this. I saw cars coming on the way down on the motorway. And it, it's just a very special event. The sun will come out, I promise. Um, but I'm looking forward to this, as always. Yeah, looking forward to it. Lots of cars that we've seen before and some exhibits that we haven't seen before. We stood in front of the We were just sticking our heads in the, uh, in the doors of these exciting cars and fun cars. And most of these cars behind us have driven here from New York. Yeah. Some of the customers are actually here in California, so they brought them over here. Five-day trip, but what a trip. They've been talking about how everybody's been waving. in the day back in the 50s and 60s you did drive your car to the race and then get it prepared and go racing and these people will be going racing historic cars priceless in some instances but you know don't be fooled they're going to be going wheel to wheel pushing them to the limits and big names here as well this weekend adrian newey is just across the way over there about to get into a gt40 and go out a little bit later on this morning we're hoping to have a chat to him yeah you know it's so often in motorsports and I'm, I'm i'm at fault doing it too we talk about the racing drivers and we talk about the cars and that's correct but we often forget about the real brilliance behind them and that's the likes of adrian newey jim hall dan gurney the history of fantastic racing what it is a thanks to the likes of adrian newey so yes we are delighted to have an absolutely star like adrian here can't wait yeah, can't wait to speak to him and also as well, I think Johnny, well, he's gone. He's got to go and get up to the booth because we can hear the announcer over my shoulder here just letting us know that it is going to be Group 1, 1955 to 1967. Small displacement engines are about to go out. Johnny's just literally just run across the way up to the announcer's booth uh, and he's got a guest from the Group 3 car who's going to go and have a chat to him uh, and just talk through what is going to be a fantastic first session here. But lots to come over the course of the weekend and don't forget we are celebrating seven. 70 years of the Corvette. There is an amazing display of Corvettes that are just across the way over there. And they've got a new 2024 model coming out, the uh, Corvette E-Ray, which is 655 horsepower of perfect uh, modern sports car. So I'm really looking forward to seeing that. Also as well, a little bit later on, keep your eyes peeled for the Group 8 Trans Am cars, 1966 to 72 historic Trans Am cars. These things not only look great, but they sound great. They will shake you your ribcage to its very foundations let me tell you and it wouldn't be a Rolex Monterey Motorsport reunion without a visit from everyone's favorite ragtime racers they will be coming up a little bit later on as well right that's it from me let's go straight up to Johnny in the booth with group one here we go thanks Kevin yes as you can see we are straight on it as we look down to the Mission Foods Bridge here at WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca it's somewhat typical that we start today in a little bit of foggy co uh, conditions, but that is Monterey. If you've ever been here before, this is how most days start here on the peninsula. But we are high above the coast. It's about 10 miles away. And growing up in England, to see this site was such a, a sight for me. And I did a lot of motorcycle racing back in the 80s and 90s. And the idea of coming to Laguna Seca was steeped in history and remember that this circuit goes all the way back to 1955 and so this celebration, this reunion is all about that. 14 categories in all and we start 
1967 SCCA production, small displacement, so under two and a half litres. And as you can see, a lot of European cars, as you'd expect. And talking of European cars, <laughs> alongside me, Rick Rawlins, who will be in Group 3. Um, Rick, I'm so delighted you've come up this early in the morning to talk to the people who've tuned in because you guys are what makes this event because it's one thing to get this art, this museum on wheels out there, but for you guys to be driving it is, is very special. You're going to be in a Bugatti, who I've just taken a close look at, uh, very nice indeed. But just tell, tell, give the audience an idea of what this event means to the people who take part in it. So. It's an honor to get to drive these caretakers of these things, and we treat them with respect, and we have uh, a great amount of respect for the people that race them before us, and hopefully people will race them much after we're gone. And this event, to me, is a, a very, very special part of my life. This is the 42nd year in a row I have raced a car here. Is it really? Yeah. Everything from a 1922 Model T Ford race car to a 1979 Shadow Formula One car. years like Christmas morning I'm going to be here because it's such a great place. And is there one particular event or one particular car that stands out to you? Well I like the early cars but um, I also like the, the Formula One group. I think it's the, the DFV Cosworth era is so fabulous and there's some really great guys running in that group. Uh, runs uh, the McLaren racing team. Yeah, he's a very competent driver, and he drives a Williams. Uh, I don't know why he doesn't drive a McLaren. But, uh, <laughs> yes, it's kind of ironic, isn't it? But he actually is driving uh, Dan Gurney's old uh, McLaren uh, Can-Am car. A, uh, uh, let's see. A, a Mark 8D. There you go. Did I get that right? Yeah, I think it's a, a, an 8D McLaren that Gurney ran. Uh, yeah, he, you're right. He, in the Formula One, he's driving the FW07B right. from 1980. And yeah, I'll check on that McLaren. But uh, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, and, and Zach, Zach, Zach is actually typical uh, of, of the kind of folk that come to a race like this as we get ready to do one more lap, I think, under the safety car. So we'll, we won't, won't miss anything. Like I said, just to reiterate, this is the first group, which is Sports Displacement 1955 to 67. But Zach epitomizes what this is all about. Yes, he's the manager director of a, of a current Formula One team, but he also has a love of the sport uh, and the history of the sport. He has a great collection, uh, and the cars that he generally brings to America are the cars that he owns. Yeah, you know, passion is such an overused word nowadays, but yeah. uh, some other friends, uh, Charlie Nierberg is a, yep. a great F1 driver, uh, you know, these guys go out and they they look fabulous and they, they really run the cars hard and then they get out and they take their helmets off and people gasp because they're uh, in their sick 50s and 60s. Thing to get to do. Yeah, it's a relationship. Charles Nurberg, yeah, like you say, I've seen, I've seen him race historics around the world and he is pretty much at an historic event most weekends, uh, usually here in the States, but he does drive, drive elsewhere as well. But uh, what have we got? What, what do you like about this group, this particular group? Because this, if you will, was the beginnings of where Laguna Seca started, I guess, in many ways, because 55 is when it moved from Pebble Beach from a road course, and we have the Jaguar XKX and, and, and many other cars. But small displacement European cars came over and pretty much held their own, didn't they? Yes. Uh, and I'm. These and the RSKs and. You know, the four cam Porsches are so fantastic. But, you know, there's there's a, a level for everybody. There's guys with speedsters, and uh, I don't know if there's any GTAs in here, but I see an MGA. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's what started here, you know. Yeah. So uh, these guys really have fun, and, and you know, a lot of these cars are going, turning faster lap times than they were originally. Yeah, that's what amazed me. I saw on the way down here on the motorway, I was kind of gobsmacked that you know so many of the cars were coming down and the, and the guys were, were driving the cars 
uh, just as they would have done in the day to, br to bring them to the races. But as you say, what's amazing is that you're sat there in a modern car and these cars are just going the same speed as you. They're going 60, 70, whatever it might be. Um, and you're right. Uh, these cars now, some of them are going faster than they were when they were, were brand new. Well, I drove my cousin out here in the Bugatti uh, from Carmel and uh, he thought, well, can these things keep up with modern traffic? So I don't know. We'll see. And he had no idea what he was getting into. And by the time we blasted out here, passed a bunch of cars on the freeway, he, he got out and was a little shaky. He couldn't believe yeah, it. I'll bet. I can totally imagine. Well, we're underway for our first group of the day. We welcome you to... Rolex Monterey Motorsports reunion here in the height of August. As I said, the sun will come out eventually. It always does here in Monterey. It blows off the fog from the hills. And uh, we start roaring around. But just to give you a sense of where we are, let's take you back to 1956 when Elvis Presley was on the Ed Sullivan Show. Rosa Parks was making a name for herself in 55. The comments were rocking around the clock. So that puts you in the scene of what it was like back then. So you've been coming here a fair few years. Um, has, how much has this event changed? Oh, it, it, when I first started coming, it was just a bunch of guys that drug their cars on open trailers and yeah. you know, sat around the campfire and had a beer after the races. And it was very low key. Steve Earle started it. That's right. Uh, 70 and um, you know, it's just gotten more and more and more. I don't want to say professional, but people are serious about it. And of course, we've added cars that are pretty contemporary now, that really give a great show to the, the spectator. I think what impressed started rough and ready, you know, on the back of a trailer. But now, just to get into this event, you have to be so precise with the preparation and the equipment that you use to prepare the cars, keeping it to what was used in the day making sure that it's authentic. They won't just let a, a, a thrown-together car come in here. You have to have authenticity. That's correct. There's enough demand that they, they can really pick and choose the cars that they want. And there's some really special machinery here. And, and most of these cars have a story in their own right. Oh, I'm sure. And that, I think that, that is why I'm so excited to have you up today is we're going to talk about your Bugatti in a moment. But um, I think that's the beauty of this whole event is that every... You know, every car and driver has their own story to tell. We get, as we take a look at the 65 of Rob Walton. And as you mentioned, lots of Porsches. Porsches, Alfa Romeos, MGs. These were the days when the European cars, just basically after the war, there was a, a huge surge of sales for cars. And also, I think the culture, I just mentioned some of the, the, the highlights of uh, what was going on in the States, but there was a sense of adventure and a sense of uh, people wanting to get out and go racing and, and do exciting things like that. So they were looking for an outlet in the weekend. Well, after the, after the war, you know, sports cars were pretty new. The and... Uh, started coming in and drift and grabs and uh, this was really the, the genesis of this form of racing obviously you know in the 20s we had some fabulous interesting racing on the build model t race cars and and go out and then harry miller came along and you know, we have our own racing royalty and racing history pre-world war ii but uh, this is the post-World War II era. Yeah, and as I've got to learn um, how American, obviously growing up in the UK, these were cars that I saw, uh, you know, <laughs> on posters and, 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 and they were normal to see at Silverstone or Alton Park or wherever. Um, and so it wasn't that odd to see a Porsche, but when I see what the likes of Dan Gurney then did with the big power, using the, the big American engine and then putting it in an AC Cobra and kind of mimicking what the Europeans have done so well, um, you, you, got, you start to see how the amalgamation between British, European, and American racing came together. In I mentioned Dan, he, uh, he was a 
really good friend. We're still very, very close with his family, with Evie, who's one of my wife's very best friends. And, you know, I always told him, I can't believe that my childhood hero became my good friend. And that's really what a lot of this is about. You know, Rob Walton's out here in this uh, 26R uh, Lotus, and uh, the thing is a screamer. And, <laughs> and Rob is also obviously a very accomplished guy. But... Successful American businessmen, uh, side by side to, with guys that are mechanics that do all the work themselves and could just barely get their car together and come out here. And we have just met so many fabulous, interesting people all over the world. That's really the best part of it. Yeah, and, and, and people, like I said at the opening, I was just talking to Kev at the top there about how... ...that don't get perhaps uh, the everyday notoriety that people like Dan Gurney are beginning to get now for their role in the development, the innovation. Jim Hall, another one. Uh, so important to the development of racing and the development of car racing from production cars to, to sports car racing. Yeah, I think of what Dan did is the you know, only American to ever build his own Formula One car and win a race with it. And just some spectacular, innovative, creative thinking. In his later years, he built a two-cylinder engine that was a moment-canceling engine uh, that was very, very innovative. And I said, Dan, when you wake up at 2 a.m. and you can't sleep, what do you think about? But I think about designing that engine. <laughs> and as an aside, uh, he sadly he never got to hear it run, but his sons, Justin and Alex, finished it. And over at AAR, they had a big unveiling. We all went over and heard the engine run. It was Roadster, uh, Matt Litchie, uh, Matucci at the wheel, the man from San Francisco. Most of the competitors from California, as you'd expect. Uh, there's a huge, rich history here on the West Coast uh, for uh, racing, especially in historics, because so much of the importing came into this part of the world. And of course, that can, combined with Detroit coming into its own, um, over the years and, and then obviously here it all came together effectively uh, you could argue in 1970 with Trans Am really hitting hitting its stride uh, in April 1970 when Trans Am kind of all manufacturers great drivers from around the world and Trans Am just stole the show and nobody really expected it um, but it was here at the racing really took a name for itself and then of course Sears Point, Sonoma now. Um, these are the circuits that were built when we stopped racing at the likes of Sebring, when, even though we're still racing there, but we stopped using airfields and, and, and you know and drag race strips and we started building purpose-built race tracks. Yeah, this, this is such a fabulous track. And, you know, just sitting here watching the, the monitor, a, a little personal reflection. When you come up the hill, they're going, starting up the hill towards the Brooks group. Uh, in a Formula One car, you have no sensation that you're going up a hill because really? it's so powerful and they stick so well that it's just like going down a hill or going on the flat. It's incredible. Well, it's John Chip Fudge that's out front at the moment. We're looking at the 718. Down, there's a huge entry list in this particular field. 718 is Daniel Schwartz from Bakersfield, California. Another hotbed of great racing drivers in that 1958 Turner 950S. Beautiful car. And we'll get a chance to see over the weekend each of these groups out a couple of times. So if we don't uh, get everyone in on this particular first airing, if you will, uh, we'll hopefully see more of the whole group. This is a massive group. We've got hundreds, literally hundreds of cars here. any one particular car that you have either raced or like in well, this particular group? Well, I believe I, I saw a, uh, a Porsche Abarth in here. Yes, you did. Yeah. And is that Bill Lyons? Uh, we've got Reno uh, uh, Ransom Webster Ransom. did one. Yeah. Right. Okay, that's Ransom. Uh, number 49 right there, I believe. There you go. And uh, 
what a spectacular thing those are. I mean, they're a priceless car. They built very, very few of them. And, um, you know, these guys are out here putting them to the test. It's, it's so great to see cars running at speed rather than just stuffed away in a museum somewhere. Well, let me ask you this, because, I mean, I, 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 whenever I talk about historic racing to people who don't go to these events, they always say to me, well, how do they, how do they get the parts? How do they prepare them? How, how do they run them when, when these parts and, and these cars don't exist anymore? Uh, just give us an in insight into the preparation that goes on. Well, I can't speak to every type sure. of car, of course, but um, there's a niche for for every car, and luckily, in the makes number of the parts, so you can really get on the on the website and just order parts new. Same thing goes for early Bentleys. There's enough cars that uh, you can do that. There's also uh, Bizarrely enough, a company that in Argentina that will make you a brand new Bugatti. <laughs> that that is pretty hard to tell from an original car. So uh, you know, there's there's enough demand and interest with people and and uh, it's great that everybody can enjoy them. Well, there is that 1961 Bob Carrera. Uh, man from Reno, Ransom Webster, pedaling it away. He has a fabulous collection of early, of all era Porsches. In his private museum, it's really great. And with a four cam motor like that, um, he has all kinds of spares and, you know, the roller bearing crankshaft. So you really have to get people that know what they're doing and have experience to rebuild them. So Fudge, Healy and Walton, that's your top three at the moment. This is our first group of the day, 14 groups in all. You're listening to Rick Rawlins, who'll be out in his 1927 Ducati. Uh, 26. Ducati. That's close enough. They're all the same. Well, let me ask you this, because I just saw, I had a closer look at your car. It's magnificent. And I, I urge you if, you, if you please tune in to group three, because it's a treat. Because the, these are early Grand Prix cars, open wheel cars from the late 20s, early 30s. And Bugatti... I mean, to be honest, it, it is synonymous with, with the history of motor racing. And I noticed on the front of your car, Bugatti Club of America. So obviously you mentioned the, the Bugatti Club in, in England, but how, how large and how interesting is, is that? Because uh, I, I hadn't even thought that there would be a Bugatti Club of America. It's a fabulously interesting group. To appreciate that, but... Um, you know, Ralph Lauren's a member. We just have some really interesting people. And there's a number of Bugatti events that they do um, all over the country. And there's also Bugatti tours in Europe that people ship cars over. But there's quite a following of, of Bugatti people here. 1959 Porsche just going for a shot there. Beautiful. Uh, in red, Charles Christensen at the wheel. And that 356 from 1969. And is it hard for you to, to run that car or to drive that car? Because it, uh, you know, it is a very old car. It's a little bit of a challenge. Yeah. I'll yeah, bet. Yeah. Coming down the course group? Well, the, the, the shift pattern's opposite. So right. first, first okay. is where second's supposed to You get it ingrained in your head, uh, a, a typical four or five speed, and you have to reprogram your, your brain a little bit. And what's its history? Where did you get your hands on it? Where was it before? It, it was uh, sold new in France. And uh, I have all the owners' uh, names and addresses. It ran at Montlaret, at the Bol d'Or. And uh, then it was, kinda, it was used by a guy who had a large collection of Bugattis back in the 50s and 60s. And then uh, uh, Auto Zipper imported it to this country. And it's been here ever since. It was uh, owned by the registrar of the Bugatti Owners Club. And I was like yourself. There's always one thing that kind of tends to go or tends to be replaced the most. Is there anything on that particular car that, that you have to go, ah, i got to keep an eye on that? Well, you're, 
you're going to jinx me because I'm going to oh, say no. I'm sorry. Then, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the clutches are a little sensitive, but you know, talking about the Group Three, however, we have a huge disparity in, in cars. We have cars up to 1955. Wow. Because there's not enough cars to really yeah. put on a race, so we have incredibly fast cars with slower cars, and uh, and it's all about respecting the other driver. Yes, I can imagine. Well, this group one well underway here in the mist and fog of Laguna Seca as we get underway for the 2023. Charles Christensen in that 356 heading back up the hill and up towards the corkscrew. You're right, it just that hill is much steeper than it looks, certainly from above that WeatherTech bridge and look up that you start to realize just how steep it is. I've done a lot of bike racing here in the past and when you look up there, five stories, um, I, bet it, I bet your heart still goes in your mouth whenever you go down there, doesn't it? Well, you turn left down the corkscrew, you can't see anything. You know? Right. So you, you kind of think you're headed towards the apex, but you're not exactly sure. So sometimes you, you nail it, sometimes you don't. You know, Laguna Seca is probably facetiously the only place in the world where you can experience winter and summer in, the, in an hour yes <laughs> and i never know whether to wear levi's or shorts so you bring both i guess warm so you'll have a nice sunny day here in, in an hour or so yeah i i made the mistake uh, of many times coming here in august thinking well oh somebody's gone off saturday uh -oh. that's the number seven of horatio fitzsimmon in that uh, that's a shame. I never want to see anybody go into the gravel, and let's hope that that isn't because of anything down on the track itself. Of course, the Laguna Circuit, uh, Laguna Seca Circuit, resurfaced re recently. How much difference has that made? It's really smooth. It's it's very nice. Resurfaced the whole track. Uh, got a new. Some guys, Bruce Canapa and John Fiber and, and Ned Speaker, and some guys that are real racers have taken over. The track and they're doing a great job. Yeah, that little alpha that went off, that, that's an important car. Yeah, and that's the thing. I mean, none of these cars aren't important. There's a ratio with Simon in the Lotus. I thought it was he that went off, but it wasn't. He is pedaling hard as he comes out of the uh, corkscrew. Flat out down the hill towards the rainy corner. Wayne Rainey here this weekend. He lives just across the way, the famous three-time MotoGP or Grand Prix 500 champion. You see that little number seven? 26R. 26R, yeah. The, those are unbelievable sleepers. They look like a little kitty car. Yeah. And they're really, really fast. And lightweight, but right? There's a checkered flag. So check and flag is out, and not a surprise to see Chip Fudge, John Chip Fudge, winning here, as he often has so often. And moving past Cameron Healy, third. Rob Walton, who we mentioned earlier, took fourth place. Mike Sweeney in fifth, and Paul Freestone in sixth. William Lyon in seventh position. But a nice way to get us into the groove of what will be a moving history for the weekend as part of the Rolex Monterey Motorsports reunion. And it's an event that doesn't just take place on these two days. It's been going all week long. Do you get part? Do you get involved with the whole week? We, uh, they don't run the, the really early cars at the pre-reunion. We used to call it the prehistorics. But last week... But um, this week up here is just crazy. You know, I've, I'm trying to perfect being at two places at once. I've, al <laughs> I've almost got it down. But, uh, you know, there are like five auctions and there are car shows everywhere and, and the racing. And of course, uh, Pebble Beach is on Sunday, yep. which is just it's the Kentucky Derby of car shows. And it's just fabulous fabulous event. Well, you've been listening to Rick Rawlins. He'll be out. He's about to get good, grab his suit and get going because he's out in that beautiful Bugatti coming up in Group 3. So we'll hear from him. Feel free to come back and, and share some more 
thoughts on that and how you get on because you're always welcome up here. I try to encourage people, especially if they're driving, to come and join us because this is who the fans want to hear from is, is what you guys do so well. Thank you, Rick. And we are underway. We'll take a short break here from Laguna Seca and we'll be back with more from the reunion after this. the moment to plan your trip to Monterey County. So as our first group leave the track here at the Gunasega just before turn 10, let's head down to the pit lane and Kev is out and about already. Kev, let's go down and find out the latest. Kev, who have you found? You're up against the pallet on the front there as well, apparently, John. Yeah. Well, good morning. Thanks, Johnny. Uh, look who I found down here on the grid. He's a busy, busy man, but uh, he's going out racing. Adrian, great to see you. You've got a busy season, and look at what you do on your weekends off. Tell us what you're driving today. Uh, my old Ford GT40, which I've had for over 20 years now. Uh, Mario Andressi, race engineering him. So it's great to be back. Um, really nice atmosphere out here. I've really enjoyed the weekends. Did, did the prehistoric last weekend and now here. This is the great thing about the Rolex event that people may not realize you are, you know, incredibly busy in Formula, like I say, but, you know, at the heart of all of this, you're a fan the same as everyone else. You love getting behind the wheel of these classic and historic cars. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, it's a very different to the day job. It's a bit of fun. It's driving rather than engineering. I think feeling the car and, and, and then being able to translate what the drivers are saying. So it's, it's, it's really enjoyable. Yeah, really enjoyable. And events like this are going to be coming more and more important as we move through the technological era that we're going towards, electrification, uh, hybrid technology, all of these things. You know, keeping these cars running, it's more important than ever, isn't it? It is indeed, yeah. No, and I think, it's, you know, it's great. It's a tribute that classic racing out here is so strong. Um, classic car scene. We were in, came to Sausalito for a few days before we came here and there's a little classic car meets all over the town. So it's lovely. It's a good atmosphere. And just one quick one. I've got to ask you, having a fantastic season with Red Bull, what have the other guys got to do to catch up with you this year? <laughs> I'm not telling Adrian, enjoy your drive. Let's have a little roll, shall we? Should we have a little walk and a talk? There's a man at the front who's a pal of Adrian, as an actual fact. Jared Lopez in car number 27. He's got 260 cars. Adrian, uh, but you've put your car in the front row of the grid, and yet you've never driven here before. <laughs> yeah, no, I've never driven here before. But uh, the track is uh, flows quite naturally, uh, so it's a lot of fun. Um, it's a tr I mean, it's tricky, but it's, it's super nice. I was quite surprised that I grabbed pole position and this car that you're in there's a quick story about it just talk to us about the Le Mans film because you'd have to be pretty eagle-eyed to have spotted this one before yeah because uh, it actually ran this way in period and then uh, it became a Porsche 917 for the Le Mans movie with um, with McQueen um, and it was bought out of the production company and re became what it was initially but yeah it's uh, it was both a Lola and a 917 at some point in time Super stuff. Listen, Jerry, I've got people just sort of waving at you. There's a man holding a four or five minute board. So get your helmet, get your gloves on.
grid this is then for this next selection of cars that are going out. We've got Adrian Newey lining up in four in a GT40. Red Bull and Ford already getting their uh, match up there. Gerard here going out the front um, in just uh, an in hugely historic. Is all of these cars in some cases are priceless. Some of them are indeed just, there's only one of them in the world in some cases. But you watch this one. They're going out. They're going to get wheel to wheel. They're going to be racing. These guys haven't come here just to put on a show. They've come here to be the show. So, Johnny, this one is going to be really, really exciting. I think I'll hand back to you because it's about to get very noisy down here. And there's a chap over there holding up, I think, a two-minute board just over my shoulder. So, what a great start to the event, Johnny. Absolutely, Kev, yeah, and doesn't get any better than the GOAT, in my mind, Adrian Newey. Uh, what a story, and what a, what a name drop there. I mean, he's, he's been a, a class act and been part of the world champions of the likes of Lewis, and of course, Verstappen more recently. He's going to be taking on the challenge of Ford, uh, which is really interesting, the future looking so bright, but to have him here is so exciting and i think it's a it's a part of historics that is not forgotten that's the wrong word but it isn't given i don't think the gravity that it should be they go about the innovations adrian being absolutely will go down in history as one of the greatest of all time um but we celebrate that as much as we celebrate these beautiful pieces of art and i'm glad to be joined here in the booth by a man who First of all, I don't know how you and your team do your job because this is no uncertain undertaking. This is, it's got to be precise, it's got to be right. You're dealing with very wealthy folk, let's be honest, uh, who are kings of industry, uh, or an Adrian Newey, um, who is absolutely one of the most respected people in motorsport. Um, not Absolutely. I mean, this is a this is automotive Disneyland for all these people, you know, for our guests, our drivers, and uh, you know they come from all walks of life. Like you said, they're captains of the industries and things like that. But they're here to have fun. Our job is to make sure that they're having fun, that they're out there enjoying themselves, enjoying their cars at a safe speed for all the guests to enjoy, and they get to drive them at speed. I mean, it, it is just an absolute crazy environment that everybody here. You know, and I know Adrian uh, is a, a huge fan of doing this sort of event because it takes him back to his roots. I mean, he pretty much, you know, graduated uh, with this in mind uh, from, from university. Uh, and the rest is history, as, as I said, in Formula One terms. But he's also been interested in yachting and motorcycle racing. I've seen him at MotoGPs many a time, looking very closely at the fins and the wings and the aerodynamics of that. He is an absolute study of design and what makes things fast and efficient. He's also like, a, I've referred to Dan Gurney and Phil Renner. Tinkering. Adrian's the same way. I think he's always tinkering, always looking at what's the next thing to make it a little bit faster, more efficient. And uh, that's, that's what makes Adrian Newey, Adrian Newey, I suppose. Yeah, and you know, it, it harps back to where here in California, those tinkerers, uh, those people that took those European cars, Dan Gurney included, Parkinson Specials, you name it, they, uh, uh, Hoffaker, you know, the, the names of people who were like Adrian, who wanted to sort of, well, what if we did this? And how could I make it lighter? And what if I took the headlights out and made it into a, you know, help, help the brakes? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> That's what the car culture of California, especially the Southern California car culture, when Carroll Shelby was developing his cars, he went out of Venice, out of the airport, and as you see on the movies and things, I mean, that all happened. I mean, they were all looking for the power, looking for the design and the speed. And uh, here we are at the Rolex Monterey Motorsports Reunion, seeing all the efforts of these great legends and uh, what, what is happening out there. Beautiful, absolutely gorgeous. This is Reunion Group 2. And these are the FIA Manufacturers Championship from 1960 era because you had so much going on. You had Can-Am, you had this. Uh, Trans-Am was starting to really make a name for itself. So there was a lot of competition, but the drivers and the manufacturers' interest in this particular worldwide was huge. Oh, absolutely, and especially with the Can-Am, where absolutely no rules existed. Right. And to see these cars rumble to life back here at, uh, in Monterey, and we have a great group, and you know, we it's, it's just 
history and motion that we just so enjoy. And the, the caretakers of these cars, because they are just the caretakers. These cars are going to go out longer than anyone else. Hopefully that we continue to keep them on track, keep them running, and that they're not just put away into museums or become history pieces that people look at, oh, that used to run. We love the history. We have the ragtime racers all the way up to these groups. Um, you know, really sharing history in a, in a motorsports you know, museum coming to life, really. Yeah, and when you think about what's gone on this week where people are going to auctions or going to these cars uh, where they're not running, to actually come here for the weekend and actually see them on track must be so special. Oh, absolutely. Just, you know, if, even if you don't buy a ticket, I'm not suggesting you don't buy a ticket, <laughs> but even if you don't buy a ticket, you can still go through the streets of Monterey, down Carmel, and you see some of the most amazing streetcars yeah. running around that you just don't see anywhere else. You know, the Bugatti Varons and, and just, it, it's just an absolute eye candy. And I, I'm still, I get my goosebumps up when I see these cars when I'm just safe manner and um, you know, we just love bringing all these people together they love being here in Monterey we have our our morning cloud cover and uh, so all the, all the people from the southwest and the east coast they love it here because they can actually walk around and not have the heat and people really enjoy it. and they, they share their cars with everyone and just have a blast we're looking at Gerard Lopez behind the pace car at the moment Gerard in a T70 Lola from 1969, Lola, Ford, and cars from all over the world, Brazil, Switzerland, got drivers from all over the world as well, from the UK, from obviously California, even Luxembourg represented Switzerland and Brazil. The year every year. It really is. We work all year long on this, and, and as the director of heritage events for this event and Porsche Rennsport that's coming up, it's really... It's a passion, it's a love of what we do, and I left for about three years ago, for just about seven months. I came back, and I came back to the cars, but really it's about the people, the drivers who are here. They're here to have fun and share their cars. They love talking to people. They love putting kids in their car seats, taking pictures and things like that. So there's so much to do, more than just a static car display. Uh, we're rolling and they're sharing their cars. You can hear them out on track of uh, making these some beautiful, beautiful music. And it's just a celebration of motorsports. We just absolutely enjoy having everyone here. Yeah, I mean, I don't know whose final decision it is, but there's always, I've been doing this event a few years now, and, you know, each time you tweak the groups by a year or here or a year there, or try to, in this, in this particular event, 70th uh, anniversary, McLaren 60th, of course. Um, so you're always looking at how to, if you like, emphasize a particular mark. Yeah, absolutely. That's kind of a, the cornerstone of the events, having a featured mark or a celebration. Last year was the celebration of the kickoff to the... And uh, we've got, we're looking at not just next year, but we're looking at about five years down the road of kind of reimagining what this event is to keep it fresh so it doesn't become stale, keep new cars coming in. And as you mentioned, we have cars from Switzerland, uh, Luxembourg, Brazil, of reattracting the international entries uh, obviously coming out of the covid transportation costs car parts and things like that have put kind of a detriment or a, a, a dent into a lot of people's travel schedules but they're starting to come back this year is a good good return to that and uh, so we've got a lot of plans going on and we start planning 2024 in in earnest on monday as soon as, as soon as the checkered flag waves here and the transporters leave, we're already meeting. What yeah, it doesn't doing. surprise me. It really doesn't. It does take a village, and it does take a year at least to get this all together. Here we go then. Group two underway for the FIA Manufacturers Championship from 1961 to 1971. And it is Gerard Lopez leading the way in that Lola with a bunch of Fords behind him as the pace car pulls off. innovation as you say where not anything goes but it wasn't far off <laughs> it, it, absolutely it, you know now now you have so many technical rules and things like that look at formula one indycar and everybody but uh th these are unbridled cars of, and the designer's imaginations to go as fast as you can and have the endurance to compete and uh what i, I can't remember who it was that said or that was colin chapman 
we, we don't mind the race cars falling apart after yeah. they cross the finish line. So Yes, I've, I've talked to Brian Redmond many times about some 917s he got into that were sometimes a little bit rattly, shall we put it that way. <laughs> that was uh, Gregory Gaird. And a 911S just making a move there into second place, but he's got a battle on his hands. Look at him side by side up towards the corkscrew as Lopez continues to lead. Down the hill they come. What a wonderful sight this is. And the number nine holding his own, that's Alex McAllister. And I'm guessing. Right? Yes, it is. <laughs> Chris is a fantastic guy. He owns a beautiful, some beautiful cars. He loves to share them as well. And uh, just a class act. And that's the other thing about uh, historic racing, particularly in the States, uh, and I know so obviously at Goodwood in England, um, it's the same guys meeting every year. That's, that's what they enjoy more than anything. Well, the, yes, it's racing the cars, but getting back together with the people who have the like mind. Absolutely, the camaraderie among the drivers. They, they, they want to share their car, they want to race their car, but they also don't want to abuse their car or do any damage to their car. These are top, top most concern. But the way they drive them out here right now is uh, pretty special. Yeah, I, do, I wouldn't even want to estimate <laughs> what what the worth is here on this peninsula in this week. Yeah, but I see the uh, Dave Hagen in the uh, Porsche 910. Beautiful, beautiful car. Is there any cars, while I've got you, because we're looking obviously at this particular group too at the moment, but are there any special cars that you want to point out? weekend and say, wow, I had no idea that was going to be there. Well, uh, you know, the con we have not run the Can-Am cars in a, in a few right. years, so that's always fun. And um, also we brought is very cool. Uh, Zach Brown brought out the uh, ex-Mario Andretti car yep. uh, winner, so he's got that racing. It's just, they make noise. They're great drivers. A good contingent of them are from Australia and New Zealand. Monterey, because they love coming back. And, uh, we, but your point is, we do shake it up a little bit. We want new groups, and we're going to be changing a few groups next year. Uh, we're always going to protect as well, because this is a few, one of the few places in the world that run those cars. And uh, so we always want to keep that alive. Oh, oh, coming around the turn How close there. do you want it? I mean, you know, we say that we don't want to hurt any of these cars, but they are not holding back at all, are they? I love this. Now, they... Uh, they, they do go out a little here, a little bit. There's Adrian coming by. Yeah. Adrian Newey. And he's crossing the line in the GT40. Plus, plus we just did the repaving of the of the track surface, so they're learning. When they first went out, the grip is completely different than what they're, they they had expected from uh, previous years. So it's a little bit faster, a little bit grippier. So they're uh, still learning a little bit, but they're going at it here. I did stupidly when I saw that Adrian Newey was part of the event think, oh, what would he drive? And then, of course, went, of course he's going to drive a Ford. <laughs> the managing director of Ford is here this weekend. I wonder if they're going to have a quiet little meeting uh, to see how the future looks. Maybe. And there's, there's <laughs> some other special guests coming in on Saturday as well that uh, uh, they're, fl they're flying in just for some cars, talk to a few people, and then fly back out. Brilliant. But um, it's a we have our Grand Marshal Ron Fellows here this weekend, and, yeah. and uh, we've had Jackie Eeks and, and, and so many legendary people. Tom Christensen. Uh, retiring the R8 on track tomorrow. They won't selfies. retire him, though. No. He... <laughs> yeah, he's yeah. busier than ever. He's I mean, busier as ever, I mean, and what a handsome young man. I know, it's annoying, <laughs> it's isn't like, it? Yeah, it absolutely I'm hoping is. he's going to come up here, because I'm going to remind him I met him when he was a curly-haired, well, he still is. A curly-haired 20-year-old 20, 20 at Formula 3 in Macau, but all those years ago. <laughs> so, yeah. Now, Tom Christian, absolutely a legend of Le Mans. Nine-time winner. It doesn't get any better. And I think that's the beauty, Barry, of what all of this is about. I just mentioned or allu alluded to Ford coming back into Formula 1. We've got our own Ford uh, engines and a lot of the cars that are going to be on display here and racing here in, in our Formula 1 group. But, you know, for the cynic, perhaps, tuning in saying, well, what's the point? Why, why would I be interested in this? Is that, yes, you have the history of the automobile here all the way back, in, in this case, to 1927 and in, and in the ragtime even further back. And yet, it's relevant today. Adrian Newey is at the top of his game and Max Verstappen is there because of this man. Yeah, and I, and I don't think that's overemphasizing. Yeah, no, I mean, your, your, your path forward is your history. And 
certainly in motorsports, you've got to look at your past and see what worked, what didn't work, and how to tweak it, and um, that's where we keep going. But you know, I do want to say, all of the people who are, who are coming here or watching here, the uh, Corvette Her anniversary display is amazing. GM brought uh, six cars from the Heritage. Ten years or so. They took three weeks to get those cars fired up, the Surf 1, 2, and 3. So they're out on track taking, doing uh, exhibition laps as well. Yeah, I'm excited for Corvette because, again, there's a company. Uh, they've got their E-Ray coming. And, you know, it, 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 is, it is not stuck in the past at all. And it's almost... I, I'm, the only other car I can think of is, is the 911 that has had relevance in so many True. decades. Have you seen the E-Ray down in the... Yes, I have. That is, that, is a, that is a pre-production, so that's why it's being okay. used a little bit gingerly. But, um, yeah, they wanted to bring it out and, and celebrate their history. So, yes, it's very much a look at the history of how we got here, but also just touching now and again on the future of what all of these manufacturers and marks are all about. Some are still here, some aren't, um, but there are evidence of the, the DNA, if you will, in every car that's here. Absolutely. And each, each one has a unique story, and uh, that's, that's one of the things about this event also is the Advisory Council really vets the cars to make sure that they do have provenance. They're the real deal. They're not just uh, replicas or continuations. And looking around the paddock, and you see the names of some of the drivers that have, that have you know, piloted them in the years past. You know, does the car make the driver famous, or does the, fam does the driver... Or does a car make the driver famous? So, Good point, yeah. That's yeah, uh, kind of a always fun well, to find out. Well, what I find, certainly in Formula One terms, is that you tend to get that amalgamation of the best car and the best driver because it just seems to be that way. You would very rarely get, you know, somebody driving the top car in Formula One or sports car racing that isn't equal to the match or able to push it to its limit. Oh, ab absolutely. Alan Turpins from Sao Paulo in that 911 TR from 1967. He heads up the hill. And we also saw Dave Hagen a moment ago um, from California in a 1967 910 Porsche as we look down the corkscrew. A lot of people, as always, here in August. I know that it's not sunny yet, but when the sun does finally uh, come out, it, it'll be glorious. And I hear there's a hurricane in, off the coast of Mexico, so it's oh, like, lovely. You know, people are talking about this going, uh-oh, what's going on? But our weather's going to be beautiful. It's well, you just continue. have to do another week, Barry. No, no problems. Yep. They'll, they'll all stay. Instead, instead of Monterey Car Week, it'll be Monterey Car Month. <laughs> yeah, I like it. Well, there's a 55 911. That's Matthew Goatsinger at the wheel. 36. And it's still Alex McAllister out front, Gerard Lopez in second place, Remy Lips, Remo Lips in third position, and Dina Perez in fourth, Ray Gregory in fifth, and Adrian Newey, who we spoke to just before the start of the race has dropped now down to sixth place just ahead of Jonathan Rosenthal. John Goodman, Dave Hagen, who I just mentioned there, ninth position, and Alan Turpins, the Brazilian we saw in the number 40, he rounds out the top 10. But it's not about who's where. We do not award race winners in this, yep. so there is no first, second, and third prize. We award the spirit of driving, the camaraderie, the, the, the car preparation, so we have a number of awards. But first place, second place, third place does not play into it. I, I'm always interested, uh, given the week that is the Monterey reunion, um, generally speaking, the auctions and so on, how many of the cars that get auctioned here uh, at Pebble Beach end up? It's interesting to look at the auction catalogs. I go through them every year, and the provenance or the race history of some certain cars accepted into the Rolex Monterey Motorsports Reunion. So it is a calling card. Uh, it does provide value. It also ensures that the car does have authenticity and provenance. So if we accept it, it's a, a privilege to be here. We don't accept all the cars, obviously. We uh, had to decline many cars because they don't fit the parameters or we just have too many cars in a group. 
we pared it down to 400 cars this year. Uh, at one point, that's the tug. At one point, we had 610 cars in the paddock and realized that's about 200 too many. So we prepared it down to 400 to make sure that each car is the actual car, the real deal, and uh, to also in, you know, make the paddock breathe a little bit to um, have our guests enjoy the experience without being crammed into their pit space. It's an incredible number. Just to reiterate that, Barry Topke, who is, of course, part of the organizers here for the weekend here in Monterey, over 400 cars out and about for the weekend as we take a look at the 07. In California, in that beautiful 911T IMSA GTU, pedaling around in that 07. What's been the reaction to the resurfacing? Because uh, I'm sure that that's been a few new lines that people are taking. Uh, we had IndyCar out here about three weeks ago doing some testing with Firestone, and they were very slow at first, kind of checking the surface out. By the end of the session, after a four-hour session, they were just one second off the uh, track record, and they were not pushing it. So when IndyCar is here next month, they're expecting track record to fall. Yeah, I can imagine. Which is great because, I mean, for those that love to follow the history, it's, you know, there are those that go straight to the lap records, aren't they? I'm just watching the, the screen here, the, the closing time right there. Yeah, the closing amazing, speed huh? was just incredible. And that's, that's the other thing that we look at for the groups is the speed disparity. Yes. Some of these groups are great. And we have our chief steward and our stewards of each group talking to the drivers to make sure that they understand and make sure they're looking at their mirrors. If they point out, don't move off the line. Uh, you know, be as safe and courteous as others. Again, not here to win a race. That's just a beautiful car right there. It really is. Remo Lips, what a great nine. The 1969 Ferrari. Making an absolutely glorious sound around the hills of Monterey. And the number nine of Alex McAllister in that Ford GT40. They do. These two have been going at it the whole, the whole time in this group too. They'll be out again. And like I said, if you don't see the car that you love immediately, we will be showing this group again as we do with all the groups later in the weekend so stay tuned get a look on, on online at uh, Monterey Reunion and have a look at the schedule we'll put it up on a graphic uh, now and again so we've got a chance to see when your favorite cars are coming out but really uh, I, I think it's just time to sit back and enjoy quite literally the history of motor racing and, you know sometimes I'll uh, you know, I'm running around very And to kind of watch these glorious cars and the sounds of these engines just go by, it's like, oh yeah, that's why we do this. You know, you, you get stressed out, you work hard, but it is all about having entertainment and joy of, of sharing these automobiles with everybody. And you know, I, I often get told, oh, you know, with, with electric cars now becoming the thing, you know, combustion racing is gonna, you know, it's not gonna carry on. I, I say no, and this event proves it. 400 cars? Uh, absolutely. and. and and they're the right cars, too. Yeah. And we're, we're looking at a variety of groups for next year. Like I said, we're going to shake it up a little bit. We want to reimagine the event just a little bit. But we want to keep it fresh and people coming back. Our ticket sales were very strong. And uh, you know, our walk-up and Mission Gate sales are very good, too. So you know, people come out here. It's not that expensive of a day trip. And uh, enjoy, enjoy this music. Uh, of the 20th and 21st century, let's face it, without the car, how would we have advanced as a, yeah. as a humanity? I mean, I know that sounds very heavy, but, but, but at the same time, this has been something that has been part of everybody's life. Can you imagine this, this event if they're all electric vehicles? Right. Very different. I don't think very many people would be here. Uh, it would be a different thing. So hopefully, through the years, we, as we evolve with the, with the groups, we can continue to do this and people still share their cars. Yeah, and people forget, and, and it took me a while to, to kind of put my head around. Electric cars were around back in the early days. Very true. Ah, oh, these BMWs, they crack, crack me up, I love them. Not quite as, force as, as fast as that number 19 of Remo, that Ferrari 312P. I believe that's, that's the uh, car from Switzerland. Yes. Ah, right. Yes, it is, yeah. 
here. So I was in touch with them a while back, and I said, can I enter? And I looked at the photo of the car and looked at the history. It's like, oh, <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, absolutely priceless, of course. As the checkered flag does fly then, and it is Remo Lips that uh, takes it across the line. An absolutely stunning, stunning car. And well driven. Yeah, beautifully driven. And like you say, I think the awareness is the key. What would is around me because you've got professional drivers. It takes, I mean, you, you, you can't just throw anybody in one of these cars. <laughs> I was actually offered to drive a Cunningham Corvette up just for a photo shoot. And I was looking at it going, I don't want that responsibility. No, no. <laughs> no thank you very much, but uh, no thank you. Yeah, I can, I can well imagine. No, very clean race, exciting. Great passing. Barry, before I let you go, good luck to you and your team. But just a mention for the volunteers, many hundred, of course, involved in the preparation and the running of this event. Absolutely. We have the Laguna Seca Volunteer Association that have been around for, it's a new organization, only three years old, but the gentlemen and ladies who are part of it have been here sometimes up to 40 years. They just absolutely love coming out here and, and being a part and behind the scenes. And some of, the, some of their jobs are not glamorous. They're in no. concessions. They're, they're taking Early waters over every place. But it, we could not ever, ever hold this event or any of our events here at Laguna Seca without the volunteers. Absolutely not. They're a great group, and they come from all over. We have some people coming down from Idaho. And they're just a wonderful team, and they, they, they make this of only about 35 people. So it's, uh, it takes an army. And as you can see by the photos, we have to build a, a little city here. Yeah, no you know, the, Hag the Haggerty Marketplace has to be built, with all the tents and everything. And, and it's not an overnight uh, process, that's for sure. I can imagine. Well, listen, Barry Tucky, who is the Director of Heritage Events here at Laguna Seca, thank you for coming up. Uh, please encourage anybody uh, who's interested to come and share their stories with our audience worldwide. We thank you for tuning in. We thank you for putting on this amazing event each and every year. Uh, we're going to take a short break from Laguna Seca. The reunion continues in 2023 after this. Welcome back to Laguna Seca. It's the Monterey Reunion Weekend here. The sun yet to come out, but if you look in the distance there, that uh, fog or mist is starting to dissipate. Can't see the sea just yet, but you will later in the day. But that's how it goes here at Laguna Seca, if you've ever been here. Uh, sometimes it's even mistier than we had this morning, but it's, it's starting to clear up. And certainly not misty-eyed, well, he might be by the end of the day, is Kev. What are you up to, Kev? What's, uh, what's going on, Dan? Lovely, thanks, Johnny. Well, I'm down here now with a man who is very important in these parts, President and General Manager of the WeatherTech Raceway, Laguna Seca, John Narigi. John, great to see you. Thanks for stopping by. You're a busy man, but you've also been very busy since we last saw you at this Rolex event last year. Tell us just some of what's been going on here in California with this racetrack. Yes, yes. We finally uh, put in a resurfaced the track completely. We uh, took out the old 50-year-old start finish bridge and added a beautiful bridge that is ADA and golf cart accessible quite a bit wider major ramps and I'm happy to report too we found a wonderful sponsor came in and sponsored a good portion of the bridge construction so we've been cleaning up Laguna Seca we've done quite a bit of painting uh, we've dressed up this event once again kind of take off from what we did last year and we're very proud. Uh, we're proud of the direction that Laguna's going. Uh, the monies was just shy of $20 million. The Board of Supervisors on a 5-0 vote and the Parks Department, which made it all possible. And uh, we're thrilled. Uh, we're, we're, we're really looking ahead for the future. You know, the rest of this season is we have the Indy Championship coming. And then, of course, we have the Ren Sports Reunion that we're proud to be 
the ones that were selected to have that world-renowned event right here in Monterey County. Listen, John, you've done an awful lot of work and the place does look fantastic. One thing that really impressed me, because I was following you on your social media, the speed with which you got all this work done. The old bridge came down, the new one went up, and the track was laid. I was watching this on Instagram and I'm thinking, they are going to town here. And you did it quickly. Well, we did. It was supposed to be a five-month project, Kevin. It ended up as being eight months. And it was... The bridge was up, but the track was a challenge given the weather conditions we had and the age of the infrastructure of the facility, which meant drainage, uh, underground engineering, all had to be redone. But uh, we got it done, and we're thrilled. It's been open, well, August 28th, we've been open for two months on the track. Listen, tell everyone well done from us because we were impressed watching all this. But well, what a place to have to renovate as well. 19, what was I saying, 1957, the Pebble Beach road races moved from the roads yes. to the track and Perfect. you just keep in the history alive. And that's what this event's yeah. doing as well. Yeah, And that would be August 6th, 1957. Excuse me. Yes, yeah, 66. And I love telling people this because I was born August 6th, 1957 one day prior so maybe it's a little bit about fate i don't know but it's been a good run so far i'm, I'm going into my fifth year operating and uh, the team here is awesome the volunteers are awesome our reunion advisory council couldn't do it without them uh the future is very bright for laguna yeah, it really is, and bright for this event as well. We were just chatting, nearly 400 drivers have made it out here. It doesn't get any easier keeping these cars running, but nearly 400 people have done it, and they're putting them out on track, and they're racing them. Yes, and, and these are the way it used to be done with just 400, because they are all authentic. They go through tech. These are the cars, and this is how they ran the last time they were on a racetrack. And I think that has really impressed a lot of the people, very much impressed the, the long-term participants. I've talked to some, they've been coming 15, 20, 25 years of this event. And if they're happy, we're happy. We're doing something right, I think. Listen, you're doing it right. Well done, John. Thank you ever so much. I'm not going to take up any more of your time. Johnny, we'll hand back to you. The next couple of days are going to be great. So well done to all your team once again. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. appreciate it. Things are happening down here at Laguna Seca. Yeah, and you know what? Uh, with this new resurface, uh, he John just mentioned some of the you know the bridge and etc. etc. Those those things have been needed. I used to love the old tower uh, across from where we are in the commentary box, but uh, no upgrades uh, were needed, and they have been done. Twenty million dollars spent, uh, and of course resurfacing this absolutely fantastic track. But of course, for the real racers in mind, they'll all be looking for track records and. Barry was just uh, informing us that we reckon that the uh, Indy cars will definitely start setting lap records uh, in the coming weeks when they come here for the first time after that resurface. So very, very interesting times and a great future ahead for Laguna Seca. And long may it continue. Because, of course, remember that uh, as we take a look at some of the hot rods that have driven here all the way from... Absolutely amazing sight. And... Uh, they are parked at the moment anyway, um, just by the Rolex clock in the back of the paddock, right by our commentary position. I saw some of them this morning. And as I won't, it can't be easy to drive a car for five days and then, and then take it out on a track and expect it to be just perfect. No, they've got to get it there. Host of BMWs in the background there, a man guarding his Porsche with his life, <laughs> as well I might if I had one. But don't forget, you know, this pursuit, this history of speed here in this part of the region began back in the early 50s um, when Phil Hill, in fact, Ken Miles, Carol Shelby, those kind of guys, Richie Gunter, all came to do the Pebble Beach races and they were around the woods on the roads in the early 50s. So before Laguna was built, there was racing here uh, and it was with names like I've just mentioned. So uh, this had a storied history in this part of the world way before uh, Laguna itself was built. Laguna Seca meaning dry lake and it has been a pilgrimage for the likes of those on the hill up there 
for many a year. Give me a close look at some of these hot rods. I took a look inside this particular one earlier this morning and Absolutely fantastic. And they've been describing their journey from New York right across to California over five days. And there's a look inside. Look at that. Beautifully done. And the idea of these hot rods is to, to basically have the basics of the silhouette, not so much a silhouette, but certainly as many parts as you can possibly get from cars of the 40s and 50s but then create a, a hot rod, as it were, that uh, has this wonderful, immediate, uh, attention-seeking look to it. Well, we've got more attention on the track in a few moments. We're quiet at the moment here at Laguna. We'll take a short break. I can see the sea. I can see the bay. It's finally clearing up here at Laguna. But from the drone, we will say adieu for a few minutes, and we'll be back with more racing on track. Stay with us. Roger that. Welcome back to the Rolex Monterey Motorsports reunion for 2023. That roar you hear, that beautiful sound, is the sound of Group 3. Night. Open wheel, single seat racing cars. Yes, when men were men, and no question about it, there were some. 
regular cars, and I've got one with me, in fact. Ned Speaker is alongside me. He's just been out in Group 1, um, but he's ver very familiar with these cars and, of course, this event. Here, still in your overalls, looking great and resplendent. Um, first and foremost, how is it out there? Well, the track is a little cold. Yes. So it's a little slidey. Two warm-up laps. Yeah. So, uh, but it's great. The track is fine. The new track seems to be uh, uh, settling in nicely. Now, we're looking at Group 3. You out in... But you're familiar with these particular cars. Yes, I am. All right. I have driven... Uh, one uh, that was used to be in this class, a uh, 1932 uh, uh, Alfa Romeo P3. And what's your love and passion for this? And is it, is it, I'm sure long term. <laughs> well, I've always loved cars and uh, going back in history when uh, cars were real cars and not uh, electric motors, uh, I just love them and uh, have been uh, interested in the racing part of it for about... Uh, uh, 20 plus years. Where are you from? I'm near uh... B, and I had Rick Rawlins up here who's out there at the moment in his Bugatti. He said this is like Christmas morning to me. Um, you know, it, 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 it's so special and, and it, it is that camaraderie between all of you. It doesn't matter what you're running or what you have or what you don't have or whether you have a, a one car or a collection of 30. Uh, you've all got a like mind and I guess this, this week, this year is the one you look forward to. of uh, historic cars. Uh, I think the only thing that rivals it is Goodwood oh, yeah. in England, which I have had the pleasure of uh, driving in. Just fabulous. Um, it is probably the premier event in, the, in Europe. Uh, States. Yeah, and it's no question, being a European, um, it's funny, we, we are fascinated by the muscle cars and by the American culture and by IndyCar and so on and so forth. Uh, and we've always had a love of the Indy 500 and Laguna Seca. I was just saying earlier, you know, I did a lot of bike racing back in, in England uh, and, and to see Laguna in its, in its glory in MotoGP and World Superbike was, was, was glorious and IndyCar, of course. Um, but the tracks excite you uh, and now we've got Cota. Uh, an American racing and that amalgamation between what we're looking at here, um, ma mainly European cars, but you can see the beginnings of how both American and European had their own ways of going about it. I mean, some of the cars here, I mean, this was real tough men racing, wasn't it? You show up on a Friday or a Saturday and, you know, you, you and a lot of bravery. <laughs> oh, no kidding. Bravery is right. The safety equipment then was was minimal, and uh, that's why many people uh, uh, had a problem. Uh, uh. So do you spend the whole week here? Do you go to the auctions and, 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 and sort of live the whole thing? Or do you, do you No, I don't. Uh, I've been at this for quite a long time, and I don't need to buy any more cars. <laughs> uh, and... Um, This year, plenty, yeah. normally I do the, the prehistorics and then the historics, but this year I decided just to do the uh, the main event. Like I said, cars from 1927 to 1955. So as Rick Rawlins uh, was telling me earlier, he's in that Ducati you see there, um, just going through shot actually. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's quite a disparaging uh, sort of abilities or power to weight ratios with these cars were given the ages but that said it's a nice field because you can see how the cars develop bit by bit um, for over the over that time there it is the number 11 of recordings yeah I would uh, put my money on Padden's Dowling yes in the ERA I've known Padden's for years uh, Yeah, I first came across Padding, uh, uh, Padding's at uh, Monaco, at the Monaco story. And yeah, he's a, a regular feature there, as he is worldwide. And he is, without doubt, one of the big proponents of historic racing. And, and I think one of the most respected drivers out there. Yes, clearly, you're respected, very talented. I, he drove, is I drove with him at Monaco. 
it's gets your full attention, of course. <laughs> I'll bet. Uh, you don't want to make a mistake in Monaco. I uh, I drove my Alpha uh, 32 Alpha there, and uh, it was it was riveting. Yeah. It was wonderful. But I, again, just like here, they don't hold back, though. I mean, we've seen we've seen some major incidents there uh, as these guys are really putting these cars through their paces as they were in the day. Well, and I think what's happened too is these prof- uh, professionals, even ex-professionals. Uh, or retired or uh, are now driving at a lot of these events. So uh, people that own nice cars will say to a professional, please uh, drive my car. Please drive my car, yeah. Well, I get that. Uh, And and they obviously want to see... ...to to really put it through its paces, and and they want to see it, you know, in top form, so to speak. So away we go then, and it was... Luca Machiescu, how do you pronounce that? Machiescu. I don't know. Ah, Machiescu. But Rick Rawlins in the number 11, Terry Sullivan, and Hugen Holtz of Kurt Engelhorn in that Maserati 250F. And that Maserati really was, uh, I remember I had a... <laughs> Uh, a picture of one of those on my wall as a kid, but very distinctive. They look almost slow with how bulky they are, but they were powerful. There's patterns. Yep. Wonderful. In that A-type, 1934 uh, ERA. Hans Hugenholz is quite a driver, too. He's a uh, very involved uh, uh, in great cars. Yes, you're absolutely, well, he's, he's down as uh, California, but he, yeah, he's in that 1950 Talbot T26, which is sort of going through shot on one go. Yeah, you've got some big names out there. I know as well as people like uh, Padding Stan, and you've also got Charles McCabe uh, out there as well. Uh, Max Jameson, names that I've seen unfamiliar at historic events around America, if not around the world. Do you enjoy taking and going to events around the world? Uh, driving in in great uh, great venues. I've driven all over England. Uh, I love Monaco. Love Goodwood, um, and um, I love meeting the people. I've also gone down under in Australia, and um, had a wonderful time there. The the drivers there are so welcoming. Yeah, so I've been been around, uh, but since COVID uh, came, it's uh, it's been on the back burner. Yeah, no question about it. I, I spent a lot of time in Australia and New Zealand, and I'm amazed at the historic scene um, in both countries uh, and their passion. Um, you know, we've got 5,000, Formula 5,000 coming up. Australia and New Zealand is amazing. Yes. Yeah, well, the colonies, the British colonies are very keen on cars. Not surprising, Padding Stowling off to the races. He's well ahead. Already, as we take a look for the first time at the big number 39 of the Alfa Romeo from 1935, excuse me, 1939, that's Conrad Stevenson at the wheel. And he is wheeling it too. I love to be able to see our cameraman do a great job of closing in on gloves or day glove gloves. So I love to see the amount of input. People don't really give uh, credit to the amount of input, even in these older cars need to put it just to keep them in in the line that you want yeah correcting uh, while you're in the turn to get the best uh, possible exit is very each of the cars from a, from a different era I mean is if you kind of look at the way the cars were designed and built or at least get a feel for it because they're all very different very my short wheelbase Ferrari is is uh, truck like you know, uh, on this track because it's so heavy and it does uh, 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 oversteer quite a bit. Uh, it's got a lot of power, but uh, in the turns, it's uh, very, uh, very uh, uh, hard to handle. And I'm sure you've got a to... different. <laughs> Everything is different. Yes. Yeah. Well, we're watching. Group three in action for the first time of our reunion for 2023. I'm delighted to welcome Ned Speaker, who is racing in a couple of groups, already been out on track in the newly surfaced Laguna Seca. 
But this is the perfect setting, isn't it? I mean, there's some great tracks in America, but Laguna kind of has it all, doesn't it? Oh, it does. I mean, just being in this area with the Carmel and, um, and all the events, uh, it's a wonderful uh, thing even for non-drivers because yeah. from uh, golf to uh, shopping and so on, it's just it's magical. Ryan Mullen there in the Talbot T26, 1938. A little smoky, but A-OK. -okay. Coming out of the Andretti turn. The other part of it, you f <laughs> people forget, I've done, like I said, I've done motorcycle racing. You can see the physicality of these older cars. You really are not just wheeling it. You are physically moving your shoulders and arms, your upper body, to get the car around. Wheels as large as they are, uh, you really have to work it to, uh, to get it around. Let me ask you something. Obviously, when you see and talk to modern drivers like Dario Frappidis here this weekend, for example, they talk about how a car, a modern race car, is very twitchy and doesn't give you a lot of time to react if you're too fast, you're oversteering, you're understeering. What about these older Grand Prix cars? I mean, how much give do they give you? How much feedback do they give you? Well, they give you an immense amount of feedback. Um, and of course, with the modern cars, you're going much quicker. So you have less time to uh, to yeah. uh, to correct if you have a problem. With these older cars, you have a little more because of the uh, lack of uh, of responsiveness. And what's a, a complete no-no in a car like this? I mean, I presume it would be easy to put the power down too early and and and, and, and quickly spin it. And the rear end can go out on you because it's got such a heavy power to weight ratio right. uh, that that can uh, uh, happen uh, and of course open these cars uh, I don't know I'll bet half those people out there aren't wearing seat belts because it's determined that you can um, uh, it's safer to be thrown from the car yes because many of them you see don't have roll hoops and uh, you don't want to be trapped in the car. But you know, that that's these guys are all experts and you see that uh, infrequently. You know, it took me a long time to understand why these early 20, 20s cars had such long front ends because the engines were almost uh, effectively taken out of aeroplanes or at least that's where they began in, in terms of Everybody wanted power uh, and speed, uh, but then you had to fit it into a chassis, and this is kind of, this number 16 is a good example of it. A huge chassis, yeah. and the engine taking up most of the car. Two-thirds two of the car, the front <laughs> is engine, and I say you never get in the car, you sit on it. On it. <laughs> That's a very good way of putting it. That's a beautifully prepared car. I love the fact that he's got the little hood there to cover the passenger seat. Very nice. Elton doing bad its business. Light Sport Tourer from 1935. And ninth position. Paddings Dowling is up the road from McCabe and Engelhorn, as you mentioned. Very good driver himself. There's Luca again in that Bugatti. 1928. 37A, that. And I love the way the wheels... They have, bow. Have, yeah, yeah, they bow there. So how, in terms of setup... Um, what, 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 are the, what are the main things you would want to get right to make it a comfortable ride? Well, clearly the uh, uh, tire pressure is huge. And uh, having the right tire pressure so you can get uh, the proper uh, grip and slide, uh, that's, a, that's a given. And uh, that'll a lot uh, depend on the tr uh, temperature of the track and the, and the weather, the outdoor weather of course is huge but in these old cars it's very difficult to change the gearing and you don't just pop in uh, a new set of gears for one track uh, uh, because to change so and how much and how hard is it to keep the parts and obviously you mentioned gears there that's that's something that's going to go eventually especially if you're uh, if you're using one particular gearing a lot um wear and tear obviously it's a, it's a piece of metal obviously when when and how do you get the parts and is that the hardest part of keeping these things 
Well, Internet has been a wonderful I'll blessing bet. because, uh, for instance, I uh, in my old Alpha, uh, I needed to change the pistons. And uh, you could go on the Internet and find someone that has cha- done the pistons. And instead of making just uh, eight of them, he made uh, 30 of them. And so he has them for sale. So we were able to find many parts on the Internet that uh, heretofore would have been very difficult to to manufacture yourself. Well, Padding Stowling is doing exactly what ERA, English Racing Automobiles, wanted back in 1933 when they formed, back in Bourne in the UK. They wanted a car, a British prestige car, that could take on the likes of Maserati and Alfa Romeo. And I think, no question, that ERA had their time in history, but uh, they certainly achieved what they set out to do. Uh, and you could almost argue that these were the Formula 2 of the day in, in, in some, of, some of the aspirations of some of these cars that were built at that time. Oh, and Paddings is coming in. Oh, my. Ooh. Now, that's interesting. So, obviously, he's felt something. And Paddings, as we said already, a very, very experienced historic racer. He would not. Another beautiful example, number 46, from 1946. Well, that's too bad for Pat, yeah. because uh, he is such a skillful driver. And that's his car. He owns that car. Oh, yes. Finished third in Monaco in 1936. So, as you can imagine, <laughs> he's probably thinking oh, just a little bit about that. If, if something wasn't quite right. Yeah, it looks like Matthew's uh, slowing down as well. These close-ups are great. Here and there. Well, the ca- the cameras Remember, are he- doing a wonderful job. Yeah. Well, I work with these guys a lot, and motor racing is their passion too. So they want to get as close now, to the cars seems as seems back out on the track now. Yes, so interesting. So, yeah, whatever the problem was, he's given the lead to McKay, but he's back out on track. So I guess he was just slowing it down. And now he's going full tilt. Because there he is, look, under the Mission Foods Bridge. A little wave to his competitor. Turn there, but uh, Paddock Dowling now hooning into Andretti Kerr. I wonder what happened. Off. Do you see anything through those mirrors? <laughs> It always well, must look like a... <laughs> everybody uh, has to use the mirrors a lot more than patterns. Yes, that's a good Paddens point. is looking forward. Now this R... How many a. laps do we have left here? Four laps to go, so just under four laps on this track. You're looking if Paddings can catch him, right? <laughs> you never take the competitor out of a racing driver. That's what I love. Yeah. Everybody says, oh, we're not looking at the times. Oh, we're not. Yeah, but do you look at your own times in the, a particular car to see if you've improved? Well, or? I used to when I was much more competitive. Um, uh, my uh, age now is making it. Uh, I'm, you know, I, I, I'm not nearly as fast as I used to be, and I just enjoy being out there. But I have to say, and this event is a good example, um, it seems to be a good recipe for health is to, oh, yes. to race these racing cars because, you know, I look at people like Travis Engin in the Audi. I mean, boy, Charles Nurberg, you know, these, yes. these guys have been doing it a long time and, boy, do they love it. Very fast Le Mans winning cars and there they are. <laughs> it does keep you young. Yep. You've got to stay on it. Stay in good physical shape. What gets harder as you get older? I would have thought the muscles on the neck, for sure. Well, McCabe's also in an ERA from 1936. Is that Charles? Yeah. Yeah. And he's in the R6B, built in 1936 as a 1.5-litre Bentley boy. Dr. J.D. Benefield. Raced the car twice back in the day. And the car was then raced in Sweden as well as the British Isles. Took a win at Donington Park and at Brooklands in 1939. So a storied history for 
that particular car. Threes in this. Uh, there used to be several of them in the area. Peter Giddings yeah. was a, uh, a real uh, uh, fan of those and was an excellent driver. Uh, John Shirley had one. I've had one. Uh, and we used to get two or three on the grid. When you started out doing this, was there a particular car you coveted or wanted to get and drive? Long to get your well, hands on. Well, I was, I was enamored. Uh, my first race car was a uh, D-Type Jaguar, nice. which was a huge mistake <laughs> uh, because they make them for Le Mans for a reason. Yes. They are big, fast cars, heavy, uh, but using them at Laguna Seca was, uh, was very challenging. And then I moved over to a Formula Junior, which is an open wheel uh, car, which has 1,100 cc's. And that's the greatest, to me, uh, teacher, is having an open wheel Formula car like that. And you're racing with, you know, similar cars. So th that was, why I think, my real, my real teacher, along with a Lotus cars, good power. Yeah, everybody that talks about the Lotus 23 uh, absolutely loves it and, 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 and kind of tells everybody that it's a surprise because it's far more nimble and, and faster than it actually looks. Oh, yes, it is a very nimble car. And uh, if you've got the right tires on it, you can very good lap times. Well, we're watching Group 3, our first look at the 14 groups that we've got at the reunion this year. We are celebrating 70 years of Corvette and we'll get plenty of time to get down in the paddock and learn more about Corvette's past and present and future. Boy, Paddens is doing a good job. I know. So is Charles McCabe. Yeah, at the moment. Horns up there as well. He's moved up to third place. Nathaniel Green now up to fourth and Brian Mullen up to fifth as it stands. Conrad Stevenson, uh, just two laps to go. So we're winding this down. Stevenson Lion, Zaremba, who we've had a look at in that number 16, already in ninth position. And Keskescu Makayueski, I'll get it right eventually, before the weekend's out, in 10th position in the number 31. Makayueski. 1928 Bugatti, he is driving. Car park starting to fill up here and the grandstands at turn four or five starting to get their position. Nice place to sit there. You get a good gear change through that. Andretti and into that inside part of the Laguna Seca circuit past the dry lake as it's called or past the lakes. They've got water in them there. Here is Padding Stalling about to start his last lap. You know, the, uh, crowd, go? the crowd won't be uh, as heavy today as it will be tomorrow. No. The quail uh, event is taking place today, but I think tomorrow will be the highest, uh, highest attendance here. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, yeah. Today, um, that we don't get to see from up here in the hills. Uh, but as you say, a lot of the people come here to those quail events, to concourse and so on and so forth, the auctions, and um, then, like you say, finish off their weekend by coming here for the Saturday event. Yeah. Well, and then the concourse, obviously, on Sunday. Yes. And I think the uh, organizers of this event uh, made a good decision not to, not to have the races on Sunday and compete with the concourse. Yeah, I think that's good. They, they've got stuff going on here on Sunday, a hill climb. But yeah, you're right, absolutely right. I think it was a smart move. Love the well, you've got great TV coverage here. Uh, it's beautiful to see these cars. I wish there was a little bit more sunlight glinting off them. There will be as the weekend continues. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, a great circuit to film at. Uh, you get shots like this where the cars appear and then dive down the five flights, uh, 155 feet that is the Laguna Seca corkscrew, the famous, if not one of the most famous corners in motor racing, right up there with Eau Rouge and many others. But uh, the corkscrew has its own special place. And I'm, I'm sure you've been down there a few times going, oh, I forgot this right. Yes, oh yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, you. Uh, you really can't see, can you? As you no, go no, it's it's a blind, but it's what, once you get the uh, the oak tree target. There uh, you go. Uh, the, you you see it. Check and flag waves then for Paddington. Dowling, and no surprise that he got off track, but got back on track, and as soon as he did, he was powering his way back to the front ahead of Charles McCabe, who took... But well done to Paddings Dowling here in our Group 3 cars from 1927 to 1955, these open-wheel single-seater cars, early Grand Prix cars, and we'll be getting some Formula One cars of the non-turbo era, much more modern, coming up later in the day. I'd be really interested to talk to Adrian Dewey about some of those, but he's a busy man. He's out there racing forwards at the moment, so um, but we'll try and nab him again. Kev's already had a quick word, but it's great to have people like Adrian here. Oh, boy. Yes. And Gordon Murray, and, you know, uh -huh. several others are here. I mean, sure. you know, we, we forget, like I said earlier, Motor racing, sure. Have it's just a bigger part to play as anybody else. Well, it is fun that uh, Jim Farley, you know, yeah. uh, CEO of uh, of Ford, uh, is running uh, running a couple of cars, I believe, too. Yes, I wonder if he and Adrian will have a quiet word about the future. <laughs> <laughs> Ford, of course, going to be with Red Bull in the coming years. Will that uh, amazing story of Red Bull Formula One continue? We wonder. Formula One, you'd have to say yes. So well done to Padding Dowling. My thanks also to Ned Speaker coming in here. What else are you? You said Group 12, 12? I'm in Group 12 What's with that? my shirt wheelbase Ferrari. Yeah. But that's, uh, as I say, those cars are much quicker, and I'm out there for just uh, getting some traffic. Come up and join us. We love to hear the stories. We love to hear why you love these cars so much and to be part of this event and share with our audience worldwide uh, this very special Monterey Reunion 2023. We'll take a short break from Laguna. We'll be back with more Thank you. After this. Thank you, Jonathan. Pleasure. Thank you, Ned. Welcome back to the Monterey Reunion 2023. We're waiting for the sun to pop out, but I'm glad to say the mist has drifted across the peninsula here in Monterey. A beautifully newly surfaced Laguna Seca track to celebrate this history of motorsport. We look high above the corkscrew as the car park's filling up now. And as Ned Speaker was just saying, there you can see the, in the hills there, the coast just behind the top of those hills. And that was one of the reasons for coming here. This was an old military base a gun, gun range here and, and, and so this seemed to be the perfect location uh, it's had its uh, intricacies in the past though because obviously there's some very wealthy and beautiful houses on the hills and many uh, interesting folk live out there including my good friend Wayne right now Lovely. Thanks, Johnny. Well, I have found a man who knows all about some of the most uh, gorgeous looking cars that you'll see here. The ones that me and you were talking about a little bit earlier on. Rolling Bones. And Dennis Varney is the owner of the car that is behind me. Dennis, talk to me just about how these cars came about and how come you own this one? Well, uh, the fellas that started this thing, the Rolling Bones, uh, uh, Ken Schmidt and Keith, were two guys who are hobbyists. And Ken was an artist, uh, a, a 
oil painting artist and loved hot rods and decided to stop doing paintings and uh, went in to start building cars. And I ran into their cars when I was racing at the salt flats. They used to come out and, and they were just beautiful cars. They sat so right and they just looked the period. They had soul. They were, they were, they were, you, you just felt like you wanted to go up and pet the cat, you know, kind of thing. And, uh, so I went to, I met him one day and I said, you know, I'm going to build a car like yours someday. And he says, well, we'd like to go into business. And so, uh, I said, okay. And they started building me a car and we've had a 23 year relationship and, uh, and Ken now has passed away and, uh, but the, the show is still going on and the salt flats every year. We just came there. I drove from the salt flats, uh, to here and, uh, uh, we just enjoy these cars. They're a lot of fun. You can lay on them. You can touch them. You know, and they're all different. Every one is different. They're all pieces of art. They're not cars, uh, hot rods. You know. What I love about this is you're taking the history of the hot rods, the post-war era, where guys were just cobbling together bits and pieces of cars that they were getting from the junkyard, from the scrapyard, and putting together these incredible-looking machines. And effectively, you're now doing the same thing, but with a modern spin on it, you know, breathing new life into old parts. Yeah, it's, it's a recreation of what happened after World War II. The fellas came back from the service. I'm 80 years old, 80 and a half, and then most of them are all, you know, up in our age, but we love driving. It, it make, you, you own one of these cars, you're 18 years old. You see a girl going down the street, you rev your motor and you get excited, you know, and she gets excited. You know. Speaking of revving. And we're going to test the uh, technology here. But I think, Dennis, if you hop in around that side, let's start it up. Let's see if we can hear it, yeah? Come on, let's do that. So I'm going to come around this side, and hopefully we we'll, uh, won't lose signal on the mic and everything else when we fire up. But let's see what we can do. Because if you can hear this... So I tell you what, Dennis, just, just point us through some of the dials and bits and pieces that we got up here, because it's a beautiful-looking thing inside. These are all uh, off different kinds of cars in the 40s. Uh, or late 40s. The uh, switches are off airplanes with the little ivory ends on them. Uh, and the steering wheel's a Lincoln. Now, you know, in race cars, you always have a little string to know where heads up is. So uh, I got some with a little blue string with a little red trim on it, just to give it a little look, you know. Uh, the seats are from uh, a reproduction of an airplane seat, but the seat covers, uh, Two of the reindeers of Santa Claus gave up their occupation and came with me, a Splitzer and Donner. So you're sitting on Donner, I'm sitting. Great, but we've got to see this thing running, haven't we? So, Johnny, I'm just going to do a quick little lap here with Dennis before we come back to you just around the. Uh, listen to this. This is amazing. <laughs> I cannot wait. Well, I could hear you, that's for sure, but it's been taken over by the roar of these engines coming out as we get ready for our next action on track. And it is the 55 to 1967 production large displacement cars. Well done. Oh, good old Kev Harris. He doesn't hold back. And I'm delighted to be joined here in the booth by Gay. Gay Zazarin. I got it right. I'm going to put you with some headphones on. And Gay is from Down Under. Yes, I am. From Australia. Tell us where you're from and what you are up to here. Um, I'm from just out of Port Macquarie in New South Wales. And uh, we're over here racing our Formula 5000. I uh, have been here since May racing Indianapolis, Mid-Ohio, Road Atlanta, and now these two events here. Of the ticket here this yeah. weekend because we don't get to see them enough. No. And I, I've spent a lot of time in New Zealand, not as much time in Australia, but the reverence for 5,000, and of course in Australia they've redone a new 5,000. Let's talk about Nathan Hearn, who's a, a former champion and now, now in Trans Am here in the States. But, but the, the interest in 5,000 has been long and history. Yes, been, in Australia. You're it's, part of the world, aren't you? Yeah, it's very high. It, it's what most people grew up with. Um, so consequently, it has a huge following. 
uh, and brings in the um, the crowds to any event we race at. So yes, and you try to come here and race that long at all these different circuits. That's a that's a big undertaking. It is. It's a huge undertaking. Beats the cat. I don't have one. There thank heavens. <laughs> <laughs> But you enjoy it, and, and yes. like I said, and I would have thought coming to America, uh, given that really America was in yes. terms of prestige anyway, I don't want to take anything away from the other countries, but it was the names and the, and, and the engines and the power yes. and the muscle, if you like, of those, those cars that really, in my opinion, rival Formula One. Yes, they do. Uh, we've, been, we've been very lucky. Even our car, it raced at the inaugural uh, Long Beach Grand Prix in 1975. Wow. Our car originally came from the States. We took it back to Australia. Um, so, yeah, so all cars... Um, have a real history from the US um, and it's good that we can bring them back here and put them back on display here and show them. It'd be nice to get your opinion. I mean, I'm a Brit, you're an Aussie. Uh, I've been to find the American racing historic scene. Um, it's, it's different. In Australia, um, we're very, very um, strict on our uh, historic category. Yep. We must um, run, run the vehicles as they um, ran in the day. Uh, in other countries, even here in the US, they're a little bit more uh, liberal, um, but um, you learn to adapt to um, each country you're going into. So. Yeah, I guess I guess everybody's got their own nuances yes. in terms of rules and what can and can't come in. I was talking to Barry Tupker. The, started with 600 cars and we're now down to 400 having to turn down 200 cars must yes be, must be awful heartbreaking for the people that want yeah. to come and race when you've you know planned a whole season around it yes it's got to be heartbreaking well you're joining me for group 10 and yes. this is SCCA production car large displacement we've had the uh small displacement cars out earlier from 55 to 67 so i'm sure quite a few cars that you'll recognize out here and uh, some beautiful Corvettes, and of course we're celebrating 70 years of Corvette. And I was saying to one of the Americans earlier that, um, I don't know about yourself, but, but we grew up sort of not idolizing, but we were excited by cars that we didn't know much about when you were growing up in Australia or in England like yes. I did. The Trans Am series was out there, but those, you know, an E-Type was, I saw an E-Type everywhere. Yeah, got uh, one of those at home. Yeah, there's one at the pub, you know. <laughs> and so, when we saw a Corvette, we were just like, wow, and there was yes. movies made about it. It was cool. It know? was, and I've just purchased a C8. There you go. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Thoroughly modern Millie alongside yes. me. I like it. No, fantastic. Yeah, so. And what do you think of it? Oh, stunning. Yeah. Absolutely stunning. Have you seen the E-Ray? Yes, I'm not a fan of E-cars. No. <laughs> but if anything's going to make it, that, oh, that yeah. thing is it, it has to drop. It has some um, definite goes, yes. Well, here we go then. The group lining up and Ellie Kogan leading the way here from Philip Cadori. And she's racing aboard. And great to have Gay alongside me to enjoy it. And it doesn't matter what your specialty, yours is Formula 5000, but just to be in this paddock with so many luminaries, but also just so many people that share the passion for this sport. All the cars are just magnificent and they're all prepared beautifully. So it's lovely to see them all out there racing. What's the hardest part about going from venue to venue and preparing the cars and, and, and being prepared? The big thing for us is you, when you put the car in a container, it has to be ready to race yeah. before you leave Australia. So it's got to be ready months in advance. Uh -huh. um, once you get here, um, you have a few limited, you know, problems. Um, we had an issue with a, um, a, a valve spring broke um, after Indianapolis. Okay, where do we get it fixed? So yeah. you're relying on... You're in the right place. Yes. You're, <laughs> you're relying on people to have contacts, and which we did, and we had some great support and great help. So you rely on the locals an awful lot. Yeah, and, and I think that is, it, it sums up. 
camaraderie. Uh, nobody was going to turn around and go, no. nah, I'm not helping you. No. <laughs> exactly. They're more than happy to help because yes. they, they know that you share their passion. That's a big part of all of this. Is it is. There's a massive fraternity here that I hadn't really, until I started following historics, given you know an, an understand. I hadn't got a full understanding of how worldwide it is, how both small and big at the same time, if that makes any sense. Yes. But it is a community that is cliquey in its own way because it's not for everybody. No. But boy, the people who are involved got a flag. Oh, out. we've got a yellow flag out. Yeah, a safety shame. car. So let's hope there's nobody stricken out on track. That's the number 86. Right behind the safety car. That's Philip Cadori leading the way. Ah, that's what it is. It's the but just Disappointing the for him. It just looks as though he's just gone wide, I think. So. Yeah. Luckily, hopefully, no harm, no foul, as they say. So we're under caution, our first caution of the day, incidentally. That's good. Yes, very good. So the 26, that is John Lindbesty uh, from California. That's 66 Shelby, GT350. Uh, 350. So, yeah, <laughs> very, very, very special car. Carol Shelby, but uh, do you have a sense of the history uh, as well when you're part of, the, you, know, you know, you've got your own interest, obviously, in the 5000s, but do you kind of spend time learning more about other we, categories and we so do on. yes um i mean the only th most a lot of the owners have different cars and run in different categories right so it's nice to know what other categories they're running in what their history of their vehicle is um and um everybody has a story and the stories are magnificent it doesn't matter what category you're in um the history of the car will always rise to the to the top. Um, What's the process? Do you ship cars? Yes, yes. And how long does that take? Anything from seven to nine weeks, depending on uh, where it's unloaded in Asia. And <laughs> <laughs> I Don't know that sounds silly, but <laughs> I would. <laughs> I'd be like, where is she? Yeah. <laughs> you can actually follow the ship. They, they do have tags, yes. But it is a nerve-wracking process I'll because... Bet. Like all containers, you know they can fall off. Yes. Yeah, I moved, I moved all my furniture over, and you're right. I followed that ship. I was like, "That's everything I own." <laughs> and, and it's a lot of money involved. Yes, exactly. So you want to know where it is. So tell me again, how long does it take? Seven, seven to nine weeks. But ours was, I think, was just under um, seven weeks. Um, and ours came into Long Beach rather than, right. so it's going back out of Long Beach, back to Australia. The others, um, theirs all came into San Francisco to Oakland, uh, and they'll go out of Oakland. So um, it just depends on, you know, um, what's easiest for, the, for your shipping company. Yeah, I did Macau for many years, and uh, just the, the logistics of bringing cars oh. from Australia, from all over Asia, uh, from New Zealand, obviously from Europe, uh, modern and historic, and just an amazing logistics. Got a slot in, yeah. you know, time-wise. <laughs> well, as you can see, they are extricating, or about to extricate. Yes. He must have got stuck in the sand pit, well and truly, in the kitty litter. Philip Cadori in that 63 AC Shelby. Cobra. Question that, that is a typical example of how Carol Shelby worked with AC and came up with the Cobra. And so the British and American minds thinking, well, you know how to make a good nibble car. I know how to put a big fast. He did knew how to do that, didn't he? Yeah, and I'm amazed how they've managed to keep alive that Shelby logo to the point now of even trucks I mean, yes you know um, they've managed a brilliantly to carry on the Shelby name of both um, efficiency power and excellence really I think yes that's where I can put it yeah so, no it's brilliant really cool yeah no so, it's excellent yeah very impressive
So then, we're under caution at the moment, and that's because one of our lovely cars, sadly, the number 26, that's John Lindsay's Shelby 66, has gone off. But we don't like to see them go slowly, but we're getting a good, good look at it. I'm here with Gay from all the way in. Minute. Just because they are at the bottom of the earth, and that's a rude expression, but <laughs> just because they're down under does not mean that they're... In fact, I would argue that there is a, a bigger passion for historic racing, yes. or at least a connection to that. It's massive in Australia. I do, I've spent a lot of time, more in New Zealand actually, but I do get the feeling that, you know, when I, when I talk to racers mm. who are from Australia, they say, I just wanted to get off get off Australia and see if I was I could make myself Self. something and yes. that's why Bruce McLaren and so many of the Kiwis now uh, you know, Weber all these guys they wanted to prove themselves on the biggest exactly you had a lot of Australian 5,000 drivers absolutely Kevin Bartlett yep uh, all those guys that had to come across uh, had to leave Australia and come across here to race or go to Europe and race but really put us you know in in um um, in the figure of the world, you know. Okay, yes, we are good at this. Yeah, and it yeah. was pretty, pretty fun to see Shane Van Gisburg, and I know a Kiwi, but <laughs> a household name in Australia and supercars, but it was nice to see him come here and, and show the NASCAR boys what they do down under. Yes. Now, to be fair, he was in his own neighbourhood because yes. street racing is what he does, does best. Exactly. But at the same time, I think it was... And the respect that he has both ways. I mean, yes. he has a lot of respect. And I it's still top yeah. 10, yeah, but, but, you know, great I mean, stuff. Yeah, I'm a, a real fa fan of um, Scotty McLaughlin, yes, too. Of course. So seeing seeing him out there is really good as well, doing so well. So, yes. Full jandle. Love yes. it. <laughs> yeah, we love having all the Kiwis and Aussies here, here in America. And I think there is a, there's no question there's a connection between... Most definitely. And Australia and New Zealand, by the way they go about their lives, yes. the way they go about their racing, uh, and so every every antipodean that I hear says that America feels like home. Yes, it's very simple. So, yeah, just one of those things. Okay, I'm going to get our next. Guest in. They're coming in fast and furious. Thank you so much for coming in. An absolute pleasure. And by the way, after the first session of your 5,000, come back and tell us what happened. Not a problem. We'll All right. Thank, thank you for you. coming in. I've thank got another Jonathan. guest coming in in a moment. So thank you, Gay. We can't miss him. <laughs> We're on pole for the 5,000. Thank you, Gay. Appreciate you coming in. My pleasure. And we'll see you soon. Hard luck in the Women's World Cup, but never mind. <laughs> So Jim Farley leading the way, Jeff Abramson in that 64 Chevrolet Corvette powering around in the number five, a beautiful sight of sand. And I am delighted to be joined here in the booth by Rob. First and foremost, um, very special weekend for, well, uh, for you, but for everybody. A to have you here, but also for Corvette. 70 years, you had a big part in that, but um, Let's first of all start, with, we're looking at some fantastic Corvettes out there, I want you to talk to that, but just what does this event mean to you? You know, given the, given the history, uh, Formula 1, Formula 5000, Can-Am, uh, obviously the big, you know, all the, all the sports cars, I mean, I grew up watching a lot of this as well, and so it's a, it's a huge thrill for me, and, and and obviously, you know, to be uh, Grand Marshal here for the uh, Rolex Motorsports Reunion here at WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca, it's, uh, it's an absolute uh, honor, and I'm thrilled. And, I, and I'm just going to keep my eye on the uh, number 57 Corvette, because that's a friend of mine, and I drove that car here last year. Who is that? It's Dave Roberts. Okay, we'll keep yeah, an eye on Dave in, uh, for you. Yeah, it's a, it's a 56 vet, very, very period correct. And I can tell you from experience, it has drum brakes. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, 
Yeah, no, it's it's. Uh, uh, you know, when you, you look at the the look at the history of, of Corvette, you know the 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 racing that um, uh, when they first went to Le Mans in 1960 and everything in between, and then really from the start of the '99 season and continuing, that's the 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 the, the era of the the full on factory corvette racing program and um yeah, i was very fortunate to be part of it from the from the ground up when we you know initially testing this the first generation of uh, c5r we were slow and couldn't get out of our own way <laughs> but um you know the 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 the, the, the great part of, and the fun part of that was working with the pratt miller team and, and obviously corvette people and taking you know that taking the car learning how to finish long races then learning how to contend and then learning how to win and um, the, the real breakout season for for Corvette racing was 2001 uh, we did get uh, first win in the fall of 2000 but 2001 was really the breakout year with the Rolex 24 uh, overall win got a first class win at Le Mans that same year and numerous uh, uh, ALMS uh, sprint wins as well lucky enough uh, to follow Brian Redman around as he was Grand Marshal of the Daytona event, the Rolex. And um, I, he, they put them through his paces, I'll tell you. I don't know if they're doing, I don't know how busy you are, but when, it's all very well saying I'm the Grand Marshal. It sounds like a very nice thing where you wave, wave a flag or, right. or, or, or hand, make a few handshakes, but there's David Roberts. There's Dave. Go get him, Dave. <laughs> there you go. But um, there's, a, there's a lot to do, or they keep you busy. What have, what have they got you doing this weekend? It's, it's mainly it's mainly media media stuff. We've done some video content. There's a couple of the right the uh, C5Rs that I raced that are here, the 2003 C5R as well as the uh, 2000. And um, yeah, that's uh, that that keeps us busy. I'm also uh, I'm also driving a C4 Corvette. Uh, an IMSA GTO car that uh, my old crew chief from uh, Corvette Racing, Dan Binks, uh, Dan and his wife Sherry is, and their son Phil, they're all here. And Dan has restored this car. Uh, it's owned by uh, Walter Owens, um, who used to race Trans Am back in my era. And uh, anyway, Walter owns this car, and they just got it, uh, just got it ground up, restored, and it's just an awesome piece. It's a V6 turbo. So we're sometime this afternoon we'll be doing that tell us about how you got into racing in the first place i mean you're synonymous with corvette uh, and obviously your history uh with the mark uh, continues to this day as an ambassador yeah. to it but um how did you first get involved yeah the, i had a my uncle uh, this is back in ontario but in the toronto area that's where i grew up um and he took uh, myself and and uh one of my brothers he Uh -huh. So that was that, that was the first car race I went to, and I was absolutely oh yeah yes it's it, I've said it many times but if uh, if an 11 year old can have an epiphany I did <laughs> yeah well no so was, I, I actually think that's a good age to have that yeah. because the, those memories at 11 12 whatever it might be just as you're coming into being a teenager you're starting to form your your, your idea of what you like yes not what I got I got plenty of. Uh, discouragement uh, um, uh, and lots of encouragement from, the, from parents but the reality check was you know we, we, as a family we didn't have money for this sort of thing and that was the that was the part that my, my dad continued to remind me of you know this is really really expensive to try to cut your teeth in I insisted to him that I didn't need a backup plan but <laughs> you had one I, after all though. yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it all it all worked out but i mean it's it's not as easy as 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 we we all know in this in this game it's 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 a very very difficult uh, business to uh, to make a living at but i'm uh, very very fortunate to have uh spent majority of my career racing predominantly gm products and mostly chevys from everything from from nascar to world challenge to uh, obviously the to imsa and the american Le Mans series and yeah, it was pretty special for me uh, to go recently to Detroit and see uh, a Chevy come across the line. 
Yes. Uh, absolutely incredible. And it really gave me a sense of being in Detroit and, and understanding yep. what that mark has been over the years and, and you know, what it meant to the folks at GM. I mean, yep. Very special. Yeah, it was... It was um I actually was born in Windsor, just across the river, um, but it grew up in the Toronto area. But uh, Detroit and the Belle Isle event in 1994 was a turning point for I was actually racing uh, racing uh, for Ford at the time, and and the the, uh, the Saturday the Saturday feature being the Trans Am was, yeah. was uh, the Chevy 200, which I won, and. I And literally, that's how it started. He literally asked wow. me, he asked me, uh, how do we get you in a Chevy? And I said, Give me a call. And that's, that's great. Yeah, I love was, stories. Yeah, See, that's, yeah. I, that's a, to be honest, I'm so glad you've come in today because these are the stories that we, what we love to hear about. Yeah. Uh, and I, I always feel hand fisted a little bit trying to, trying to. Yeah. to hear these stories and how yeah. something as simple as that you're on oh, the podium yeah. there's yeah. the head of GM yeah. how else are you going to yeah. get a point yeah. with him and here, <laughs> here, here we are 20 almost 30 years later and uh, you know I still have a still have had a, a terrific relationship with Chevrolet on, on both sides of the border in Canada and and uh, in the US obviously and we've got uh, uh, we're partners with Chevrolet and Michelin with the uh, with our Corvette school which is based at Spring Mountain Motor Resort and Country Club uh, west of Las Vegas so that every every uh, new Corvette owner gets a two-day school as part of the ownership experience and we've been doing that for 15 years um, so yeah it's uh, it's great and I continue to be ambassador for for Corvette and for Corvette racing so it's uh, yeah very very fortunate and my kids that's pretty much all they know is Dad did nothing but race a Chevy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're listening to Ron Fellows, who is one of our special guests. He's also the Grand Marshal here at the event here in 23. De uh, delighted to have you on board as we celebrate 70 years of Corvette. Uh, and I was saying earlier, you know, I just had an Aussie lady here, uh, Gay, who was just, we were talking about the mystique of being from Australia and, and the UK and how, you know, you'd see the films come out about Corvette and it, it, it immediately got... Hollywood status as a car almost. Yeah. Why do you think? You know, and it, it continues to this day. You're taking on the 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 Europeans, the the European manufacturers that have the they have the of, of sports car racing, and and certainly the you know when when Chevrolet began on the journey with with the Corvette. Um, it was a, a big task, but it was uniquely American. Continues to be that way, but uh, it's, there's there's always something special about a Corvette, and they've done a, an amazing job over the over the decades. You know, marketing, you know, the the uh, initially in the '60s, the uh, the connection with uh, astronauts with, and Corvette, and and certainly uh, you know the you know what Le Mans has meant to Corvette. look at the, the Briggs Cunninghams and John Fitches and, and you know the what they went through to compete you know in uh, in the early 60s of Le Mans and, uh, I, I got to drive that car here in in 2010 and I don't know how they ever went 150 miles an hour in those 160 miles an hour in those cars I had trouble at 50 <laughs> <laughs> but you know I mean what I love about the mark is the fact that we're here celebrating the history of it, 70 years. We've got uh, representations both at the moment on track and all around the paddock. And yet there is also a doff of the cap to the future here in the E-Ray. And, and that, you know, it, it, this is historic events, uh, cars that we're looking at. But, the, you know, everybody's still innovating towards yeah. the future. And, and I just thought, well, I haven't even seen that car run. But it just looks like a Corvette, as it should. Yes. And it is a very different Corvette. Some might due to the DNA. Well, I think yeah, the you know the the mid engine uh, has been in the works for a while, and certainly coming out in in 2020 with the uh, initially with the Stingray. This is a this is a huge you know the a, a huge step for for Corvette to go mid engine, and um, and you know that the response from owners and and like even at, at our school for example we're seeing an, an incredible number of first-time owners of corvettes because of the 
this uh, innovative new mid-engine car and and what they've done with it. And the, the new the new Z06 is off the charts good. And actually, the first time I got to drive a Z06 was right here last year. who is well known in Ford names at Dearborn. Uh, in his Ford Cobra 1964 has just won in the 96. So that competition, Ford versus GM, continues here in 2023. And long may it continue, Ford coming back yes, into indeed. Formula One. Long may it continue. Yes, yes it's long may it continue. <laughs> is there any cars you want to see? I'm going to let you go. I've got lots of people coming up. But yeah. uh, you don't have a lot of time, you're Grand Marshal. But is there anything you want to have a look Oh yeah, no the the you know what, what I grew up watching. Uh, I, you know I was a Formula One fan first, yeah. and and certainly at uh, Can Am Formula Five Thousand and Formula One was you know in the in that era of late sixties into the into the late seventies, and then when the when the Formula One race the Canadian Grand Prix moved to uh, Ile Notre Dame on Circuit de Villeneuve in Montreal in seventy eight. Uh, been there lots since as well so so i i uh i'm i'm watching can am point five thousand and, and f1 as well as uh um as well as these big sports cars but the, the formula, formula one and 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 uh, you know as watching can am formula 5000 formula one that's that's really a cool factor for me well it's a cool factor for us the audience listening to your words you're listening to ron fellows thank you for coming in oh thank uh, you feel Thanks free for to come back we got the whole weekend um yeah. we love to hear these stories um and we want to involve as many of you as we can, yeah. drivers and participants in this. You've been listening to Ron Fellows, of course, from Corvette and a major player over the years, racing design, you name it, and now with race schools as well. And Thank you very much. Thanks again. for having me. Any, yep. Terrific. All right. We'll take a short break here from Laguna Seca. Back with more after this. Welcome back to Laguna Seca. We've been here for much of the morning and it continues here with some great coverage of these beautiful historic cars part. The reunion of 2023 here in Monterey and now, as they say in Monty Python terms, for something completely different. Uh, no question about here with John McIntyre, who has a big part to play, and we'll talk a bit of Trans Am as well. But first and foremost, let's head down to Kev and see what the latest is with him. Lovely, thanks, Johnny. Well, in amongst all the noise down here under one of the most impressive... Of Corvette, a mark that has been around for a long time, 70 years in fact, and I'm pleased to say that Phil Zach and Todd Christensen are here with me now, uh, and they're going to tell us all about it. Todd, what a display of cars we've got here. Just tell us what's going on at the Rolex this year. Yeah, I tell you what, we are so honored and excited to be here for a Corvette 70th uh, anniversary, and what a display of cars. I mean, GM's brought some of our cars out, our, our serves, the Chevrolet engineering res uh, research vehicles, really the cars that started the C8 back in the 60s, but think of all the cars that the private owners brought out. We've got almost every vintage of uh, historic race car. Two of the five Grand Sports, you don't ever see those together. Three of the 1960 Corvettes that raced at Le Mans. I mean, what an amazing uh, uh, group of vehicles here. It's incredible. That's just some of them. These are the ones that you bought. We've had two or three just, you know, thunder parts racing them out on track uh, but Phil I'll come to you 1953 in New York at Motorama the company had a, an idea for a little car that they were going to bring to the market and, and you know what were they thinking about back then what was it all about the Chevrolet getting into performance driving something attainable for the customer and you can see what that has grown into uh, at that point too it was new technology it was uh, uh, fiberglass bodies so really just driving technology in Corvette and as we see right through here, the, the, uh, the aura and the, the, the brand has just kept growing. 
Yeah, it really has. Let's take a little walk and a stroll because we've got to end up, by the way, at a car which is just... Coming up in a moment as well, Todd, um, past some of these vintage ones that are beautiful and shiny, we're going to see one that isn't beautiful and shiny that was racing for 24 hours not that long ago. Yeah, I tell you, uh, this, is the, this is the car that won our class in the 24 hours. Yeah, Corvette Racing uh, raced this thing for 24 hours, and uh, we just we kept it. So this is what a car looks like after 24 hours of continuous uh, competition so excited to have that car here for everybody to see it in the flesh i absolutely love what you've done with this as well because you said to me this has come straight off the track after 24 hours but then you've actually spl sprayed a clear coat on it to keep it looking as it does that's right i don't want anybody polishing this thing up and making it look pretty again this uh needs to be preserved in in its uh historical look well look, let's let's just keep walking because just over looking pretty and phil i'm going to ask you about this step forwards we've got the uh, all new 24 chevrolet corvette e-ray look at this lady here she's absolutely spellbound by it huh? number one you start with the race car the, yeah. the new c8 basically the proportions have shifted the motor is over the rear wheels which gives you the traction that you need uh, for launching and all that was developed with the race team on the track but what you're looking at your v8 and it's coupled with electric motors up front for all-wheel drive, which is the first time you get that in Corvette. But uh, the, the car is stunning. It's a fabulous, the, the speed is tremendous, and it also uh, it rides phenomenal. It's a fabulous car for the track or also for the road. But, Phil, I've got to just give you and your team some credit. Is that right, or Global Head of Design? Uh, that's for Chevrolet, that is correct. Well, this, I mean, but... The designers behind this have done an amazing job. This is a beautiful looking car. Modern technology, but it's an instant classic as far as I'm concerned. No, we appreciate that. The team did a phenomenal job on it. And part of the engine moving to the rear, our proportion shift. The occupant goes forward. You can feel. And then when you get into the materials on the inside, uh, the leathers, the suede, we've really upped the game on what we offer for Corvette and interior components, carbon fiber, you can pretty much get it all. Yeah, this is what I want to see. If we could just spin around and have a look inside, the, uh, the tan leather and black interior on this is great. Todd, I'll come back to you because for the guys that love Corvette and are going to you know, get involved in a car like this, you've picked a great one to bring and put on display. Yeah, well, l listen, leave it up to Phil and, uh, and the team to give us some beautiful colors. But yeah, this uh, beautiful gray with tan interior is something that you probably wouldn't expect to look great, but it's pretty striking. And also, what we got here then is a 6.2 litre small block V8 engine, but health. 50 horsepower coming from battery and a motor. Yeah, there's 163 horsepower in a electric motor that powers the front wheels. Yeah. So you add that to the 495 in the back, and it's a pretty potent uh, setup for sure. I think I read zero to 60 in just uh, what two and a half seconds. Two and a half seconds. This will be the fastest zero to 60 of any Corvette. It's phenomenal. But then alongside that, race car. Well, for sure. I mean, this is really. Uh, could be a daily driver, a touring car, perfect touring car. So having all the driver assist and safety features are important to our customer, and it's important uh, for this car. Phil, let's spin you back around this way so we can put it behind us, and then we get a nice view of it. But just to talk about the event as well, Phil, because you're a design guy, and when we stand here and look at all of these cars in front of us here now, just phenomenal, isn't it? Beautiful-looking cars, and they all fit the era that they were you know, made in. Yeah, no, it's phenomenal. When you go up... You mentioned the 53. Yeah. You start with the 53 C1 and you walk all the way back up here to C8. Uh, there's the, the sound. It's a visual experience as well. So that's all wrapped up, and we think the C8 here is really the epitome of kind of where Corvette uh, is, and we're going to really move this brand forward. Yeah, you are. And what's also great is as well with events like the Rolex here, the enthusiasts are coming. And like I said, we've got all these ones that you've bought, but there's loads of others that other people have bought. And looking after them and maintaining them and keeping them running on the track, that's what this is all about, isn't it? Oh, exactly. And we've got a huge customer base uh, that just loves Corvette. They come to these events all the time. And really, we're just with the race car behind us and with the production car here, there's a great tie into those two. Yeah, there really is. Well, listen, uh, Johnny, I think we're kind of wrapped up here for a moment or two. Todd, thank you ever so much for talking to us. There's a big crowd around the E-Ray and Phil, thank you ever so much. Uh, Johnny, what do you make of that? The history of Corvette all under one awning and the future, well, it's right behind me. Kev, brilliant. 
Vignic is, you know, you, you can argue about the future of the motor car and where it's going, but Corvette have definitely dived in, feet first, carrying on the lineage and making an absolutely beautiful Corvette. And I'm joined here in the booth by Tom McIntyre. We're going to talk about Rolling Bones, but I, I do want to quickly talk about Corvette because obviously you know this mark just as well as anybody else. But um, uh, when we see the past and the future here, uh, what, what's your take on Corvette? Well, I'm, uh, I'm uh, thrilled by Corvette, you know, and it's a real pleasure to walk around the Heritage display see the incredible history of the Chevrolet Corvette as well as a glimpse into the future. It's just phenomenal. This event um, has gone from strength to strength since the 70s and of course racing here on the peninsula since 1950 uh, before Laguna Seca even existed um, but since then it's taken on a world of its own. Growing up in California you must have been part of this event and also aware of the, the, what, how this has grown over the years. Uh, what does this mean to you? Well, um, I started coming here as soon as I had my driver's license. I, <laughs> I asked my parents if I could leave and go uh, watch the races uh, at Laguna Seca. And uh, they, uh, uh, of course, let me go. And, and then, of course, uh, you know, in the very, very early days. And uh, I got to see all these Corvettes race. And... Uh, uh, very early on, I was able to even buy one myself and uh, and and race it here in the historic's uh, uh, '63 split window. So it's been you know heritage of Corvette and uh, and Laguna Seca Raceway. No question about it. During the pandemic, um, I worked with current Trans Am Racing, and, and we decided to do uh, a sim championship because we couldn't go racing. So we did a sim championship, and the sim guys were so clever that they reinvented Bridgehampton, oh. Riverside, and we went racing with our modern field wow. of Trans Am races. Just absolutely fantastic. So I feel like I, I know a little bit about some of these you know, older circuits. Sure. Uh, we went to Sears Point as it was then, and now Sonoma. But let's get to the rolling bones because this does intrigue me. These cars have mostly driven from New York, am I right? Uh, All yeah. Um, we have one from Alberta, Canada, uh, Connecticut, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, New York, um, South Carolina, and uh, it's, just, it's just incredible how these guys have all come together, guys and girls, I should say. Uh, we have a two-door sedan uh, owned by Judy Watson, who uh, is, is its owner and helped build it. So uh, not only is it boys, but girls as well. And uh, it's a great fraternity of people who embrace this uh, genre of, uh, of, of early Ford Hot Rod. What's been the reaction on the road? Oh, the reaction is phenomenal. People just can't believe that we're out there on the highways in the middle of Nebraska. And probably holding your own as well, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. These, these, are, these cars are all geared. Uh, they'll Amazing. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. What? Yeah, 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 yeah. When I read it, it basically said that the idea, it's a, it's a hot rod, but you use as many parts as you can from the original form. Very few modern parts on these cars. Uh, the, the only thing we do is put a, a overdrive so, uh, uh, so that they can uh, attain highway speeds uh, without overtaxing the engines. And I read that also... Th this method in your madness, driving some of these cars. You've got customers here in California who've been waiting to get their hands on these, right? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Uh, well, there's, there's people all over, all over the United States. And, and in fact, we've, uh, we've exported some of the cars to, uh, to England. So uh, they're, they're pretty much worldwide now. Well, listen, Tom, uh, I want to talk to you about the Trans Am Historics in a minute. We're going to take a short break, but we'll be right back. You've been listening to Tom McIntyre, who uh, is going to be out and about uh, later today in historic Trans Am. And we're here talking about the Rolling Bones. Coming up next, it's ragtime. But stay with us. More to come from the Monterey Reunion.
Welcome back on track at the moment. Ragtime races in action. But before Tom McIntyre goes, I would be remiss if I wasn't to tell our audience about the car that you will be pedaling later in the day. One of my favourites, and as a Trans Am man, I do know about... I don't know all my... And uh, we, uh, uh, you know, it, it's just, when you sit behind the wheel of these cars, you know, it's, uh, it's wonderful to feel uh, the same thing that the original drivers felt. These cars are all restored to perfection. They're, they're not copies. They're not reproductions. They're the real cars that you would have seen here between 1966 and 72. Well, that coming up, and that is going to be a highlight for me anyway, and I'm sure some of the fans around the world watching uh, around the world. My thanks for Tom coming in and we'll see it goes on the new surface. Wonderful. Uh, and see if you put some extra quick laps uh, in, the old, in the old girl. But uh, <laughs> thanks for coming in. Um, we've got it fast and furious uh, as we turn our attention now to the ragtime races. Going to tell you all about that. My thanks Tom. Appreciate you coming thanks in. Thanks for having me. So as you can see, as I mentioned, we've got ragtime races on track and I'm going to introduce another man He's not really from the era, but he may as well be because he knows all about racing. James Alder is going to join me in a moment to talk about Time Racers is a very special group. And before we get down to the nitty gritty, let's head down to Kev Harris. What have you got, Kev? Lovely, thanks, Julie. I'm down here with the man that makes the ragtime races all possible, Brian Blaine. And Brian, it's great to see you once again. We've met on a few occasions now, and usually I'm dressed up like you. Uh, but look at what's going on behind us. You're doing the skit here where the car's late to the line. Oh, Beauregard, he's late again, isn't he? Yeah, Beauregard's always late, always late. You know, it's, it's almost dependable that he's not going to make it on time. But just tell us about what's going on, because basically one of your old-time racers, Yeah, well, we find the skunk and he, it catches on fire. He finds the skunk, takes it out, puts the car back together. And uh, we've had so much fun doing this over the years. There have been a number of running and then back together running again with the engine out. This is what amazes me, Brian. This car, you take it fully apart, you put it back together, you turn the key or press the button, and it just fingers crossed it goes and it usually does go but whose idea was this and this in itself is a great piece of engineering to make this happen well Beauregard and I did this we 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 were a part of a local Model T club that was trying to break the world's record on taking a car apart and putting it back together we decided well let's go one further let's have it running take it apart put it back together again fire it back up and we started doing this in front of the bleachers at, at race events and it's, it has been so popular that uh, we just keep doing it but the, the engineering of it is quite involved because it's not a car that is just starting up for a few seconds it's got full water full of fuel full of everything we've actually taken it and after done this after we've done this we took it around the indy oval so it's it's a that they're putting back together here but let's just talk about the ragtime races for a moment because these are the cars from the early 1900s that were racing around tracks you know all over the united states of america that's right you know this this is the beginning and it's unfortunate but when i started messing with these old cars 30 years ago i realized that we've forgotten about them we're you know i was right racing a can-am car who cares about these old things and then i got the i got hooked on them and i found out that you know we've almost lost a part of our history and so ever since then, I've been trying to get these guys to bring their cars out of their collections or out of their garage or out of the barn, get them running and bring them out on the track so people can see them. And the key to this is we don't ever take these cars to events unless we can fire them up, run them around a track. We want people to see what it was like. And it's fantastic, and that is exactly what you do here at Laguna Seca. I mean, I've seen Ed Archer with his old Ford Model T over there race around here, and he's doing 60, 70, 80 miles an hour in a car that he's sitting up high and proud in.
Not corkscrew. Yeah, there, when it comes to brakes, if you want to start to stop the car today, you better put the brakes on yesterday. <laughs> That's exactly it. But we're coming to the club. it back together uh, how many minutes do they do this in because it's a full strip down and then put back together and then like you said it's going on the track their, their record is eight minutes and a, and a few seconds and I don't remember exactly but they're doing pretty good today they might break the record today yeah they might do it or if you're watching somewhere around the world right now there's a whole sort of a uh, bit of pantomime if you will that the cars are going out to the track and this one says oh it won't start there's an issue and then the guys strip it down and uh, they discover the issue and it is a skunk in the gearbox that they find they uh, usually toss it to the uh, the uh, paddock uh, marshal you know which scares him away and uh, of course the paddock marshal is part of the show yeah and i think the great thing about this is now i've seen this about three times now four times maybe but there are people who come to these shows year on year and they don't know about it until it starts to happen they think this is actually for real right up at Sonoma, we had somebody come up afterwards and he said, we're making a formal protest because after you guys got this back together, they wouldn't let you take it on the track. Well, I told him, don't let him on the track. He can't make it around there. He didn't have enough fuel in the tank. But this person was so upset that they'd worked so hard and they wouldn't let him on the track that they filed an official protest. There you go. That is acting of the highest degree. That is with the pantomime. That is, you know, art imitating life or something. But uh, we're getting the stage now. The bodywork is going back on. But just a quick word about the event then, Brian. Like, you know, like you said, it's all about preserving history. And when you look at these cars, these are historic early 1900s. But we're getting to an era where a car from the 80s is vintage, you know, and historic now as well. And we've got to preserve all of them. Yeah. You know, and they're, they're disappearing at a rapid rate. The, the real early ones just don't exist. Trying to find 20 or 30 of these cars that are actually in running condition and can drive on a track at, at speed it just doesn't exist anymore. You don't want that to happen the, to the cars from the 60s. No, exactly. And when, and when you drive around the roads these days, I'm obviously in the UK, you're over here in the US, what we class as old cars, you don't see many old cars on the road anymore, which is a shame. Yeah, and, you know, we, when as, a, as a kid, we would try and identify every car as it went by. Nowadays, they all look the same. They do. They're all out the wind tunnel. They're all like hybrid or they're going to be electric. It's the way of the world. But, you know, like you say, they all look the same. But look, here we go. Let's just bring you around here, Brian, because the, uh, the finale is almost upon us. The, uh, the car was stripped. box or the gearbox wherever it was the guys are about to put the bonnet on the moment of truth is upon us they have done this in around eight minutes and i think they deserve a huge round of applause if this thing fires up first time we talk about modern engineering but look what you've done here with old engineering this is going to go come on Check a plug, check a plug. Look at this though, it did fire up. Come on, we got this. Go, 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 says Beauregard Speedwell. The guys, a little bit of a spray. Yes, come on, yes, yes. <laughs> Car 13 rolls towards the grid and you're gonna roll and go and join our Johnny Green in the announcer booth and add some life to this. Is that right? I'll be there, I'll be there in a quick five. He'll be there in a quick five. There you go, Johnny. Brian is on his way up to you. What a great show, folks. How about that? So, those magnificent... Literally, this is a great example. I love rack time races. This is just pure fun, and they have fun doing it, but there's a very serious connotation to it because you genuinely are... This is the, the likes of the Model T Ford of 1920. Mark Hart at the wheel of that one. And uh, the Packards out there. Uh, we've got National Speed Cars out there from 1912. We've got a Hall Scott Model M from 1970. Tom Malloy's out there in that Locomobile Model I from 1908. Folks, this is where it all began. And this is where the t technology that you see we just saw the most modern Corvette in the world in the future. Well, this is kind of where it all began. And two-seaters, why two seats, you say? Why did you have to have an extra guy? Well, somebody had to start the thing, and somebody had to be the spotter. 
So the man who isn't at the wheel, or the woman that isn't at the wheel, is doing just that. Being the starter, the mechanic, and keeping an eye out for those. It wasn't it pressurizing the fuel system. It wasn't until the Marmon Wasp went to uh, the Indy 500 and put a mirror on that he did away with a passenger in the seat. Uh, just ahead is one passengerless car. That's the number nine coming through shot there. Absolutely gorgeous, and I really do enjoy these guys. They've been uh, that's a uh, Franklin Desert Racer uh, in action there, and the 21 that's a Hudson from 19. A real display and exhibition. Uh, this is not a race, this is just a little bit of fun, but uh, some serious fun too, because you really do get the delineage. We've got uh, cars that go back to 27 in our normal groups, but this is kind of an anomaly group, the ragtime races. And they've been uh, doing this around, as you heard there with Kev, uh, around the United States now for quite some time. And they put on a real show, including that, that exhibition you just saw. And I'm just about to get rejoined by the same man. Here he comes into the booth. But I was just saying, you know, we, when, this is an anomaly group because you're not actually racing. But at the same time, a very important group for people to understand. If I were bringing my little, little Larry son, of, let's say 12 years old, he'd never been to one of these events, I'd want him to see this and say, this is, you know, it's all very well being excited about the Corvette of the future. This is where it all began. It, this is the beginning. That's right. And, and if, if, if we lose the beginning, then, right. the, then where are we? But you know, you're talking about this, the, the cars racing. They're actually driving at racing speed. Yes. But they're not racing for position. They're not taking any chances because they're not wearing safety gear other than a helmet. And uh, and some of them are, 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 are they're all amateur drivers. Some are what pro. What sort of speeds are we doing then? Yeah. And, and I've, been, actually, I've, I've actually been in the two-seater at Sonoma in one of these, and I was amazed at the sheer speed that we were doing. We have so much fun with, you know, I've, I've raced everything from Formula One, K&M Vintage, and it's, it's a kick to have people walk up and make fun of the cars, and then I take them out with me. And, I say, and after, when they come back in, they have a new understanding of what it feels like to go 80 miles a lawn chair in the back of a pickup truck. It, it really is, and it feels like that. You feel like you're in a no-suspension pickup truck, and you are hanging on for dear life yes, <laughs> if you're a passenger. Uh, but it's it's gleeful, it's joyful, it's 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 absolutely wind in your hair fun. Yeah, it's it's amazing if you think about it. I I took the number twenty national that ran at India in 1911 uh, for the centennial. They let me take a lap around Indy's oval um, in 2011, and that car supposedly did a 100 mile an hour lap back in 2011. And after they let me take it out, no other traffic, I did a, a 100 mile an hour lap around Indy. When I came in after three laps, I couldn't hang on. My eyes were bouncing around. My teeth were chattering, you know, from the, the vibration. And then I thought, when that track was brick yes. in 1911, Can you imagine? it was a seven and a half hour race. I mean, tough. You know, they were farm boys. They chopped wood by hand, you know. They climb in a race car. You know, I hate to say it, but I think a lot of the uh, training that our Formula One drivers get nowadays probably would not be adequate for a seven and a half hour race in one of these cars. I can well imagine. And what are they like to wheel? I mean, physically, I'm, I would have thought they're a handful. They are. The steering is very, very heavy. So you're, you're, it's a, it, definitely a two handed steering. Um, you've got to have both a handbrake and a foot brake. And neither of them work worth a darn because they only work on the rear <laughs> wheel. So you use them both simultaneously, and then you got to let go of the brake, grab a, uh, the hand shifter real quick. Uh, so they, they are a handful to drive. I am interested. The number 20 just going up the corkscrew. That's, that's the car that ran uh, at Indy in 1911, finished seventh. It's amazing, absolutely amazing. And, 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 and here we are. This many years on, and we're still going around. That's what blows my head off. It's just that the fact that it's possible. Uh, I, I just can't think of an, another sport where where this is the, the maintaining, the love, uh, all the rest of it. The whole Scott Model M just passed. passed through. 
I was talking about how some of the innovations that came from these early cars, and I mentioned the Marmon Wasp about how that was the first use of a, of a, of a real development, the history of racing, and how each innovation changed the sport and changed the automobile use by us, uh, mere mortals. Um, but these are important times for the development. And, you know, one or two years back at the turn of the century was like one or two decades. Right. Because the innovations were coming so fast. The car, automobile, was brand new. Internal combustion engines were brand new. Not many people could get their hands on them They either. couldn't get their hands on it. But, I mean, the, the thought that you had cars experimenting with overhead cam engines. You had cars experimenting with different types of combustion chambers. Back then, nobody knew what was best. Well, listen, we're going to take a short break. More action coming up. The Ragtime Racers will be in action a year later in the weekend. My thanks for coming in. Again, you're always welcome. We want to talk cars. We want to talk history. That's what it's all about here at the Rolex Monterey Motorsports Reunion. We'll be right back.
Well, how about this then? We are here on Trans Am Alley, and it's a part of the Rolex Monterey Motorsport reunion that I absolutely love. Cars from 1963 know all about and one man that needs no introduction Mike Joy and Ken Adam as well alongside me uh, Mike just talk to us about the era and talk to us about some of these cars it's always always one and Monterey and the people who come here absolutely love these cars because every group that runs in historic Trans Am which is group eight here at this event is the car that actually raced and repaired but they're not allowed to build the spec above how these cars were then. You had a 302 cubic inch engine. That's what you have now. Uh, the brakes that were available then, the intake manifold, everything has to be the way these cars raced. And the group, the groups, the group is self-policing and uh, Ken is our steward and also one of the upfront runners. So it, it just makes it really collaborative fun. Uh, we go out there and I don't think they're about entertaining the fans, putting on a good show, uh, getting out on the track and then passing, repassing and just show the thunder and the fury that, that this series was back in the day. Yeah, and that's exactly what it was. Thank Mike. The thunder and the fury. It does, you know, shake your rib cage when oh, these things goes going. by, Ken. But I mean, <laughs> this is all about. This was all about, wasn't it? Exactly, and that's the fun part of the group. As you look around here, you'll see the famous cars for sure. But notice the independent cars. Those are the guys that wanted to have fun and try to beat the factory. And uh, those guys, they still have a lot of fan base. My car was from Connecticut. When we go to Lime Rock. People still come over from the 70s and remember the car or worked on the car or helped on the car. So that the history is a, a, a whole big part of this. 66 through 1972. Uh, John Bishop at the Sports Car Club of America wanted a professional series for these cars, not for sports cars, but for what they called sedans. You know, we now know them as pony cars. The, so the rules were very restrictive. If you swing around and look at Tom McIntyre's Camaro here, you'll in the headliner those inner panels and the door cards those were all required and this was as good as race cars got uh, back in in 1967 68 side glass the windows still have to roll 69 and he can show you what changed just from one year to the next Ken, let's go and have a look at this one because, like you're saying, great story with this one as well. Yeah. But the changes year on year, well, we see it. One of the kind of small subtleties that's really cool on this car is the pipes. See how they're built into the, the frame? They kind of outlaw. It kind of proves that this was the car. This car doesn't have the door glass because it ran later. Regardless, you had to meet weight requirements. So everything was kind of tried to be equal at the time. One cool feature on this car is these are. You would have either a green or a white or red light, and that would mean something to the pit crew. Yeah. So that's kind of cool. The uh, the fun thing, the guy that run this car, the 45 came from their hopes of, of sustaining sponsorship from Colt 45. <laughs> so that was a cool story that they told me after the fact. And did they ever get that, you think? They, they didn't, but actually I have a picture of the car. At one race, they actually did. Colt 45, not the firearms, no. uh, but the malt liquor <laughs> that was exactly popular right. back in uh, the 60s and early 70s. I love this era, and I love this alley, as I was saying to you. When you look along here, Mike, just the in the 80s, but what I was watching on the TV shows back then, you know, these are the cars that, you know, I would have been seeing on American television, and they're, right. they're just, I was drooling over these cars. <laughs> well, I was too, you know, in 1970. I was sitting on the hillside at Lime Rock watching these cars, and I was in the dunes at Bridgehampton and standing amongst the rocks at Briar in New Hampshire and, and at Watkins Glen and got to see all these cars run in period, uh, got to cover the events, talk to some of the drivers. And so this has always been where my heart is in racing, even though uh, my job is in NASCAR, and I love NASCAR, but... This history and drive cars that were actually part of that series back in the day 
It just just a, an incredible dream come true. Yeah, and I'll tell you what, Ken, something I just thought of that you said before, what's interesting is these cars are still being driven and still being raced. In the case of the Javelin that's on the way over there, like you said, talk about the numbers on how many times that raced then and how many times it might have raced since. Yeah, back there when the factory had these cars, they would race maybe seven, eight times, and they'd be have new technology in the next season and move on. That car has been raced several hundred times, and it's still hanging together. Yeah. And it's still winning. <laughs> and still winning. And that is like can look after them preserve them amazingly well but you guys do take them out and you know you're, you're giving them a you know you're you're driving them anger you're giving them a bit of a go absolutely i mean you know these cars go through a set of brake pads every couple of weekends they'll go through more than one set of tires during the weekend an engine gets about 50 hours before it has to be refreshed much more like a contemporary race car but i think the worst thing that could possibly happen to these cars is that they sit in a museum and gather dust our whole thing is about getting these cars out there, uh, the sound and the fury. That's you know we're we're the 1 p.m. race yeah. on, on Saturday, right after lunch hour, before at, right because everybody has a memory about at least one of the cars that are here. And, it, and, it, and as time moves on, it gets even more important, Ken, that guys like yourself and all the owners here do preserve them and do look after them because. We're not going to see cars like this ever again. This technology, the internal combustion engine, we all love it, but it's, it's on its way. And we love sharing the stories. And you see after our race, kids will come over that want to learn about the car. We let them sit in the car, climb on it. We'll let them start it. They go crazy. That's fun for us as well. All right, guys, listen, thank you ever so much for talking to us. Mike. Right, 1 p.m., and uh, I'll be in one Camaro, my son is in another, and there's nothing more fun th than sharing this with younger people and bringing younger people into the vintage racing hobby. Gents, it's been a pleasure to talk to you as always. Uh, Johnny, we'll go back to you. How about that? Absolutely superb. Kev Harris doing the business, Dan, in the pits, getting to meet some of the luminaries. driver from California who knows a little thing or two about racing these sorts of cars and has had a storied history himself. Patrick Long joins me here in the booth. Welcome, sir. Um, first and foremost, um, what is this event? I've, ever, I've asked everybody that's come in, what does this event mean to you? Oh, spirit. There's so much story being told in the pits. The ambiance is up. Uh, we're in the backdrop of one of the greatest car weeks that has ever existed. Uh, there's a little bit of everything going around Monterey, but when it comes to the track and this racing event, uh, the Rolex Monterey reunion has just been uh, epic. It's been evolving over the years. Uh, I've enjoyed driving it and everything from 62, uh, the Leighton House 962. So, yeah, I love these groups. Uh, I love the stories that the sort of committee has really worked on in curating cars with traditional period history in the proper livery from that era it's very very pure you're not finding recreations you're not finding club racing cars this is this is the legit stuff and and this group that's about to go green is is one that i love racing lots of 935s out there and as a kid from thousand oaks i mean did you grow up having a passion they're going to do one more because of the new surface they're just giving everybody a chance to to feel it a bit better but did you grow up with racing definitely grew up with racing in my blood nothing professional no one was making a living at it the closest thing was my grandfather owned a flying a gas station in the mid 50s okay um in the hot rod period history of rods during the week going out to el mirage and dry lake straight line running and uh, so i've i've grown up with it in in my vein seen cars uh, all my life and uh, dragged to races like this. I grew up in Southern California going to Varro races um, and a lot of dirt oval short track racing. Most people know exactly who you are, but you've had a storied history from every form of racing, single seated sports cars, obviously, NASCAR, you name it. As a professional racing driver, are you amazed at the ability of some of these guys who aren't professionals wheeling these cars? Absolutely. I mean, you look at the top of this grid, Charlie Newberg, yeah. uh, Cal Meeker, um, Bruce Canapa is usually out here, but uh, these guys push these cars to the edge. Yes, they're leaving each other a little bit more room. Yes, they understand that the safety and technology of these cars is not what today's racing car. They're pushing to the edge of it. 
Tell me a little bit about this group. As you said, you've been in this group before. You've raced in this group. What should, we, what should our fans be looking out for? Um, you know, I mean, every car has got a great story and they're all beautiful. But yes. is there any particular cars that you've either raced or you want to talk about to pinpoint something about them? Yeah, 1972 GX GTU. There's a lot of GT based class out here, but there's also some prototypes, especially up at the front. It's really about capturing that period of racing and what it was. And so you got a mixture of sports car racing, and uh, you're going to see a lot of dicing up. We'll probably get into some lap traffic if we stay green. Obviously, the 935s are the cars I have the most experience with in this class, some RSRs as well. The 3-liter RSR, naturally aspirated, lots of tire, decent amount of aero for early 70s. It's a great car to drive, very docile. Much the opposite the 935, it handles well in a straight line, but in the corners, you're working hard, you're playing with boost, massive turbos, and so you'll see on this green flag how, you know, Cal Meeker goes out in front, and he's probably running a naturally aspirated, uh, what is that, a mantra? Um, your weight, big tires, nice engine, but um, aerodynamics, and then when you get to third, you know, big monster Corvette, lots of horsepower, lots of straight line speed, but not quite as handy in the corners. So away we go then, a beautiful sound as they roared past our commentary position. Alongside me, Jonathan Green, Patrick Long, delighted to have you on board, and as you say, the organizers... 14 groups together, including the ragtime that we've just seen. Uh, very special, we're getting Can-Am and 5,000 out here, Formula One, self-included out there later today. Um, is there a particular group you enjoy racing more than any? Uh, the 962 and GTP is close right. to It's one of the few cars I've driven in my three decades where you never get 100% out of the car lap after lap. You really have to balance. It's got a delicate gearbox, you know, H pattern, synchro box. It, it's, it's really tricky to drive, but lots of horsepower, lots of downforce, and really test the driver. In that Corvette Greenwood wide body there from 1976, and obviously we're celebrating. I had Ron Fellows up here in the booth a moment ago. We're celebrating Corvette 70 years here this weekend. Special time for them, both present, past, and future. Yeah, Corvette, uh, a big rival of mine in my Flying Lizard days. I'll bet. <laughs> uh, racing GT here. I mean, many people have seen the YouTube video with York Burkmeister. Uh, and Jan Magnussen door banging all the way to the finish line at the end of a race that Jurg and I shared the Flying Lizard car. But Corvette has been a staple in GT racing since uh, I started my career, and they carry so much fanfare, so much passionate following, and you know relevance. Uh, I think you've seen them, like Porsche, marketing and developing race cars on the track that have. clientele on track so it's great to have their support i sit on the advisory committee for this race and we also try to kind of connect the dots on getting storylines of featured marks getting support from oems and um, this corvette deal came together late but we got all the right support for it and it's really uh, a special way to not only make it uh, more obtainable but also to get some great drivers like ron and some amazing examples of cars out here to the heritage tent you mentioned Charles Nurburg, we just got a glimpse of him hooning around. And the man from Dallas, Texas, he might be getting up in age, but he's in that Porsche 936 from 1980, and he's pushing it. Yeah, that 935 is a beast of a car. Um, I know quite a few people have put their hands on that car, and I've raced against it, and he's not left much there, but all tribute and, and all testament to Charlie's skill as well. Not only is he quick and aggressive, he's smooth, but he's also fit, and this isn't the only car he's driving. Uh, as you said, he's, he's no, no young man anymore, but he takes his racing passion, and he always has a smile on his face. There you see him just cresting top, uh, turn one, uh, followed by the Momo 935, and... Uh, yeah, it doesn't look like he's pushing as hard as he usually does. I don't know if he's shaking some bugs out of that car or not, but I saw him running uh, P1 at least on the first day uh, in his Formula One car. As an owner and also as a driver with the skill that he has. What's the resurfacing like? I've been asking you a few drivers. Have you been out yet? It's great. I was worried. I was worried that we were going to lose the character right. and uh, the heritage of, of Laguna Seca or WeatherTech Raceway. And, you know, it's, it's great. They did a great job. Uh, lots of grip mid-corner. 
obviously looks brilliant, but it's driving really well. Um, some drivers were talking to me about whether or not the grip offline was what it used to be, and it, it can't be much less than it used to be. I mean, the, right. the tarmac was pretty worn out, so no, this is great. Ken Epsman uh, from Santa Clara, California, and the Decon Monza out there. And we just also saw Matt Munlava in the uh, 1976 RSR. Yeah, Martin's been putting some great times in in that RSR. That's an interesting car, a very early chassis, uh, short wheelbase. Updated, stretched, arrow, widened, and just a lot of these Porsche cars lived many different lives in lots of different spec. And uh, where they've kind of brought this car back and shined it up is a great, uh, great time. There you see him just coming out of turn 11. Uh, got a big engine in that thing. It's healthy. I've run with it, and uh, he does a great job driving it as well. He's been giving all the RSRs a hard time, and I love it. It's a short, it's a short hood, so definitely post-1973 as far as the spec of the body. Uh, we had that car at my show, Luftgekult, this year. It was a fan favorite sponsored by Jimmy Dean Sausage, so it doesn't get <laughs> it much more Americana than that. No, it doesn't. Now, you've raced all around the world. Where do you like racing? Is it, is it a home here, Laguna? Yeah, I mean, home tracks for me, uh, Laguna Seca, Long Beach are big favorites, but uh, in England, in Germany, so I got to race a lot of tracks that I had never heard of and many people hadn't heard of. And uh, Mountain Park was yeah. one of my favorites. Had Tough some good circuit. successes at uh, Snetterton, Love Knob Hill. Um, love, obviously, the Norschleife, Bathurst, Spa, um, epic tracks. I just don't know, having done a couple of laps around the Norschleife with, with some good drivers. I actually got around with, with a couple of professional drivers, but, uh, you know, I just don't know how you remember a circuit like that. It takes a while. One day I spent eight hours on, took my helmet off. I had one bathroom break, and just at about the seven hour and 45 minute point, I was linking laps together. session there and maybe even a, a, a VLN race weekend but yeah it just takes time I mean you'll see drivers there that don't race anywhere else and they'll put it down they really are quick they know every single space every single corner but the tricky part about the Norschleife is when it rains when it's yeah. night when there's a car upside down in a local safety zone and you've got to push hard right up to it it's a it's a war zone of a racetrack if I'm allowed to say that anymore these no days. I think that's, uh, that's fair it's enough. pretty wild yeah, no question about it. Yeah, I mean, that green hell, as they called it. Richard Goldsmith in that Decon Monza from 1976. And, yeah, definitely pushing on in these... Uh, mentioned the new uplift or facelift for the track. Some 20 million spent. We look at William Connor in that 1980 Porsche 935. 88. Yeah, that car is a great car. I've driven that car. I've raced it a couple of times here. He's a passionate sort of socialite here in town as well, successful businessman and puts on great cocktail parties at his amazing oasis in Pebble Beach. So every once in a while I get a phone call from him and it's like, hey, I need you to jump in and drive this car. And tell me what it's doing. So I'm like, twist my arm, you know, Momo 935. It doesn't get much better than that. But uh, that car just recently had an all new drivetrain from Porsche Motorsport North America in Southern California. They're getting the bugs worked out of that. And Chip's got that and a, a great Trans Am car from the, the class that they just interviewed with Mike Joy. So, I loved racing that car last year. Uh, hammer and tongs with Bruce King. Everything. Uh, I love the diversity of it, and there you see it. You get you get all different types of cars making lap times in different ways. I think there's two Momo 935s, so there was at least slated to be two 935s out there with Alan Turpins as well. That's right. Alan Turpins is out there. Just trying... Yeah, Bruce kind of sadly not making it out there. Must have been mechanical of some sort, or not here yet. Sure, he'll be out there. Rob Canop also here this weekend. Watching Group Six, Patrick Long helping us along uh, with this fantastic group, and so exciting. 2023, it just feels like a new era in many ways. With uh, Laguna Seca stepping into the new bridge, new track, but these absolutely storied cars. And there's a 1973. As a factory Porsche driver, does it amaze you that the history of Porsche in racing alone, uh, I mean, there isn't, I don't think there's a mark that has ever been as successful at all forms of sports car racing. Yeah, it's in the DNA of the company. I mean, when you think about where the original and 
looking for that sports car that was agile, it was light, it was efficient, and that carries all the way forward to today. But I think it's been very clear that the Porsche family and a lot of the people that have led the company are racers. And it's not just marketing, but it's track to street, uh, technology transfer. Uh, of course, there's branding, marketing, heritage, all of that. But at the same time, when you look at GT cars, prototypes, successes at Le Mans, more overall wins than anybody, uh, it's not just 911s. There's so much Porsche running uh, through these paddocks and through the history of, of sports car racing and, and all the like. But and yeah, I these RSRs up in England, I hadn't realized until I came to California just how much of Porsche was imported here yeah. and how successful muscle cars and, and winning. Yeah. Uh, and that kind of obviously continued into IMSA and so on and so forth. But of course, Le Mans, story, history, etc. But I hadn't realized the love, the passion that the Americans have for Porsche as a, as a brand and a bar. Yeah, and if you think about the geography, I mean, Southern California especially, but also Northern California, lots of topography, lots of elevation, yeah. twisty canyon roads. And then Detroit's making these huge muscle cars and <laughs> battle wagons. And so I think when military men were serving over Europe and jumped into an English car or into a Porsche in Germany and had these ripping little emotional cars, naturally aspirated, uh, visceral and emotional, and, and started bringing them back over here. I mean, when you look at the Max Hoffman story of importing Porsches very young and early uh, into the East Coast, and then those cars making it to the uh, in Southern California, and I think good weather also helps the case. Uh, top down, of course, the Speedster has kind of made its name starting here in Northern California, if my history is correct. So, no, it's been there all along on the street side. I think when I started with the company in 2002, the stat was something like 13% of sales worldwide for Porsche were just in Southern California alone. So wow. it's a big market, and I've, I've learned about the geography. I think that would surprise a lot of people. Yeah, it's incredible. Uh, just seeing the back of Cal Meeker heading into the corkscrew, um, yep. that Lola is on rails, and I think he's pretty well out front yeah now. i think he's gonna i think he's gonna roll this one no problem uh, <laughs> he's gonna be uh, well ahead he's moving uh in in alola and certainly no safety uh, for the driver in that car but cal keeps himself fit jumps into a lot of different stuff also racing a formula one car this weekend and uh have had some great battles with him i was running long beach this year and fw07 williams and cal was keeping me honest in the first race uh you know he he gets on it and it comes out with a smile he said he just did lamont classic this year for the first time and yeah. had a lot of fun do you do the lamont classic as well i haven't done that event yet i'm i'm looking to uh, get the right opportunity there's a few bucket list events since i retired from full-time racing at the end of 2021 where I've always talked about Le Mans Classic, Goodwood Revival, which I'm signed up to do this year and very excited to go for. I've never been to the event, let alone drip, drive it. I, I'm sure there'll be a few quite willing to, to let you have a, have a go. Yeah, I'm excited. James Davenport. But yeah, Mika doing a brilliant job. And in fact, I've got him down at a 126.3 as a fastest lap. So he is absolutely hooning around this track at the moment. Fantastic stuff. The new surface helping him. James Davenport in the Chevron. Looking at him, number 28. hard mike is a good friend great driver and a guy that does a lot of professional spotting in imsa these days works with the lexus teams also done a lot with mike shank and the acura program yep. and uh, i've been running into him in the pits he's pretty passionate about getting every single millimeter of racetrack and every tenth out of the cars and i uh, love seeing stages of group six is our leader cal mika in the 115 doing a brilliant job so far and really has put down a display of racing like no other. And uh, James Davenport in second place as he starts his last lap now. And Mike Sweeney, who we were just speaking of, in third at the moment. Mike Furlow just behind in fourth place. Charles Nurberg, who we had a moment, and Alan Turpins in sixth. But it's all about Cal at the moment in the 115, heading home. Yeah, I see that uh, Char Charlie Nürburgring had originally had entered at Porsche 936 in this class, if, if that's correct on the program. Porsches uh, to choose from with one might have an issue. I saw a shot earlier of Ransom Webster as well and love that pink and white 935. He's a great guy and super passionate. I know, know a few more, more of these Porsche guys than I do some of the other cars, as you heard about 
Um, I slip up on Cal Mika early in the race, but uh, yeah, those those cars are just. Listen, there's 400 cars out here. Yeah, I'm, the, I'm, the T2 I'm hanging 94. on for dear life. I can tell you, it's uh, it's pretty impressive. I don't envy your position. Well, and you know what was interesting? I was talking to Barry Tepka uh, earlier, and you, you say you're part of the committee. I had no idea that something like 600 cars apply, and you cannot have 600. Cars. You just couldn't control it. So we're down to 400. That seems incredible at its best. I mean, so it's a hell of a task to get this race going. It is, but it's not just about filling the grids up. Um, the cars have to fit that bill, as I mentioned earlier. Examples out on the racetrack, and they also are really tough on driving standards. Uh, you have to belong to this race, and uh, you have to behave. They want to protect the drivers. They yeah. want to keep these cars clean, and uh, yeah, just a brilliant job with, uh, with everything on the organization side so far that the track has done. But uh, congrats to Cal on taking a pretty easy win there. Yeah, the Lola uh, T294 of Cal Mika at the wheel in the 115, taking the checkered flag and pretty much making it look easy out there. It certainly isn't. James Davenport. Um, 20 or so seconds behind, but uh, a great run. Mike Sweeney in third. And in fourth place, Mike Thurlow and Charles Nurberg. Rounding out the top five, Alan Turpin six, and then uh, Joey Bollard in seventh, Ken Epsman eighth, Martin Lauber in ninth, and rounding out the top ten, Ransom Webster. My thanks to Patrick Long. What time, t what time are you at? What are you running? Uh, we're about, I think, 4 o'clock, 4.30, okay. uh, Group 13. I'm driving the green Leighton House 962. Oh, I know starting that Starting from pole, and uh, yeah, got Travis Ingen to my right side in an R8 with probably about... 20 years newer of a race car, but well, that should be uh, fun. An epic lineup of uh, about boys. We run later in the day, so hopefully the sun will be shining when we go out there. Look forward to it. My thanks to Patrick Long coming in here and uh, looking forward to seeing him out on track from pole position in that Leighton House. We'll take a short break. More action coming back from the reunion after this. Thanks.
Well, look at this. All of these cars themselves are works of art, but one man who knows about doing exactly that, turning them into a work of art, uh, is Bill Patterson. Bill is responsible for the event poster, but then more than that, Bill, you're responsible for all kinds of motorsport posters and motorsport pieces of art. And the thing that's impressing me about this, just tell us how long this has taken you to do this. I'd say I'm probably 35 minutes into this, more or less. It's, you know, these things, doing this style, I, I like to try to get right at an hour. That is incredible, and an hour. And just let's just talk about this for a minute because we're going to wander inside. You have a passion for motorsports. You have a passion for skiing as well, but motorsports, you love drawing cars. You like creating movement in your images. Yeah, so when I first decided that I want to do this as a career after after being an architect, I uh, I... I got very good at basically recreating a photograph and I thought that was pretty spectacular until I realized it was just sitting there. So then it was like, okay, what's wrong with this? What is it? Why is this piece not, not making me happier than it should be? And I realized it's about making it move. And so I, ever since that I've been trying to make myself, when I realized I, if I go really fast in a practiced way, I can end up getting the motion and the emotion that I feel about uh, watching these guys and and wanting to be wanting to be in the car. In fact, don't tell anybody, but it's always me driving the car every time. Whether it's a Formula One car or a Le Mans winner, it's always me. And what you're drawing here, you got I'm I'm guessing a Stingray. You got a couple of Corvettes here. Yeah, it's it, this is a Corvette weekend. It makes sense to do that. And these are these are fantastic. I think this is a '67. I don't even know my Corvettes that well, but. Uh, and that's a C2 and a C5, maybe? C6? Anyway. Well, let's, let's talk about a Corvette that we have seen, because it's up here on the wall, this huge one. This is the Le Mans car that we saw just a while back when we were chatting to the guys from Corvette. Um, that's incredible. How long does that one take you to do? Oh, that one, that one took me a few days. Uh, that one is, is a much more studied piece. And uh, I ended up probably doing the background like three or four times. And uh, I typically like to just start and go. And if I don't like something, I change it on the fly. A lot of artists lay things out perfectly and then just simply sort of paint by numbers for lack of a better word whereas i like to try to build it as i go and tweak and and move as i go but trying to maintain that that loose uh, free uh, motion style now you really get the motion and the emotion as you said and people are going to see this all weekend long because this is the event poster and this is what's on the uh, the front page of the program as well and how did it come about that the guys from rolex the guys from the event came to you and said bill can you help us out and do something for us for the event well, actually, I've been very fortunate to be uh, the artist here at Laguna Seca for most of the last 18 years. So I've been doing a lot of these for a lot of years, and uh, and it's it's become a very natural thing to interact with with the the track here and everybody on the staff. I've been doing it for so long; they kind of know what to expect, and and I know what they want. And so uh, very often we it doesn't take us long, and I and I love being that guy. Believe me. Uh, yeah, you do. And what I've enjoyed when we've been just standing around chatting, people like coming up and talking to you. I'm watching you do it because let's just. I wonder if I wonder if we can wander inside, madam. I'm going to slide past you. I want to just sort of come and have a look at some of these. Um, some of the ones that really sort of get the movement for me, like you're talking about this. When you look at this, you can tell the cars are moving. It looks like they're leaping out of the page, doesn't it? And I love telling stories too. I'm a big fan of the sport, so I love those three cars were so significant to the sport. And it's I love combining those things that you'd never actually see on a track. I can get away with stuff that photographers can't. And I like to try to take advantage of that uh, little trick in my bag whenever I can. And, and also what I was just about to sort of come to before we wandered in, people are enjoying watching you do the painting. Yeah. You're out front and yeah. you're doing these things in 30 minutes or an hour or yeah. whatever. Yeah. But that's part of the thing for you, isn't it? Putting on the show of actually doing it before someone's uh, eyes. You know, there's, uh, I'm kind of a show off. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I don't think of myself as an extrovert. But, you know, one of the great things about doing stuff live is people just ask me, gosh, aren't you nervous up there? Well, actually... The audience is behind me, so I'm just painting. I just get lost in what I'm doing up front, and I enjoy watching it happen. I, I think, I mean, I'm watching this thing come out of the canvas, and I'm, I'm enjoying it as much as anyone. And uh, I realize people like to watch it. That's cool too. I love that. Brilliant. So, how many do you think you'll get done over the next couple of days while we're live out front? Are you going to be a busy man all weekend long? Well, I'd like to. We'll see how busy I get. Uh, obviously, the number one thing to, uh, is to sell here, so I've got to do that too. Uh, and I, plus, I want to get out and see the cars. I'm a huge fan of all this stuff, and I know a lot of the drivers and and uh, love the the brands that are running here and the histories. And I get to enjoy. All, I want to absorb as much as I can. A lot of the the fuel in effect that I absorb by being here and observing I will will, will, will be expended in the studio later yeah and some of your, your bigger pieces like you say they take you many many hours to do 
a few thousand dollars. What yeah. are we looking at here? Yeah, yeah. So the Corvette piece in front, I think I've got four thousand dollars on that, which I think is pretty reasonable for the for the, the amount of time I've I've uh, been doing this. Somebody asked me years ago when they saw me do a live painting, they said, uh, "How much do you want for that?" And I said, "Oh, three grand." And the, and they said, "Well." How long did it take you? And I said, 40 years. Yeah. So, you know, you pay for that too. Right. Yeah, exactly. It's not just owning the mallet. It's yeah. just putting the time in to know how to use yeah, the mallet. Exactly. That's exactly right. There's yeah. a story, yeah. Exactly. But if people haven't got four grand, 25 or $50 gets them a print for the right. poster. So the uh, the official uh, poster is 25 bucks, and I'll have those available on my website at billpatterson.com. And then I've got prints that start at 70 or start at 50 and then 75 and then all the way up to uh, reproducing for example the uh, the the motor GP piece up here that's actually a reproduction on canvas that's not the original so I can do any any I can reproduce on canvas or paper or any conceivable size so yeah I, I, I love I love being part of the the motorsports world Listen, I'll tell you what, the motorsports world really enjoys you having you here, that's for sure. Um, listen, Bill, thank you ever so much. And look at this, as while we're chatting, the crowd has gathered outside. They're all just looking at that going, wow, it's amazing. Yeah. There are people coming from all over. Bill, we'll let you carry on. Johnny, how about that? Are you any kind of an artist up there in the, in the commentary booth? I, I've been known <laughs> as an artist, but not one from the commentary booth, no. Yes. Um, Maybe down in a uh, down in a pub somewhere, they, they describe me as such. But no, um, I have a Bill Patterson um, print on my office wall from this very event. Uh, big fan. I've watched him work. He is absolutely amazing. He is at so many of events um, at uh, motor racing events around America, and uh, yeah, absolute joy to see him working and continuing his work. And those originals are worth every penny that you pay for. If you're a motor racing fan, you need a Bill Patterson, that's for sure. Now, talking of real artists, here they come. Group 7, as we finally get a chance, and I'm excited by this, and I know the organisers are Can-Am from 1966 to 1974 and 63, 68 USRRC. Looking forward to this because this was such you know, we're celebrating Trans Am's history, we're celebrating Corvette's history, we're celebrating so much of those important eras of American racing, and Can-Am stands out uh, head and shoulders um, as one of the most exciting, frightening, thunder-creating noises. It was when McLaren, you just seen four go through shot, really made a name for themselves, especially Bruce and Denny Hume, Bruce McLaren and Denny Hume, the Denny Bruce show, as they called it. But they came to Can-Am and took on the best, and the Canadian-American series was just very special indeed. And we've got examples of so many of them here in Group 7, from Lola's to McLaren's, We've got the odd Huffaker Genie as well, a Mark 1 out there. Uh, obviously the Lola as well, we've got an M8D from 1970. And we've also got a 917, uh, 917 excuse me, a 917 PA from 1969, Gunnar Jeanette, who has made a name for himself in historic racing here in the States, particularly races all over the world as Gunnar based in Florida. and. Uh, yeah, he's always a regular here, and looking forward to seeing him pedal around. So they're doing the obligatory two laps now of warm-up, and the reason for that is because it's a new service, everybody wanting to just make sure they've got their uh, line of sight, so to speak, because it's a lot smoother. And there are a few different lines than before, slightly different, but uh, as we heard from one of the drivers earlier today, they're not saying that Laguna has been changed in any way after that resurface. That was a worry, obviously, it always is. When you redo a surface, you spend a lot of money on giving an older circuit. Since the mid-50s, they've been running here. So putting a new surface on is always a, an interesting time. So we're getting an extra lap of pace, pace car, get the tires up to temperature and understanding of the grip and level of grip here as also the day starts to heat up as well. The sun is now starting to pop out over the clouds. It started off, if you just joined us, with a rather muggy day with a little bit of mist as always is the case here on the Monterey Peninsula. But we were just seeing Gunnar Jeanette there in 
in that zero Porsche 917 from 1969. Leading the field around behind him, the 25 of Chris Springer in a McLaren M8F. And of course, the CEO of McLaren here this weekend, Zach Brown, although ironically driving a Formula One Williams is ironic but uh, not in his mind he owns it and uh, he is very proud as well as Corvette celebrating their 70th year McLaren of course celebrating their 60th year Bruce McLaren I would have thought would be very proud of what McLaren has achieved in all forms of racing but in many ways while a lot of people know Bruce and McLaren as a Formula One team what they did in Can-Am was spectacular to be quite honest and they really brought this championship by being some of the best drivers in the world alive for sure so forming up and getting ready to roll what can chris springer do against gunner Jeanette? Jeanette, one of the younger drivers in historics and a very very good peddler also got australians from kent town we've got uh, grant and perryman He's driving an M1C McLaren from 1967. Great to have the Australians here. And we've got the green flag waving for Gunnar Jeanette, and he does just that, guns it over the crest down towards Andretti for the first time. And the McLarens following him on. And this one of the early 917s and of course looking forward to getting some words of wisdom Charles Nurberg's just joined us here in the booth delighted to have him on board I've watched him race I'll let him catch his breath because he's just rushed up here my producer has hustled him in as she should but great to have him on board because he's just literally popped out of the car he was in the last group pretty much uh, but uh, a name that is familiar both to me and to historic fans around the world, Charles Nurberg. Welcome to the commentary booth. Welcome to the Rolex reunion yet again, an event I know you love uh, and have a lot of passion for. First and foremost, how is it out there? Well, the, the, you know, the track's got new pavement. It's it's kind of it's kind of you know it's kind of rubbering in. Uh, you know, it was pretty diabolical last weekend, but <laughs> there's a few more groups out there now. Uh, you know, one and two are still. You got to pick your place in one and two. Um, all in all, I mean, the grip services, I think it's coming in really well. I just mentioned that actually while you were coming up, I was just talking about the fact that um, why we're doing two pace laps for the simple reason that the new surface doesn't catch people out, but there are nuances, there always are. There's going to be bumps that, that, that um, or bumps that have gone now that you probably were used to going, oh, this is my breaking point. Suddenly it's disappeared. Uh, you might get grip that you didn't expect to grip in certain places. And you might be able to go deeper in certain places. Is that something you found? Yeah, I think in general, um, you know, the old track was the old track. And it was just, you know, I mean, I think this is okay to say on the air. It was smooth as a baby's ass. Yeah. And, um, you know, so it's, uh, everybody was ready for a new surface. I think, frankly, everybody thought it would be quicker right off the bat than it is. But it is definitely quicker. And it's definitely, you know, it's definitely rubbering in. And I think, I think it's going to. Yeah, I think it bodes well for the future of Laguna Seca, for sure. You know, as we look at Zach Brown um, in a McLaren, finally, uh, he's going to be in a Williams later, but, um, you know, I was just explaining the Bruce and Denny show as it was back then. Bruce McLaren, of course, the owner and inventor of McLaren Racing, went to England, made his fame, Formula One, we all know the story, Zach now running the team. Um, but it really was Can-Am that, in some ways, to a bigger audience where Bruce McLaren really made his name. Yes, well, you know, uh, it, uh, 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 you're going to have to shut me up periodically. <laughs> no, not at all. You're I, here to talk. I have a lot. Of, I'm old enough to have a lot of stories. Come on. My dad actually bought the second McLaren Elva customer car that was built. Wow. Uh, it came into the states in '67, and uh, he had a, a fella driving with, uh, with him at that time, uh, Joe Starkey, who won the. Uh, uh, a sports racing SCCA national championship at Daytona with the car and uh, my dad raced it some and so my history with McLaren goes really way back to the beginnings of the customer cars and uh, so I have a real fondness for McLaren I uh, actually in this race one of the cars out there I used to race when I was when I was in my 20s and uh, it's the <laughs> car that Chris McAllister my good friend Chris McAllister yep. Yep, yep. from Indianapolis is driving and uh, 
That was a uh, that was a team car, and uh, we bought it from Commander Motor Homes and uh, raced it for several years. And uh, I'll show. I, I got some more stories about it, but you probably have some other questions. Well, I, I mean, I, you just kind of put your finger on it. I mean, this is a fraternity like no other. These are you, these are your lifelong friends out there. Yeah, absolutely. I've known Zach since uh, we raced in Formula Atlantic together in the Pro Pro you know Pro Atlantic Series back in the early '90s. So. Uh, you know, these guys, we go back a long way, and, you know, uh, we don't give each other a lot of quarter on the racetrack, but but we're really good friends off of it. Charles, you've raced so many different uh, cars. Is there anyone that you really had to just, like, get out of the car and go, what the heck have I got to do to, to get, you know, to muscle this thing around because I don't get it yet? I mean, you'll get on top of it eventually, but is there a bit of car, a historic car, You've gone. Wow! I've got to. I've got to do some homework here. Well, the M8F was a big step up when I got into it. So I have to say, I mean, the f the power was ferocious, the acceleration was ferocious, and and so that that car definitely got my attention every time I got in it. It was a well. It was a you know obviously a well designed car. It was you know it was very uh, dominant in the uh, Can Am series, of course, until the. You know the the Porsche Panzers came along, but uh, it was a good car. It was just you know it was for I think Mario. I think Zach told me that Mario Andretti told him that these were the only cars that he ever drove that just never stopped accelerating. <laughs> yeah, that's probably no word of a, of a lie there for sure. Well, the field started to spread out, and Gunnar Jeanette is off to the races. Alex McAllister out there in second place, and Chris Springer at the moment in. Third, we saw a quick shot of Zach Brown in a McLaren in fourth position, and Dan Cowdery in fifth position. Nicky Grio in sixth. Is it Grio? We've got yes. Nicky and Richard out there, yeah. I recognize the name from many races in historics. No, I was given, I was given uh, Chris credit for Alex's driving. Uh, my apologies, <laughs> Alex. Yes, it's Alex who's ahead, yeah, at the moment. How do you... Uh, I've seen you race at many an event. How do you see this? Where does this fit, this particular event, fit into the world of historics in your mind? You know, I, I haven't done the Silverstone Classic. That's something I'd like to do. I've, I've done the Monaco Historics a, a number of times. I've done the Goodwood Revival a number of times. Um, and, you know, and, and a lot of, I've been very, very fortunate to do a lot of great racing overseas as well as here in the States. I, I would say this is the, I would, you know, you always get in trouble when you say things like this, but, know. you know, what are they going to do to me? So, <laughs> you know, I would say this is second to the Goodwood Revival in terms of... Which is high praise in itself. Yeah, it, it is. And, and you know, the Goodwood Revival, of course, is, you know, is the Duke's personal mission. And so it, you have one man at the top, you know, I mean, writing the script and, and just, you know, his vision, his knowledge carries that thing, you know, and, and makes it what it is. I think the Ro I think the Rolex Motorsports Reunion is a little bit differently. It's a little different in, in some ways, however. Um, how do I say this? Um, you know, we're still colonials in the eyes of the British. You know, and you're you're a Brit. I, I am a Brit. Yes, yes. So I'm, I'm a colonial. I know, I know exactly what you mean, <laughs> and, and you put it very well and succinctly, and typically Britishly, actually. But you're right. There is there is always been. Let's put it this way: a rivalry yeah. between yeah. The, the Brits and the Americans. Yeah. One built out of pure respect, I yeah. may add. Yeah. But there's always been a belief. Yeah. That the Brits and the Europeans yeah. just kind of knew what they were doing, and oh, what are the Americans with their big muscle cars and all the rest of it? Yeah. That has changed, let's face it, over the years. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, look at Formula One now. We never thought we'd see domination by Americans, and yeah. that is really where we are now. Yeah. Uh, well, you, oh, I'm, no, no, I'm sorry. I'm but, sorry. you know, I know I was about to finish that by saying, and Ford are coming back, you know, I mean, yeah. th things have changed. <laughs> well, you, you know what? You know, one of the things that, that people sometimes don't realize is, you know, you can you can go if you're based in England. You can go to any race on the continent. You know, with essentially a half a day, yeah. a half a day travel for the car and the transporter. Now, if you want to go to the south of Spain to Jerez or, or you know, Estoril or you know, in Portugal, of course, you know, or Bar Barcelona, Catalonia. You know, th that's maybe a two-day trip. But here in the U.S., if you're on the East Coast and you want to come to this event, you've got to commit. Essentially, if you're going to abide by the rules of transport, you've got to commit five days each way for your guys and your crew. And, 
it's a monumental effort in this country to race all over the country. It's very hard to do. It takes a lot of time, a lot of money. And so that's the one thing that I think in a way slows down vintage motorsport in the U.S. is it's just difficult for the same group of guys. You know, to, in, in England, you know, I've been over there, you know, and done six or seven races in a row, and you're racing against the same people. You know, okay, maybe that's over an eight-week period, but, but, I mean, essentially what I'm saying is there is more competition in that there are more events more readily available to more people and so inherently they get more track time and there's a, and the and there's a lot of good drivers here in the US and a lot of good got a lot of guys go over and do well overseas and uh, but you know there is truth to the fact that the fields are sometimes not as deep and I think it's largely logistics due to the ge- you know the geographical nature of the US yeah you're absolutely right i mean there's no question and history shows it in terms of uh, of how uh, racing grew in Europe. Um, you really can do a Formula One or a Formula Two or a Formula Three test on a Monday at Alton Park. Head up to Snetterton or head down to Snetterton, uh, test some more, or get your sports car out. Get on the ferry that night and be in Spa by seven o'clock the next morning. And that was the truth for a John Surtees or uh, you know many others, Jackie Stewart, you name it. Um, they all did that. They would race Formula One, Formula Two, and, and sometimes sports cars all in the same week. Yes, it's a, you know, I was very fortunate to uh, get get to be friends with my hero, Dan Gurney. Fantastic. Uh, I, when, when we bought the Eagle Mark III GTP car, b- before it came for auction, I I called them. I, I knew them only in passing, but I knew Kathy Wyda, who's the gatekeeper. Uh, <laughs> and I said, Kathy, you know, I, I'd like to talk to him about the, the Mark III, uh, which was an incredibly historic car, you know, one Sebring overall twice held the lap record at Daytona for sports cars until a couple until two years ago anyway blah 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 um, and, and listening to Dan talk about his years of racing in Europe and the travel and how that worked it was just fascinating yeah now that's a long a long time ago now but you know but it was it was really it's it was just fabulous to hear about the you know the racing circus if you will they used to call it a circus. Well, and, and it is true. I mean, e- even in modern Formula One, I've seen mechanics carrying, you know, like, like you know, you get to the, the belt to pick up your little bag and there's somebody got a, you know, <laughs> a complete engine or, a, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, it is that small. It's like, I mean, when you look at Europe, it's like it's like racing only in Massachusetts. But everything, every circuit you can, <laughs> you know, you can think of is, is, is within those confines. America, geographically. And I have to say, as a Brit, uh, not moving here until I was like 18, I hadn't realized the vastness. Yeah. I live in Texas right now. I mean, it takes three days to get out of it. Um, oh, where in Texas? Austin, Austin, Texas, baby. Oh, you're in Austin. But, okay, well, I'm just up the road. Yep. Oh, right, there you yeah. go. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Oh, well, you're in Dallas, yes. Well, I went to college in Dallas. There you go. So it's a small one. Yeah, I always get a kick when my friends come over from England the first time. They say, well, you know, I, I want to go see the Empire State Building, and I want to do this and yep. this in New York, and then, then the next day I'd like to kind of run over to, you know, I'd like to run to Niagara, and then the next day, I'd, and I'm going, and then finally, you know, they've gone from coast to coast in three days. Oops. Now, that is Dan Cowdery in the Lola, T-70, parked up. I believe he's facing the wrong way. He's not, he's not in a good position. But he's out of harm's way, I would say. But more importantly, he's got... Ah, he, was, he, just, went, he just went on at the corkscrew, didn't he? Yeah, he did. He turned it round. Yeah. And, uh, well, he's out of harm's way. That's well, he's, important. Yeah, he's doing a very good job of paying attention and coming on in the right way and in the right place. Have you driven one of these? Uh, well, let's see. Um, 917? Actually, um, well, not uh, yes. I have a 917K actually, uh, one of the uh, Gulf Wire cars that we'll have out at uh, the uh, uh, in the Gulf out at Co- Rensport. In the Gulf Coast. Yeah, it's, yeah. It was a Gulf Wire car in the day. Actually, it won the first ever race for a 917 with Joe Seifert and Kurt oh, Ahrens at yeah. the Osterreich Ring, Fantastic. and uh, that was in the rounded body. And then Gulf, you know, John Wire took it over, put the K body on it. I haven't driven the uh, I haven't driven the open top cars other than in testing. I've I've been fortunate to uh, uh, a friend of mine, John Stafford, allowed me to drive his uh, 91730, which was truly a fearsome beast. I think Gunner's trying to make sure that he uh, gets his fast slap on this new surface. <laughs> He's absolutely flying 127.3. You'll be happy with that. Ah, that's good. Yeah. 
Uh, Gunner's quite the pilot. Yeah, I've got to know Gunner over the years from historics, and he's well known in Florida, obviously. Yeah. And uh, yeah, a very good, a very good uh, driver. He, yeah, he's getting in a lot of time this year because they're running the uh, the GTD. I think I've got my terminology straight. The the, the you know the the, Europe, the world championship GTD rounds. So he's getting he's a good shoe always and getting a lot of seat time and doing well this year. Fourth in class at Le Mans, I believe. Yeah, interesting times. I mean, I've been saying all day, you know, this is an historic event. Um, we, we, we look back at the history, but so much of today we've been talking about the future as well and the present. Corvette was celebrating 70 years, and here they are with the, their latest edition. Um, and it's it's absolutely in the DNA. And, and, and you know, even you know Adrian Newey, Zach Brown, these, these aren't people from the past. These are people from the absolute present. Yes, yeah. Well, it's... Uh you know, Adrian's here driving his GT40, you know, and uh, I was talking with him last night, and I said, how'd you get that car? And he brought up our old buddy Harley Cluxton. Uh, okay. Harley ran uh, Mirage cars at Le Mans, and, you know, was a very successful Le Mans entrant, and Harley's a personality unto himself, for those of you who know him. And, and I, asked, uh, I, asked, I asked Adrian, I said, well, when you got that GT40, did it have a 50 caliber mounted on top of it? <laughs> <laughs> Harley likes to. I probably better not say what Harley likes to do, but but, <laughs> but he's a character and, and a lot of fun to be around, and and uh, so you know Adrian's very really likes the track. He he said last night he said you know this is a this is a very technical yep. tricky little place, and I said yes. Oh it no is. question, especially in a high powered car like that. No question about it. Yeah. Well, big luminaries here. My thanks to Charles Nurberg, who's enjoyed, I'm sure, watching Gunnar Jeanette take the checkered flag as he did there in the 917. Brilliantly done. The 1969 version of it. Uh, coming in second place, Alistair. Yeah, McAllister. good on Alex. And yeah. Chris Springer in third. Zach Brown getting up to fourth place. Excellent job, Zach. Well done. Yeah, very well done. And holding off the likes of Nicky and Richard Rio, that's not a bad effort. Greg Hoff and Dan Cowdery, eighth. Brian DeFore in ninth position and Brian Blaine. He's coming in here later today in 10th position. Well, Charles, what are you heading out in next? Uh, I'm out in the F1 car at um, whenever I'm out, like two, two something. But I think I'm actually in to see you again if you'll have me right Absolutely. after lunch. Absolutely. My friend, you are more than welcome any time in the weekend. And by the way, if you see any of your pals, send them up. We want to hear the stories. They don't want to hear me talk about nothing. They want and to hear the stories of the reunion and to get if i can be a catalyst to get you guys talking that's fantastic well your your knowledge and your commentary is always very enjoyable and it's a privilege to be up here and uh so i will uh, i'll shut up and get out of here <laughs> go get you go and get your go overalls get on lunch. and show put a, what formula one car are you in uh it's a 1981 williams fw7c oh, yeah. okay it was a and jones reutemann car okay and Zach's yeah. in another one yeah. Yeah. yeah thanks to charles Nurberg. we'll take a short break and we'll be right back after this
We are inside five minutes before we get underway. Welcome back to the 2023 Rolex Monterey Motorsport Reunion. I'm Kev Harris and you join me live down here on the pre-grid for Group A. Uh, group um, 8, sorry. 1966 to 1972 historic Trans Am cars. When these things start up in a moment, they're going to shake my ribs and you will feel it all the way through the TV screen. Lining up on pole for this one then, because don't forget they are racing them, is this man, Josh Faber, and his Chevy Camaro. Josh, just give us a quick word. You're lining up on pole. What's it like here at Laguna this weekend? So much fun. Hopefully we're going to have a good race. Listen, you're driving a, a historic sports racing car here. You've got millions of pounds worth of car behind you, but you're going to give it a go, aren't you? You're racing. Absolutely. What? They're starting up. I'll tell you what, Josh, good luck. We'll go for a little stroll. Come this way because you've got to see, you've got to see some of these. That is deafening. We have an AMC Javelin lining up in number two. A Boss 302 Mustang lining up car 16 then is lining up on third. Now this is hands down one of the noisiest and most colorful array of historic sports cars that you'll ever see. Down here, one of two AMC Javelins is being driven by Bill Ockelum. We'll have a quick word with Bill if we can. Whether you hear me, I've got no idea, but I love these cars. Bill, how are you doing? Okay. You're lining up, I think, in about fifth or sixth, but I reckon within a lap or two, you'll be right up front. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. You can't hear me. He can't hear me. No one can hear us. He's, not, he's got to start up. It's incredible. We can't hear a thing down here, but you can probably hear me because I guess this is working. Hands down, folks, when you come to the Rolex, this class, these Group 8 cars are like nothing you've ever seen or nothing you've ever heard. I think, Johnny, we're going to have to go straight back to you because I'm, I'm deafening myself with this one. But I tell you what, oh boy, am I looking forward to it. Kev, you're doing a sterling job. Kev Harris down there in the pits. I think he's having a good time, you know. And I know this is going to be fun because I'm a Trans Am man through and through. And looking forward to this myself, I cover the current Trans Am series. And this is the series that began pretty much when I began, 1966. And it's been going ever since. It's the longest road running series in America is Trans Am. And it continues apace today. And it's sort of getting back to some of its former glory now. Some of the young NASCAR drivers, some 15 and 17 year olds coming to it on their way to NASCAR as we look across the peninsula. But a host of different cars, Dan Gurney a name, uh, synonymous with this kind of racing. And I am joined by Charles Nierberg once again. And while he doesn't race one of these cars, he's all too familiar with them, as every American racing driver is. Because, I mean, the combination of the late 60s, and I would put a point on it, 1970, here at Laguna Seca, uh, some would argue that the first race of the season here was the height of Trans Am. All the manufacturers, Roger Penske, international names, the money was here, the girls were here, the racing was hard. Am I right? Manufacturers were into it big time, and you had Parnell. You know, you had Dan Gurney, but you had Parnelli Jones, who Dan said was probably the best teammate he ever had. You know, Dan actually is so humble. He said that Parnelli actually taught him stuff, you know, uh, about driving these cars. And, 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 of course, you had just, you know, everyone else, you know, out there just hammer and tongs. It was, it was high stakes racing and a lot of commitment on the part of the manufacturers. But what was it, do you think, that captured the imagination as much as, as it did? Because in some ways, when you look back to 66, it was somewhat of a risk to start a stock car, or was it a championship, given that NASCAR was already established? You've got Can-Am, you know, doing what it was doing. Um, what was the magic sauce? I think the magic sauce was these were, these were every young kid's dream cars in right. America. And affordable. And they, well, that was the next thing I was going to say, Jonathan. They were affordable, and, and, and of course, the hot rod parts suppliers came out, <laughs> you know, in force with these cars. And so there was, you know, the cars were affordable. They were modifiable by guys in their backyard garage. And, and this was road racing as opposed to NASCAR, which yeah. was still, other than Riverside, you know, which Dan Gurney dominated, you know, other than Riverside, it was, you know, it was road racing on all the best tracks in the U.S., and, and the racing was ferocious. It was... You know, uh, they ran a, a, a uh, I think it was a two-hour race at Green Valley Raceway in Dallas where 
you know, you're not far from there now. Exactly, yeah. And, and I saw that race, and I keep talking about Dan Gurney because he was my hero, but he also was so successful, and, and he won that race at Green Valley, and he told me it was the toughest race he ever drove. He had no water in the car. It was almost 100 degrees that day. He said he was driving on muscle memory the last 15, 20 laps. Wow, that's amazing. That really is. Well, let's just put it in perspective. We're here at Laguna Seca. Squint your eyes a little bit. Maybe go to black and white for a second and, and imagine what it must have been like in the mid-60s and early 70s here. Surfer was all the fashion. Uh, you know, the Beach Boys were high. McDonald's just introduced their Big Mac in 1967. 45 cents, a bargain, no less. And the Jumbo Jet came out in 1968. And PBS started in 1970. It was all happening here in America. But the talk of the town was race on Sunday, buy on Monday. And as well as the kids, the manufacturers got into this because of that reason. Well, you know, you know, to show you the commitment of the whole thing, you know, you had Holman and Moody and you had Bud, you know, building cars and Bud Moore building cars. And you had Jim Hall from Chaparral fame yeah. running Chevrolets. You had, and then, of course, AMC up the ante by getting Roger Penske to prepare and race the Javelins with Mark Donahue. And, I mean, I mean, we're talking the biggest of the big leagues at that point. I think that's another side of it is that when you get Roger Penske for his fame, you also get Bud Moore with his NASCAR back, uh, back up and, and knowledge and, and, and know-how and, and fame. And then you bring the likes of Donahue and Gurney and so on and Vic Elf and, and ma many more. And you did have some privateers that were, you know, very keen drivers and, you know, able to prepare the cars well. And, and so there, was, there were really big fields and there was racing all throughout the fields. Yeah, and it really was no holes barred, was it? I mean, uh, you know, there were other racing forms where, you know, Robin, they say Robin's racing in certain, but these guys really went hell bent for leather, didn't they? Oh, yeah, it was great. You know, uh, you know, probably one of the leading privateers was a guy named Warren Agar, and his car is out here in the field today, I do believe. It's an orange 1970 Camaro. And I actually, uh, after I got my racing license in a Lotus Super 7 that I prepared when I was, you know, in the... Uh, in, in the uh, machine shop at, at engineering school, uh, I, I, got, I, got, I got a chance to drive a Camaro for several years, a 1970 Trans Am prepared Camaro. So these things are, uh, you know, they're, they're heavy, but they handle well. And brakes are the big, brakes are probably the biggest thing you have to kind of get used to if you're used to a modern car when you step into one of these. They, uh, the brakes were definitely, you know, not up to par with the weight and horsepower of the cars. Mike Joy, a name very synonymous with racing here in the States, has done, what, I don't know how many years uh, at the sharp end of broadcasting here in America. He is an absolute purist when it comes to racing these cars. Mike Joy, a name that many, many people know and have listened to and enjoyed over the years. He's racing with his son, Scott Joy, and they're both in Z28 Camaros. And uh, a very special moment. We heard from him earlier with Kev and, you know, to race with your son's got to be so much fun, and to race these cars especially. Mike said he was at all the, the, the famous courses watching these guys from the sidelines back yeah. in the day. Well, you know, you had George Fulmer and, yep. you know, and his brother Mike is here racing this weekend. And, uh, you know, it was, I mean, you know, Sam Posey, I mean, the, the list yeah. go, I mean, I feel bad leaving people out because, well, we got Dorsey Schroeder just stuck his head <laughs> yeah. in the, He doesn't know anything about Trans Am Come cars. What's in. he doing here? Well, we, yeah, we we'll talk about, we're going to have a whole Legends a day, I think. We do welcome one of the legends of Trans Am and, of course, motor racing in America, who, by the way, he's got a busy job uh, uh, at the moment because he's carefully and choreographically organizing this lot. Are they behaving? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. Looking forward to this, though. It's always going to bring back some good. memories, right? Yeah, and it's a fan favorite. You know, these cars make a lot of noise, a lot of thunder, and everybody loves the way they look. All right, guys, listen to that roar as the muscle car mayhem takes on Laguna yet again in 2023 taking us back to the late 60s and early 70s where this was the thing of the day without a doubt i gotta give a shout out to my my buddy uh josh fiber who's on pole here and leading the race in the university of pittsburgh camaro josh's dad john fiber is a longtime vintage racer and josh is you know, turned into a very fine driver and doing a doing a nice job out there. I just asked Charles what he thinks is the magic that made Trans Am so special here in America and made it stand out as it did. What do you think? 
Well, you know, originally I think it was the, the battle between the American manufacturers. Yeah. You know, it was keen interest that you could have a, a car in your garage at home that, you know, was just like these cars on the racetrack. And, and so you pulled for your favorite. And uh, the names back then were quite spectacular also. The guys behind the wheel, they're fun to watch. A lot of sliding around, a lot of finger banging. You know, it's, it's always been a, a great series. You know, and I was just saying, you know, I, I'm involved in the current Trans Am series and, you know, it obviously is not uh, got the manufacturing backing that it had, but it still has something special about it in today's form and the racing is just as good as it ever was, in my opinion, uh, and it's now starting to attract the young kids and the NASCAR up-and-comers, uh, and that again gives it a new chapter to kind of get stuck into. That could, in fact, be its salvation, the fact that the NASCAR... Um has taken a keen interest in it, and they're putting their new, the developmental kids, and they are kids, behind the wheel to you know learn to, to drive one of these cars in TA2. And TA2 is exactly like say, Xfinity, or it's very, very near yep. what an Xfinity car is. I was at Nashville a couple of weeks ago, and we had Brent Cruz, uh, a 15-year-old Toyota development driver, who is leading the championship, and there was an autograph session, and I kind of, sort of poked my head round to the crowd waiting and I said, you know, there's a couple of, oh yeah, we know who they are. I want to get his autograph. So, you know, it's starting to, it's starting to happen again. People are realizing that these kids are going to be Xfinity. They're going to be NASCAR drivers of household names uh, like you guys were in the day. It, it's amazing. I was the youngest driver ever in the country to get a, a license. I was the first under 21 year old How old were driver. You? I was 18 by two days in 1971. And uh, so that uh, was the first under 21 year old um, child, I call it. But now they're 13, 14, 15, I know. you know. And driving big muscle cars like this, uh, yeah. straight out of cars, it amazes me. Yeah, I think they may have some power steering these days. What do you <laughs> think, Dorsey? <laughs> yeah, you know, the TA2 car, the, to its credit, uh, it does have power steering, but it does still have a four-speed gearbox, H pattern. There you, you go. You still have to use the clutch in the thing. And there you go. You know, so you have to learn to drive it. It's not all mechanically operated by a computer like so many other cars are now. Absolutely. What was the key to set up then? You know, what our, during my era, the, the key was being able to keep for 100 miles the tires under the car. Yeah. You know, the, we, we actually had a 100 mile race, but we had probably 50 mile tires. So you had to uh, have a good feel for the car and, and understand the fact that the car is getting lighter at the back as you burn the fuel off. It's driving off the rear tires, so you're losing grip from that also. Um, and just having a feel for the car and not abusing it. Yeah, it's a good point. It's all very well being spectacular and getting sideways all the time, but if you run out of tires, you can't do it for very long. Jim Haig at the front at the moment. Josh Fiber right behind him in second place as the field starts to spread out with that muscle car sound. Again, echoing through the hills of Monterey, an absolutely resplendent sight and sound. That Ron Fellows in town this weekend, too. Yep. Grand Marshall and, and is driving a Corvette. And then, of course, Ron and I were teammates and then we were dire adversaries, you know. Um, he went to work for Chevrolet. He's known as Mr. Corvette. Well, I was Mr. Mustang, so uh, we, we had quite a go. Tommy Kendall and I were running Mustangs, and, you know, uh, a bunch of guys on the Chevrolet side. It was a good, good battle, it was. And it must have been nice or exciting when you have that backing. And I wouldn't say money was no limit, but, you know, there was money in the racing, and, and, and that was not always the case in a lot of series. That you were always scrabbling around, I hope that the series got going, you had the numbers, but in this particular era, um, you know, 60, 66 to 72, this was at its height, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think in, in the late 80s, early 90s, the money was quite a bit bigger. You know, the, the time that we spent there was a big payday. Uh, it's not that way anymore, sadly, for the guys that are coming up to it now. They got to write the checks themselves in most cases. You know, we were getting paid a uh, good, good amount of money. Yeah. Any particular cars that stand out for you or you have uh, fond memories of? I raced, you know, against some of these cars several times. I, I love the fact that you got uh, Mike Joy here yeah. and his son Scott and that they, uh, you know, they're running in, in this series. Of course, Mike's voice in NASCAR and, and uh, your son Scott and him with the two Camaros put on a good show and they, they're having a really, really fun time. They've had to work pretty hard this weekend. Though. Scott
got lost the head gasket early on. Uh, had to rebuild the engine. And, I mean, they, it hasn't been smooth sailing. <laughs> <laughs> and don't think for a moment that these are replica painted or anything else. In most cases, these are the exact modification to a nut and bolt that raced at the at the day in the day. Yeah. 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 They're they're very authentic cars and. Uh, you know, there's some engine components that probably have sure. better lifetime now than the, some of the stuff that was available in the day. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, they've kept the specs, you know, consistent with the history of the series for sure. How's the new surface holding up? So far, so good, everybody well, says. you know, I'm very impressed with it because when I got here, they had already had to do some repair work and some sealant work. And we were all really afraid that this weekend would take its toll. It has not held up quite quite nicely everybody i've talked to charles knows better than i am he's been out there in some fast cars but i've had no complaints with the grip yeah no it's it's coming in for sure ken Etzman in third place at the moment as through goes the 23 and a good 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 field in this group eight a very very strong field yeah, lots yeah. of different cars and different manufacturers yeah, you got a lot of a lot of really good drivers there. You know, Kenny and and uh, you know Chad Raynall helps get a lot of guys with the cars. And John Hildebrand, he's got a pretty famous son, you know, <laughs> running in the IndyCar ranks. So there's a lot of good history out there too. Well, that seems the way in motor racing. Father and son seem to, to follow each other's footsteps. Yeah, there you go. Well, guys, I got to get back to it out there. Um, I wanted to come in and say I, hi. I got I to do one thing before you go. Yeah. Dorsey may not remember this. I only did one ever pro Trans Am race. It was the Grand Prix of Dallas in 1995. And Tom Gloy, who, who, who Dorsey was driving for, gave me a call. And he said, hey, I know you've been doing single seaters, but how would you feel like doing a car at the Dallas Grand Prix? Well, I, I couldn't avoid that. And the big you were talking about maintaining tires. I did the first session. And, I mean, I, it was wheel spin city. And I said, Tom, I got to see Dorsey's throttle trace and his brake trace. And I spent two hours after the first practice memorizing your throttle traces and, and how much throttle I could use off of each corner so I could keep the Not tires it. under it. And back, back when I drove for Jack Roush, uh, Lee White was the crew chief back then, we'd go test somewhere. And he would let me run for three days. You know? We'd try this, we'd try that. And then at the end of the test, he would put a set of stickers on. And he goes, now go out and show me how fast you are. I want you to drive as fast as you can, can for as long as you can, and then come back. And that's it. he goes, I want a track record out of this. So I went out there, and I butchered that car, ran it as hard as I could, and I made about three laps, and I came back. <laughs> and he said, what are you in? I said, you said to come in when I was done as fast as I could go. He goes, well, why can't you go any faster? I said, there's no tires left. He goes, and that's what I had to teach you. He yeah, goes, when I, I tell you, he said, if I just told you you have to conserve your tires, it would mean nothing. Now you know if you drive like that, you got three laps. <laughs> that's and, great. And that's how he taught me. That's a great story because that is great. as true today in Trans Am as it ever was. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah, was yeah. good. That was well, fun. I'm going to be out there watching for bad boys, and you guys have a great All right, time. Dorsey, keep them in control. I don't oh. know how you... Herding cats, Dorsey Schroeder, the new, the new, the new job you've got, harder than racing. Thank you, all the fans Cheerio. out there. Keep watching. Thanks, Dorsey. Take care, Dorsey. Great to have a legend on board, and of course, very much hard at work. 400 cars to wrangle this weekend, and uh, great to have him just for a moment up in the booth to talk about some of the days. But a great story that, that epitomizes everything about Trans Am. Sure, you can go hell bent for leather, but you're not going to be there at the end of the race. Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty amazing. Uh, So we're looking at the 71, that's John Fudge. John Chip Fudge from Oklahoma City, uh, a big character in the 1970 Camaro and uh, a restauranteur. And a great, uh, he's already been a winner earlier in another car, I think, uh, this weekend. So good to see him out there as well. Looks like Josh Fantastic. is out there holding his own. Looks like he's got fastest lap right now. That's nice to see. John and I share one other thing. Josh and I share one other thing. We're both uh, alums of Dartmouth College and engineering graduates there. So I'm proud he's putting his engineering knowledge to good use out there. Yeah, very true. Very true indeed. Yeah, and I, you know, it made me think about with Adrian Newey here this weekend and Gordon Murray, you know, the guys that are on the other side of the fence, if you like, back in the drawing board, literally back in the day, designing these things and trying to work out what would make the difference. And even in these stock cars, I mean, the stories are legend of them 
dipping them in acid to make them lighter, to try to get them through scrutineering. I mean, just wonderful stories about how to take these stock cars and strip them completely. Well, you know, when you got the Bud Moore and the Holman and Moody influence, then you had every bit of knowledge that came <laughs> from bending the edges of the rules in NASCAR applied to these cars. So it was a whole new, you know, I would have to say it was a bit of a wake-up call for the sports car boys, you know, and uh, it was uh, it was definitely advanced the craft uh, you know, when you took all that NASCAR knowledge and, and applied it to a road racing car. Yeah, you mentioned that AMC, or well, we, we talked about that AMC Javelin uh, that Kem Exman is driving. As we take a look at the 77, that's Richard Goldsmith uh, in one of the Dodge Challengers. Yeah. Yeah the, yeah, the Dodge Challenger team came on strong. I'm blanking for the mo I'm having a serious senior moment on the drivers in the day. I think Sam Posey drove a... Yep. drove a challenger and i'm trying to remember who his teammate was i'm, I'm embarrassed to say i can't remember you maybe can't you, remember every driver that <laughs> maybe you have it there no i'm just looking at the, the the sam posey challenger that's also out there um sam posey and built by dan gurney's aar shop campaign yep by auto dynamics during a thrilling and highly competitive season sam got fourth in 1970 in a Dodge Challenger. But yeah. yeah, he was a youngster back then, what, in his mid-20s? Oh, yeah, he was. He was, you know, doing some time in Indy cars and doing some time and, you know, a lot of time in Trans Am. And, uh, you know, I think uh, one of the things that's, you know, I was always inspired by, you know, by the Jim Halls and, and the Dan Gurneys and, and, and the people that were engineers as well as drivers. You know, that was kind of, that was my inspiration to be an engineer was to, be able to understand what these guys were doing and understand how cars went together. So, I, you know, I, I love to, you know, everybody thinks these cars are super straightforward, and, and they are to a degree, but but if you were running up front, you would development. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. It, it, motor racing is one of those things where, you know, you get to a point where you're half a second, maybe three tenths, two tenths off, and then suddenly to get that extra ten, oh, yeah. then you're talking, you know. Yeah. You're at the steep end of the curve Very at that point. Very much so. Yeah. So much so. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, the learning curve gets exponential. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, look at that Boss 302 from 1970. Steve Fitmoo at the wheel as we continue to, to watch Joss Fiber going about his business in the 19, leading the way at the moment from Miller. Arthur Miller in second place, and Ken Exman in third, and then Peter Klute in fourth position. You know, you know that, that car that Josh is driving, it was the University of Pittsburgh Camaro, and, and they, you know, being from Pennsylvania, of course, they did get some backdoor assistance from Roger's team, uh, even, you know, because uh, this isn't, you know, Josh's car is a little earlier, it's a 69, and Roger didn't take on the Javelin program till what was it, 70? one or two I, I can't remember exactly so so there was some backdoor help but again it was engineering students that were helping to work on the car and helping to develop the car so it was uh it was really uh, you know really a cool effort robert kaufman there from charlotte in the 1970 pontiac firebird there you go confirmation there of the number eight in all white it's interesting growing up in the uk you know when, when people say trans am we always think of the pontiac trans am because of course that was the model we right. saw it you know in all right. the, in the movies and so on and so forth but of course then we were open our eyes were open to what was the trans am series i'm really liking this new surface and it's for, especially from above you can see just how, you can almost see how smooth it is, especially like uh, turn 10 here. Yeah. It, always, you know, it was almost off camber, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, and also they've added a few little extra areas of runoff, and I think a lot of people, at least I am, trying to figure out what part of that extra runoff you can use and what part just really actually, it looks like you can use it, but it takes you offline for what's to follow. So there's a little bit of a learning curve going on with the new surface. and. Uh, and kind of where there's some extra pavement now and does that really help you go faster or does it actually suck you into thinking you're going faster when in fact you're slowing up? Well, just looking at this corner 10 here, it was always tricky uh, and it's, it's deceptive. You see it from above much more yeah. than you do when you're on board actually yeah. and yeah. just how much of a right-hander it is yeah. and how you're coming into it yeah. downhill. Yeah, it, it, it dishes in and then it levels out as you come out. So it, it, 
you know, if you get too far off the outside there, you can go for a wild ride because it slopes off quite dramatically. And the turn before it as well, turn nine, is probably, it, it right seems yeah. fairly innocuous, but it's actually one of the tougher track corners on the track to get right because of the way you have to turn into it and the fact that it slopes off at the exit as well. It's a very, very technical corner. Well, here is our leader, and I'm glad he's wearing the day glow gloves because we can see him working the wheel. There you go. It's my mate Adam Andretti, who obviously races in Trans Am at the moment. He says he's got a pretty wheel. <laughs> and that you can see That's a nice phrase. It is, because what he, and he explained it to me. He said it's an expression that not that many outside of the racing world know, but it basically means that when you're not fighting it, when you're not muscling the car around, you know, you are, you know, you're controlling the car with deft touch, and that's what he calls a pretty wheel. Chad Raynall uh, prepared that car for Josh, and Chad's out, I think Chad Raynall's out there running. He's running quite, you know, he's running up there right now. I can't remember, I can't see exactly where he is, but, uh, but he's doing well. And the only reason I bring it up, coming out of five there, that last time you could see Josh riding the rail, he was able to go over the, mm -hmm. the crest on the exit of six and have really nice grip and handling on, as the track slopes off, but there's still good pavement there. That's a, you know, the car's really got to work well to be able to do that without upsetting the rear end of the car. And again, the, the drone has given us another perspective on turn 11. I always knew turn 11 was tight uh, from my motorcycle days because it always caught out people on the last or penultimate lap oh, yeah. as an overtake. But you see how tight it is from the drone. Same with Andretti. It goes on for a lot longer than perhaps you first think. And it's only when you actually physically go around, you go, oh, my God, it's still going. <laughs> yeah, this, this drone coverage is, is spectacular, I must say. Yeah, it's added a new dimension uh, to racing for sure, and we're really enjoying it. So, check and flag is out, and it is your car, or effectively the one that you're interested in, Josh Fiber, uh, who gets the win over Chad Renault and Peter Plute in third position in that number 63 as we look at the second place, number 64 coming across the line now. And that's a good run by Chad. San Jose just up the road in his 1969 C28. Well done though to Josh Feinberg. We heard him from him briefly at the start, but yep, give us the hang 10. But a great, uh, a great look at a little piece of American racing history there. And these guys are out a lot uh, at uh, lots of events around the USA. Uh, historic Trans Am is alive and kicking. Um, I, you know. They're often the same cars, but uh, there's quite a depth of cars out there now. It's great, yeah. They're, they're, they're cars from all over the country and a, and a lot of them, and so they do put on a good show at, at, at more than just uh, the Rolex uh, Monterey Motorsports Reunion. Well, you've been listening to Charles Nurberg, who is going to be out again in a Formula One car, I believe. Yes, sir. Looking yep. forward to that. Uh, tell us again what, you, what you're running. And, it's, uh, uh, it's a 1981 uh, Williams FW07C. It was a car that Alan Jones and, uh, and uh, Ricardo Patrese shared in the 81 season. Probably should have run the world championship, but they had a little bit of, uh, little bit of misfortune. Couldn't back up the 80 world championship, but then, you know. Because Alan won it in 80, and then Alan should have won it in 80 81. in the B. That's right. And, and they, they probably should have won in, uh, in 81, but, you know, woulda, shoulda, coulda, you know. Yeah. Very privileged to have met Alan Jones, and his son Christian actually raced in Asia for a while. I remember GT that. Races. Absolutely, absolutely. Jonathan, thanks so thanks much. Thanks again, for having Charles. Me. Go steady out there. That don't get get fooled by that new surface. Don't be setting track lap lap, lap records. <laughs> we'll, we'll let you go and uh, get your overalls on. Thanks again for coming up, yeah. and you're welcome all weekend. Please do come up. Yeah, my pleasure. Share, share some more stories. We love it's, it. It's great to see it from up here. Thanks a yeah, lot. Thank you. Thanks for all your great comments. You, you reminded me of things from my youth I'd long forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, th there's a whole dinner to be had on that. <laughs> <laughs> Cheerio. <laughs> Cheerio. Right, there you go. Trans Am's Historics from 1966 to 72, uh, an absolute trailblazing time for Trans Am. And as we look high above the Laguna Seca circuit, we'll take a short break. And when we come back, more action from the Monterey Reunion 2023. Now 
is the moment to plan your trip to Monterey County. Welcome back to California. The sun is out. The cars are on track. It doesn't get any better. Surf's up down the way, but we've got racing going on of a fantastic nature, both old and new. We've got some new ones in the car park and some old ones out on track, as it should be but they are just as fast as the modern cars, it seems, as we look down the famous corkscrew and down the famous front straight. Mission Foods, part of the WeatherTech Raceway as well this year. We're looking forward to Formula 5000. I've got a very special guest, but let's head down to Kev Harris again. He's been beetling about, as we like to say in England. What have you got, Kev? Lovely, thanks, Johnny. We're down here in the paddock as always, and it is very noisy, but if you want to talk about history and if you want to talk about where this all began, it is right here. And Rob Manson from the California Specials, we've just been having a great chat about all of this, Rob. 1950, the Pebble Beach Road Races, that's how all this started. It did indeed. It's a pleasure to talk and it's a pleasure to show you the California Specials. These are cars built uh, from 19... 47 to 1955. They are specials in the sense that they are unique. They each were built by somebody who wanted to go sports car road racing. He didn't have any money, could not afford what at the time was a sports car, a Jaguar XK120, which is right behind us, or an MGTD or TC. So they built their own, and they built their own from the same scrapyards where surplus war equipment and pre-war Ford parts were readily available to hot rodders who were also building cars during that same period. And they used the speed equipment that the hot rodders were developing for their purposes. The cars were built all over the state, and they were built by individuals who had something to do with World War II, but when they came back, they were working, they had nine to five jobs, and they had time to do sporting activities. They looked around and saw that there was a new sport that no one had really seen before in California, and that was European style road racing. They said, well, gee, you know, uh, I could build a car that will go as well and will beat a Jaguar XK120 or an MGTD for a 1500cc or less motor. I can do that and I can afford to do that. And so they did. And what you'll see here, we're going to take a little trip and uh, I'm going to talk about a few of those specials. Yeah, we're we'll talking about because behind us, like you say, you got the Jaguar there. That was for the wealthy guy. We hadn't seen those cars. You know, they were built in Europe to come over here to the US to sell them over here. But not everyone could afford that. So then they're making their own to compete alongside that. That's exactly the case. Let's go and have a look. Let's have a little stroll. Five, four, three. All right, this one, three. this one is the prototype so if you look at this car what you see in the baldwin Payne special which was built in 1946 is an english sports car it had cycle fenders it had a long hood it had a short tail it was a two-seater it was an english sports car but what it is is a california hot rod 1932 ford chassis and running gear ford flathead motor this is the prototype. This is what the press in the day, in, in the late 40s, said, wow, that is a hot rod sports car. So that's what you're looking at, the Baldwin Payne Special. And then when we come to car number three over here, the cream color one, now this is interesting, Coventry, England, the Jaguar engine, the Jaguar car here, but a bit of history in this, because this one on the podium in the early days of the road races here at Pebble Beach. This is a Jaguar XK120 originally. It was one of the first alloy-bodied XK120s 
imported to California in 1949 in this case. It was very well looked after by its original owner, Don Parkinson, who was a racer and who was Phil Hill, our first American Grand Prix champion. Uh, it was his brother-in-law. So Phil Hill and Don Parkinson had alloy bodied XK120 Jaguars. This is one of them. The, Phil Hill's car, the black one that we saw behind us, uh, very similar to that. That isn't Phil's car, but it was black, and it won the first Pebble Beach road race. This car was second, so the two brothers-in-law. Listen, Rob, this is fantastic, all these stories, and, and chatting to a guy like yourself is great because you can tell us all of this stuff. But something that people won't have realized is that where we stood here at Laguna Seca, it was the Pebble Beach road races that were the precursor to the road racing here at the circuit itself. Absolutely. So these cars were... And this one uh, is is maybe the most one of the most famous of the of the first cars to race in the in the forest in Pebble Beach. When a couple of people decided that, gee, you know, we got all these we got all these guys around with MGTDs and new Jaguar XK120. Why don't why don't we get them all down to the Monterey Peninsula for a social event and we'll get a track that will lay out on the public roads in the forest in Pebble Beach around the lodge. Why don't we do that? Well, the Pebble Beach people thought that was a pretty good idea. So in 1950, that was organized and it was one of the very first European style road races in, on the West Coast. Uh, 1950 was the first year of those and this was one of the first ones. So what happened? Well, guys came down from San Francisco and Burlingame and and parts north and would brought their Jaguars and their MGs and those were the grids. They filled up the grids and they raced around the same weekend. The Pebble Beach people said, "Well, gee, you know, we're going to race on Sunday, so what are we going to do on Saturday?" And they said, "Well, why don't we have a car show?" So they had a car show they used new cars and that was the origin of that's the origin story the garage myth of the pebble beach concours that's when it started both the concours and the road races the same weekend so what we have is seven years of road racing in the pebble beach forest till 1956 and the creation of a sport. People, we had 30,000 people coming to those events. When the last event was held in the, in the forest, there was a demand, and as a result, there wasn't a whole lot of risk to build a permanent circuit. What we're standing at is the Laguna Seca Raceway that was first raced on in 1957 as a result of that history. Listen, Robert, it's fantastic talking to you, and that racetrack that was founded in 1957 is getting noisy once again. So, uh, Johnny Green, our race announcer, is waiting to start talking about the next cars out on track. I'm going to stick around and have a little bit of a chat to you a little bit longer, and maybe we'll catch up with you again tomorrow. But for now, Rob, thank you ever so much, you're, sir. You're more than You're welcome. a gent. Very, very interesting stuff. Johnny, what do you make of all that? Well, that pretty much puts it all in perspective, doesn't it? Uh, and also, it marries what we've been talking about all day today, as uh, Enzo Ferrari uh, famously called us Brits the garageistas. Well, the guys making the specials here in California, where I'm sure, looked on the same way. But it doesn't matter. If it gets you around and it gets you there, it's all that matters. And we turn our attention now to something I've been looking forward to, Formula 5000. I'm delighted to welcome to the booth Bob Mueller, uh, who is, uh, well, one of the doyens of historic racing here in America, if not around the world. But, Bud, great to have you on board. I've seen you at so many races, uh, but never had the chance to get, to get you in the booth before now. But um, you love this. Uh, you grew up loving this. I was reading about your, your love for the Ferraris as a kid, uh, and that was the first thing you sort of said, i got to get one of those, right? So tell us about your love affair with this sport. Sure, I've been a Ferrari fan forever, even when I was a kid. Uh, got to see the guys race at Silverstone when I was a teenager. Got totally hooked on Formula One there. So being a Ferrari guy and loving Formula One, the best combination is to get one of those 
Ferrari Formula One cars. So bought my first one of those back in 1996. What was it? That was a Ferrari 312 T5 X Gilles Villeneuve. Oh, beautiful. And a lovely car. Enzo called the T4, which looks very similar, called it ugly until it won the championship. Ha. And then he loved it. Yeah, not quite so, not so ugly after it wins. Formula 5000, though, another um, amazing championship worldwide. A lot of people kind of think of Formula 5000 as an American championship. But when you look at the conglomeration of different Formula 5000 cars collecting around the world, whether it be New Zealand, Australia, Asia, uh, and here in America, this championship stood out because it was just pure muscle car racing in terms of a similar single-seater format to Formula 1. Yeah, they put big... American V8s in the back of these things. They're noisy. They produce a ton of power. And the chassis is about uh, 1,250 pounds at the minimum. And so they're lightning quick. You see a variety of cars here with some with the high wing from the early era, uh, others that uh, almost have no aerodynamic uh, devices, it looks like. But they are awfully quick. Being open wheels, of course, it's a little uh, dangerous. But these guys have hopefully gotten to know each other pretty well and uh, respect one another. That's the big thing in these cars. If you don't know your competitors, if you don't think of them as a person, but just as a car, it can get ugly pretty quickly. Yeah, and I think what, what amazed me about this particular series and the era that it was, that it attracted some of the great drivers from around We were talking about Trans Am and how it did the same. But, you know, uh, guys that were either on the cusp of Formula One or at the height of their game in, in uh, sports car racing. And I think of people like, you know, Jody Sector, obviously Formula One, Brian Redman, uh, Patrick Tombe, again Formula One, Alan Jones. You know, these are guys that all took part in this championship. And, and yet it, it, that, show, that showed immediately the respect that these cars were given. Yes. And they are almost as quick as Formula One cars. They accelerate faster, but corner slower. So they're really a premier machine. Well, once again, Zach Brown out there again, the CEO of McLaren Formula One. And I think uh, there's nothing like walking the walk and talking the talk, is there really? Uh, there's, there's instant respect when you go and race the cars uh, that uh, you both own and are passionate about, as well as taking the one weekend off probably a year. But how many races, historic races, do you do a year? Because you're a busy man. I see yeah. your name on, on, the, on the timing sheets a lot. We do probably 10 to 12 a year. Um, used to be doing quite a few in Europe, but it just gets to be over almost every other weekend, and that's uh, quite a challenge for uh, family time and everything else. I'll bet, yeah, and you've got a, a big family. Um, I guess they have to be supportive of your race. They had no choice. But I, I guess I was reading about you kind of, like you just mentioned, Silverstone, you grew up in an era that I grew up in, effectively, which is around the, the, the late 60s, early 70s, and, 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 and close to places like Silverstone, where... Like I said, we kind of take it for granted. And you know what I mean when I say that, is that Old Park was half an hour of the road, or Silverstone, or, or, or Brands Hatch. It wasn't hard to do that. Uh, whereas, you know, here it's a lot bigger and a lot harder to do that. <laughs> exactly, yeah, Silverstone was just the local racetrack yeah. in many ways. And yeah. you didn't know who was gonna show up to test. <laughs> exactly, everything from the F1 guys to clubs, club racers. So what have we got out here today in this Formula 5000 Reunion 9 group? We've got lots of Lolas, lots of McLaren Chevrons. Uh, we've even got an Eagle out there. Uh, anything you want to spot out and uh, well, certainly make a note I, of? Certainly I know Zach pretty well, and he's uh, triple teaming things this weekend <laughs> between Formula 5000, his Can-Am car, and then in our Formula 1 group as well. Uh, Bruce Leeson is another guy that I know. He's driving an older one of these, 1969 McLaren M10B. Uh -huh. uh, but he's running in sixth at the moment, so he's keeping up with the uh, earlier car, or the later cars. Right? Well, I mentioned what an international flavor for, for Formula 5000 managed to occur over the years, and we've actually got an Australian out there who took the pole. I uh, had his uh, wife up here earlier in the day, and that is Paul Zazrin uh, of King Creek, Australia, in a Lola T332. And out front he is. And Chalmers going about his business, coming up the hill. What's the hardest part? I mean, everybody talks about the corkscrew, but I bet there's other nuances that uh, you have to get right in terms of putting in a quick time here. Yeah, I don't, I, the corkscrew itself is very slow. Uh, you have to get your line right. It's uh, pretty simple to be up there and just point it. Uh, there's a 
particular tree you point at, and if so, you'll be straight down the hill. Uh, yeah, there'd be hell to pay if they move that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or have a fire or something. Uh, but to me, corner six is always a good challenge. Yeah. It, uh, it's downhill and then shoots uphill, a lot of compression. So you got to get that one right to get the run up the back straight. Yeah, I got to say, because it's also a key corner in terms of drive. If you don't get that right and you lose drive there, that can change that changes the whole flow of the lap, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Five and six together are both uh, challenging corners. Bruce Leeson in a 1969 McLaren and 10 B. Beautiful car. Yeah, that is beautiful. Bruce drives an uh, Audi uh, sports car as well in vintage events. So interesting to see him go back and forth between a closed cockpit and an open cockpit. I respect the guys that can drive both types of cars. Yes, no question about it. I always say to drivers like that, yourself included, it must be hard when you step into a different mark and a different car with different brakes and different, and you're on the same track. It's got to be a bit of a mind meld to get it right. It really is. In fact, uh, I've, I've done a lot with the Ferrari F1 Clienti program. My son-in-law has an XX car, and I would go back and forth between those two, and it would be totally screwy for me because the braking points are different, the acceleration is different, and if you think you're in one and you're actually in the other, it could be awful. Yeah, no question. So we're looking high above this Laguna circuit as the roar of Formula 5000 is back at Laguna Seca. It's great to have both Can-Am and Formula 5000 here this year. And as well as we'll have a, a, a race for Formula 1, which Bud is going to be in. What are you racing today? I've got an FW08 Williams that was uh, Kiki Rosberg's championship car. Oh, wow. What a... So, what well, a wonderful thing to, to race. Yeah. yeah, we've got some great cars out here. Zach's is Alan Jones's championship yep. car. So, yeah, great uh, great history in all of these. We've got a Mario Andretti car. I mean, you named the F1 driver from that era. Somebody's probably represented. You know, it's funny. I, I do current Formula One on the radio on Sirius XM, and, it, and, and I'm often reminding young American fans, hey, guys, Williams were the, the, the bee's knees at one point. Uh, and likewise, McLaren, you know, it, it, how the mighty fall in some ways. Uh, obviously, Zach's now turning around the ship big time, as are the Doriton capital people at Williams. But, you know, you forget everybody has their era, you know, and <laughs> I think about Adrian Newey and Ford's conglomerate. I mean, it's full circle there. I remember when the, the, the Jaguar team kind of handed over the reins and says, we give up. And Ford moved out of Formula One. Jackie Stewart took it on at first, then it was Jaguar. Um, but it comes around, goes around in Formula One, doesn't it? Yeah, it's great to see the teams survive. You know, there's yes. some now that have had three or four or five different names. But uh, great to see them still out there. And fortunes come and go. Uh, you can ask Mercedes. You can ask Ferrari. They've been at the top, been down below, and coming back. Do you enjoy modern Formula One? I do. I, I follow it. I, uh, I'm not a fan of the noise. Yeah. Uh, I drove a Ferrari uh, F2003 GA with a V10, 930 horsepower. That makes great noise. I think what interests me about what you do and your love for it is we as commentators will take somebody like Nicky Lauda and talk about his amazing championships or James Hunt or whoever it might be. Uh, and I was with Mario Andretti a couple of weeks ago um, in Nashville to, to, to drop a name. but. It's only when you get behind the wheel of the very same car that they drove that your respect either goes up or down. And I'm sure, in your case, it's probably gone up with those Ferrari. Yeah, right? absolutely. I mean, these cars, particularly those, I still call them modern cars because yeah. they have all the uh, driver's gadgets and things. In fact, they're a little more driver-friendly than today's cars. Uh, but yeah, the raw speed that those cars will carry and the braking power, it's just unbelievable. So it's quite an honor to be in them. and really difficult to drive them quickly. Yeah, I'll bet. What about maintaining them? Um, I've, been, I've been learning as the weekend's gone on just how hard and how, in some ways, easy it is to maintain historic cars if you know the right people. Yes, my crew chief was uh, on Murray Andretti's uh, championship team at Lotus. In there you go. <laughs> so he knows these cars inside and out. The more modern ones, uh, like the Ferrari 03 that I drove, have to be maintained by the factory. They just, uh, too many things with not wanting to give away the computers and all the materials and so you just have to use them which is fine they use that as an a as an apprentice program to train up the young guys who want to move up to the traveling formula one team so everyone wins that was the number seven anthony roberts from napier in new zealand in another mclaren so mclaren having a bumper year of course given their 60th year 
anniversary, and I'm sure Bruce would be pretty proud of the history that he created. Sadly, not to see it through. Uh, died way too early to Bruce, but um, certainly has made his mark on the sport of motorsport and continues to do so. I love these high-wing old yeah. 60s cars. They just, you know, they banned the high wings in Formula One. They probably banned them here in 5000 as well. Just a little bit... Uh, too tricky when some of those posts would fail and the cars would just tip over. Yes, what would Verstappen do with that in DRS? <laughs> <laughs> well, you may remember back in 69, I think the uh, Lotus came out with that high wing and it was actually movable. Oh, it was right. the yes, hand, right, yeah. hand version of DRS and uh, I think once or twice it got stuck and the regulators said, nope, no more of that. I think that's one of the things that you first get attracted to Formula One for the noise and the, and the colorfulness and the, the glamour of it all. But like you say, once you get into the nitty gritty of the competition and how people like Nui and many other innovators, how they looked, how that gurney flap, you know, and, and these innovations that came along and made the difference to make you half a second, two tenths, whatever it might be, that's when you really start to appreciate it. Absolutely, and, and uh, in my case, with ground effects cars. Yeah. You know, and Lotus did that with Andretti, and he ran away with the championship. The Ferrari followed in 79. They won the championship. And then, unfortunately, in 80, they were focused on their turbo car for 81, and they fell down to mid-pack. So uh, these innovations, if you can jump on them at the right time, you can do pretty well. Yep, no question about it. And um, we're watching the history of... Literally, American motor racing here. Kurt Bennett at the moment leading the way from Miami in that Lola from 1960, uh, sorry, 76. And Bill Hemming in a Elfin. Coming through. Bill Hemming in the number 11. Another Australian here in that Elfin. MR8. So this is what's interesting to me. You've got people from... Uh, different countries racing here they probably haven't raced with each other much yes if at all good point point. and uh so you know racing open wheels as i said at the beginning with people you don't know is a bit of a challenge yeah no question about it you guys here in the states uh week in week out as you say 12 events so you and over the years and you've done it many years uh, you know you know each other you know who's going to be fast who's going to be steady who might be a little bit more aggressive than another and their style of racing and how they go about racing but as you say i was talking to um uh, the australian that got pole position his wife came up here uh, in paul zazen uh, zazen and he was saying you know eight weeks on the on the ship to to get it here They've raced at Indianapolis, a few parts went wrong, but the, you know, the community did is, found themselves in the right city to get a part for a 5,000. <laughs> and um, yeah, so it, it's, it's, there is Paul. Uh, but yeah, I think that I think is an exciting thing for them and they're really enjoying the experience of being here and racing here in America. We have maybe 80% stability in our F1 group, so it, it keeps it a close camaraderie. But every once in a while there's somebody new and you've got to kind of let them know who's who and. Uh, get them introduced to the group so that again everybody's thinking of them as a person and vice versa. I have Patrick Long up here earlier and he was like yeah I really want to I fancy doing that I've only retired a couple of years ago I fancy doing the uh, Le Mans and I, I'm sure a whole a lot of eyes roll going oh not another one of these pros coming back at us <laughs> but you know but it's joyful to see these guys what they can do he said that, that, that a lot of people get joy out of seeing the car that they own driven perhaps a little bit more on the limit than, than they're used to. Exactly. And Patrick drove with us at Long Beach this year. and Yeah, he said he enjoyed that. was right up front. And in our F1 race today, we've got Dario Franchitti. So yeah. it's always fun to race with one of the pros and see how you do. Yesterday, or sorry, the day before, in uh, the first practice, uh, I was second and Franchitti was third. So I was very proud of that. Keep that score sheet. I'm definitely going to frame that one. <laughs> Dario is a great character and, of course, still very, very much involved in IndyCar and uh, is a great character. He's, uh, sadly, his uh, career came t to an end very too soon uh, in many ways, but he had that uh, big accident in Houston. But, um, yeah, Dario is still very much a big character in, in any paddock, to be honest, and doing a great job continuing his role in IndyCar. He's a great uh, driver coach and yeah. team coach. does very well. I was on the grid in Nashville and got to chat with him a little there as well. Len Richards from Auckland in New Zealand, another Lola T400. I, I do the Toyota Racing Series, another modern single-seater series 
in New Zealand. And of course, that harps back to the Tasman series. And I was amazed at the amount of Formula 5000 and Trans Am. They have their own historic Trans Am series in New Zealand. I mean, I would never have imagined that. But You know, it's so far away. It's like, how do they even get the cars there? But I guess once they're there, they stay, and they've got quite a few. Well, one secret is, and I hadn't even thought about this, but there is a military base off the south of the South Island, uh, just on the way to the Antarctic, which was an American army base, effectively. So they would bring their cars out when they moved out there with their family and said, oh, I'm not going to ship back my, my Shelby or my, my Corvette. I'm going to leave it here. So they kind of stayed. And the same was true of the Tasman series. They shipped them over and the, the, the Kiwis and the Aussies would go, how much do you want for that? You know, you don't want to, you don't, you don't want expensive sending it all back. It's an old car now. I'll, I'll look after it for you. Yeah, it was the same for us. I did uh, high school in England and we had a 67 Mustang that was from the States, so the steering wheel was on the wrong side right. for you Brits. <laughs> and uh, that was the car I learned to drive. We left it there, another family enjoyed it. I, I think it's probably turned over a few times since I was a kid. Oh, nice pass on the inside. Nicely there. done, yeah. Getting past the high winged McLaren, beautifully done at the corkscrew. Classic overtaking at the corkscrew. I'm enjoying Formula 5000 with the words of Bud Moller, who will be out in action. Formula One in a beautiful Williams driven by Keke Rosberg. One of the few families that have had two world champions. Yes, how amazing is that? Graham Hill, Damon Hill, not too many others. Yep, exactly. Looks like we have our checker. Yep, and it is Kurt Bennett who's done a really good job. In fact, uh, he got into the lead early on and he's taken uh, that Lola 332 to victory here ahead of Paul Sazrin, who is the Australian who took the pole, of course. And then it's Glenn Richards who took third place and Tony Galbraith in fourth. And yeah, 122.9, that's pretty handy around here. What kind of laps are you putting in yesterday? That's, you know? uh, that's almost F1 territory. Yeah, it is, yeah. isn't it? I think Charlie Nierberg, who spoke here last, yeah. was 119. So wow. those guys are awfully close to us. What a great character, too. He's a good guy, yeah. I've raced with Charlie for a long time. Did you talk a bit about his Bonneville Salt Flats experience? Did, you know, honestly, I didn't, I, you know, I'd, I'd not forgotten, but yeah, I, I'd like to because that is his storied thing, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, over 400 miles an hour. That's pretty crazy. Well, I applaud these guys for having a clean race, no yellow flags to uh, stop the race or slow it down. So good job by everybody out there. Well, Bud, if you don't know, because you can't see him, is in his overalls. He's ready to go. Thank you for coming in. Uh, best of luck. Stay steady out there. New track service. I want a new lap record. No. Yeah, Just nice take try. it steady. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Johnny. We'll take Enjoyed a short it. break from Laguna Seca. We'll be back with more from the reunion after this.
Lovely, thanks, Johnny. How about this? Front row of the grid, a man who was with you uh, up in the booth a little bit earlier on, Ron Fellows, Grand Marshal of the whole event. That's an accolade you haven't had before, is it, Ron? I, I have not. No, <laughs> thank you. But it's, it's an absolute honor. And um, yeah, to be here and, and represent the Corvette brand in its 70th anniversary, uh, and and to be at this uh, the Rolex uh, reunion, it's it's awesome here, and, yeah. and 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 I get to drive. I'm reunited with my Corvette racing crew chief Dan Binks. Walter Owens uh, owns the car. This is the first time it's run, so we'll try to do Mr. Greg Pickett, who I've actually raced against. <laughs> He's a little older than me, but uh, yeah, no, this is a this is an awesome car. We'll we'll go have some fun. Yeah, you sure? Well, we're looking forward to seeing you take it for a spin. But what is it like when you get back in a car that you remember winning in, when you've been driving in 20, 30 years ago, whatever it is? What's it like getting back behind the wheel? I mean, it's, it's absolute. It, it, it's just pure fun at this point. And um, but there, there are times when I used to go, how fast? <laughs> but no, it's it's uh, it's awesome to get to drive some of these historic pieces. Last year, I got to drive Dave Roberts. Um, it was a car that was driven by Jim Swanson. It was a 56 Corvette. And um, yeah, it was also the same time I was trying the new Z06 for the first time. So I was going from ceramic brakes to drum brakes back and forth last year. So uh, yeah, no, this is uh, it, this is an awesome event. And it, I say an absolute honor to be, to be here and, and representing the Corvette brand. And 70 years of the Corvette, as you mentioned just before, that's what we're celebrating. And in 2024, they're launching a new one, the E-Ray. I know you haven't driven it yet, but just give us your thoughts on that. I'm sure you've seen it under the awning over there. Yeah, no, I can't. I can't wait to try it. Yeah, I'm really, really keen to see, you know, how that how that performs in an all-wheel drive when you've got uh, 165 yeah. horsepower of electric uh, power at the front and the uh, and the six-two in the back. So um, I I hear it's awesome, and I can't wait. It, it's the it's the Z06 platform basically, so uh, it should be an awesome car. It's a beautiful looking car. They've done a fantastic job on the design, haven't they? We were chatting to uh, Phil and Todd from um, uh, GM earlier, and uh, what a great design they've done on that thing. It's a, it's a daily driver as well as it is a sports car. It absolutely is. I, I've uh, had the opportunity to drive the, you know, both the Stingray and, and, the, and the Z06, and um, they're, they're, they are absolutely okay for grocery getting, but get the, get the Z06 on the track and it is absolutely awesome. They've done a magnificent job with the first mid-engine uh, sports car for Corvette and, and this is just the beginning, it's, it's awesome. Right, so come on, I think they're gonna put the board up and send you out in a moment or two. What's the game plan for this session, this race? Because some of these guys are racing, Ron. <clears throat> well, Again, we're uh, I, you know we're just we're just kind of slot in. Uh, we're starting starting first, so we'll see what we'll see what happens. It's it's uh, as I said, it's uh, it's it's a fun drive, and it's somebody else's car. So, yeah. okay. <laughs> all right, listen, we'll step back and we'll let you get your helmet on because I think probably we're going to be getting set to go. The man's about to hold up a, yeah, I think he's holding up a five-minute board. He's kind of getting set and ready to go. So we'll let Ron do his thing. We'll take a little look as we have a little wander down here. Car number three. Another Chevy Camaro, how about this one here? And then we roll down. Look at this, I mean, where were you between 1981 and 1991? Because if you were at home watching sports car racing on the television, then there's every chance that you might have been watching one of these and you'll know the stories and you'll know what they're all about. Then we look at this, number five, Pontiac Firebird. How about that one there? Absolutely super. Um, just continuing down. We're going to step back in a moment because when these start up, it absolutely shakes your bones. I'll tell you, it just goes right through you. And then just moving on there, look, one of the Ford Mustangs from the day. Car number 66, Motocraft Quality Parts. Were you watching that one? One man who I'm sure would have had an eye on all of this when they were going wheel to wheel in anger is our race announcer, Johnny Green, who I think is standing by and getting ready to go. So Johnny, we'll hand back to you. Great hearing from Ron Fellows once again, though. Thanks, yeah, appreciate it. And yeah, no question about it. Ron Fellows was here in the booth earlier. Always interesting to hear what he has to say about some of the glory days of Corvette. And of course, we're celebrating 70 years of Corvette 
this weekend and a very special celebration it is and talking to special i'm delighted to welcome mike joy into the booth and a man who knows his racing that's for sure inside and out he loved it so much he made a job of it and has done so brilliantly for many a year but we were just asking or i was just asking you where you first got your kind of taste for it lime rock right uh bridgehampton in high school we went there for a usrrc event got there about four in the morning dense fog couldn't find the racetrack wasn't well signed then <laughs> uh, or ever and finally we see an ambulance going by with its lights on and we go wow some idiot must have gone out on the track tonight and crashed let's follow the ambulance he'll take us to a track no he took us to an all-night coffee shop ah <laughs> that's where he was headed and he had his flashing lights on because of the fog didn't want to get hit but he did direct us to the track we pulled there was nobody there we pulled in we drove around we pulled up against a fence and it turned out we were right at the exit of turn one coming over the hill and down down the hill. And it was a great place to watch Jerry Grant win that USRRC race. So after that, it was the hillsides of Lime Rock and then uh, the, the rock-filled paddock, paddock at Briar, Watkins Glen. Just couldn't get enough of it. And what was it about motorsport particularly? Well, I think the idea that when uh, you're looking at Kenny Ousman's car here, yep. when Kenny climbs aboard that car, he, like everybody else, um, has about 600 horsepower. That drivers, large and small, narrow and wide, tall and not so tall, uh, are all equal once they strap in behind True. the wheel because it's it's the capability of the machine, and then it becomes the talent of the machinist. So always loved sports cars. Uh, my dad had one back in the day, and it was just yeah, this is this is where I want to be. This is what I want to do. And if we think about Trans Am, uh, we've had the historics out already uh, from 66 to 72, but Laguna Seca almost synonymous with that period uh, and on, I suppose. But it's always been a special place for Trans Am and continues to this day to be so. Well, I think the American race fan, uh, whether he's a Formula One fan or a Tin Top fan or whatever, really gravitates to these cars because these are the cars that they owned or that their friends owned, that they saw on the street. Maybe the fenders weren't bulged out as much, and maybe they weren't painted panther pink like uh, <laughs> Walt Brown's car. But when I drove my Z28 Camaro on the street in the early 70s, this was what I aspired Fired. to be doing. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, now we get a chance to live the, live the dream and go break expensive parts and drive around as fast as we can and wish we were younger. And so who were your heroes growing up then? Uh, Mark Donahue was sure. was a hero, but all time, absolutely, no question, Dan Gurney. Yeah. Dan did it all. and You're about the third person to tell me that was, today. Well, <laughs> and he was very gracious about it. He was very gracious with his time, and uh, he, he and I ended up becoming quite good friends because I told, I told the story of him being my racing hero, and he was watching a TV program, and he grabbed a note card, like uh, Evie always had handy for him, and jotted me a quick note that says, I better get this off to you before you change your mind. <laughs> well, no. I mean, he'd been my hero for, for years and years and years. That's and uh, always will be. That's great. I love stories like that. And that's what this weekend is all about, is telling a few stories and looking back at the history, looking at the cars that you may or may not know everything or anything about. But that's just part of it. Sure. Now, look at look at Tim Moser's car here. He has brought a knife to a gunfight. <laughs> uh, this is a Nissan, Nissan yeah. a 300ZX, a second-generation car uh, with a 3-liter V6. Uh, it's not noted here if that's turbocharged or not. But uh, he gets to keep up with all of these 6-liter uh, V8s. Uh, so that's kind of a kind of a tall order for him. But there are other V6 cars in the field. Irv Hare was great. Uh, with the V6s back in the day, part of a, a brother act running these cars. Uh, that old, is an old Cutlass. Gordon Johnson is the driver today. Um, it's kind of cool that in vintage racing, they don't let the current drivers put their names on the cars. Yeah, they I think that's has, a really good idea. Yeah, you know, it should be. It should be. We're honoring what Irv Hare did in that car. You yeah. know, like in my Trans Am car, we are honoring. What uh, Tony DiLorenzo and you know and his partner did with that two-car team, uh, Jerry Thompson drove my car in the 1970 Trans Am. So that's whose name should be on the car. Yeah, I agree. I couldn't agree more. And and you know, um, like you Dallas Back Jones, you know, it, 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 I I couldn't agree more because you're right. It's it's a celebration of a, a period of 
time rather than, you know, I, I, I don't think it makes any difference. And a lot of these guys don't even want to be known. <laughs> you know, in terms of they're not right. looking for notoriety as a racing driver. They're doing it because they love it, just as you do it because you love it. Um, and so you wouldn't care no. if, if your name was on the car. You're, you're here to enjoy your passion. And I think that's another important factor. Finally, the sun's out here in Monterey. I, I kept oh, telling everybody hot. there was sun. Oh, it is hot out it there. It was now. hot getting into the cars. Uh, when we went out for uh, for race group eight, so this is a logical extension. This group of what we race in the 1966 to 72 Trans Am cars, which were required to be production car based. Uh, it's a base unit body with a front subframe on all of the the early cars, and then a steel roll cage is welded to that, and everything is reinforced as best they can. Well, set by seven years later, by the time these cars mm -hmm. were first born. That whole idea was passe. The manufacturers were not so much involved. And, you know, let's build some reliable tube frame cars, hang some fiberglass bodies on them uh, to give them some manufacturer identity. But these are pure built, ground up race cars. Yeah, and that, if you like, that DNA follows through to today's cars. I mean, yeah. you know, I often get asked about, you know, the difference between a NASCAR and a, and a Trans Am, because they look, at first, you know, first of observation, besides perhaps the rear wing, very similar. Uh, in, in approach to, to how you go racing with the tube flame and, and so on. So this is where that began. Yeah, the, and the biggest difference between these cars and NASCAR is here, the tubes are thinner, the cars are lighter, uh, the wheels, the centers are magnesium, the rims might be spun aluminum, whereas in NASCAR everything was steel. And because everybody weighed, what, 3,800 pounds, it, you know, you weren't looking for every weight-saving trick like the road race fellas did. But yeah, these cars raced in Trans Am when it was resurrected and in IMSA. And so there's, you know, a good representation of uh, the breed here from 1981 to the late 80s. So again, uh, I'll talk to you about the track surface. You've just been out there. Uh, we're doing two laps just to get everybody acclimatized to uh, what is a very relatively new surface here. A lot of upgrades being done here at Laguna. But most people saying they're really enjoying it. You, what are your thoughts? It is very smooth. It has tremendous grip. Yeah. Uh, normally, by now in this weekend, we'd be mounting up our th second or third set of fronts, second set of rears, and that's not been necessary. Uh, we're getting very, very good tire wear with the smoothness of the circuit. It has taken some of the character uh, from the track. There was a dip or a bowl in turn five, uh -huh. similar to six. That's gone. Turn five is now very, very smooth. So the advantage is you don't have to be quite as precise with your line as you used to be on the old surface. And at the outer edge, where you see these cars right now going through four, at the exit of turn four, it's very, very flat and smooth out there. The track doesn't kind of fall off before uh, the pavement ends. So it's, it's an easier track to drive. Mm -hmm. um, it's faster. And uh, it, it'll develop its own character over time. But so far, I've not heard anybody who is not in favor of uh, the new surface and everything they've done here. Of course, IndyCar come here in the next couple of weeks and they're expecting lap times to uh, become records very quickly. Uh, and I think they're all uh, mouth-wateringly looking forward to coming here. Oh, they'll love it. Yep, they, they should love it. Especially after after everybody, after being on the streets of Nashville. Yes. Uh, I'm sure all the drivers will go to their dentist, get all of their fillings you know, reset. And uh, then we'll come out here and this will be like a boulevard. You'll appreciate this. Uh, Mario Andretti, Andretti was in town uh, to get a bourbon from Scott Borchetta. And Scott, because uh, he's not driving at the moment, uh, came and joined me in the comms. But I got a chance to, to talk to both of them together. And, and Scott told the story of the first Nashville event. And all oh, the guys went out and Trans Am for the first time on the Nashville. Set. Everybody complaining. And Mario goes, hey, quit complaining. It's the same for everybody. You get, get on with it. You get to race. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. It sometimes takes somebody like Mario just to remind you, you know, stop, stop belly aching. You're doing a job that so many people would love to do. Exactly. <laughs> so we are doing that second pace car lap behind the Hyundai. And uh, we've got a great, like you say, a real smorgasbord of different cars out there. Some, like you say, bringing a, gun, a knife to a gunfight. But um, still, that's what it's all about. Camaro's out there. Uh, what's a Mercury Mercur? Well, a Mercur is what you would have called in Europe a Ford Sierra. Oh, yeah. Yep. And so they brought it here to the States, and Ford says, well, we need a racing program with this. So they stuffed a little turbo four in it and raced it in IMSA 
and they called it uh, Mercur, as if that was a German pronunciation <laughs> of Mercury. Yeah, so he said, I like that. Rouge Mustang out there, a Buick Somerset. So a Somerset, the Somerset is a stupid name. It was a place outside Detroit, in the Troy, in the Troy Michigan area. Uh, the car eventually would become the Regal. Okay. And so it was Buick's upscale, small, compact in the 1980s. And uh, that's when Buick was taking V6s to the NASCAR Bush Series, to Indy and everywhere. So they stuffed uh, and turbocharged the V6 and put it in there. Here we go then, as you can see, the pace car coming off. And this is our Group 4 for the first time of asking. We'll see them again in action tomorrow. But onto the main straight they come and start to rev those engines to full capacity. 81 to 91, GTO Trans Am. Green flag waves. Delighted to be joined by Mike Joy for this one, who does get a lot of joy from watching these cars and taking part already. Uh, earlier, have you got any other cars you're going in or just that one this weekend? No, just uh, my Trans Am car and my son's, which, uh, as Kenny Went Schrader bang. likes to say, one of those important pieces of the engine broke. So he'll be in my car tomorrow. Ah. Well, fair enough. Does he enjoy it as much as you? Loves it. Ha having a ball. Doesn't like uh, these non these sessions not finishing, but uh, enough of that. I guess Ron Fellows has no trouble finding his way around this course. Off I he goes. I was going to say, he knows it well. Ron Fellows, of course, up here in the booth earlier, and is our Grand Marshal this year. Uh, great to have him on board as we celebrate uh, Chevrolet's Corvette. 70 years, and they're coming off another last 10 years of quite brilliance at, uh, around the world, particularly Le Mans. So that, uh, that Mustang, that was restored by Three Door Garage in uh, Boyertown, Pennsylvania. Ross Myers owns the best collection of Ford racing cars in America. Trans Am cars, uh, 24 hours of Daytona cars, a couple of NASCAR stockers. I mean, it's a vast collection, and they're all restored to a high level because they're all track capable. Uh, Chris Liebenberg, yep. who got into this business uh, restoring Shelby's, and then went to work full-time for Ross, running Three Dog Garage, uh, is not just the maintainer, chief maintainer, but also uh, also driving. And so there he sits in third behind Ron Fellows and Chris Hines. Yeah, and that 91, number 66, as you say, yeah. coming under the bridge again. Uh, another unique part of the track now. They've got the new bridge here, taking away the old tower that was across from yeah. our commentary position. Hey, Kenny Epspin down the inside, and that Doyle Firebird, that's a... 53 is a former Huffaker engineering car uh, from out of Petaluma, North Carolina. The Huffakers, uh, they made their bones racing MGs and Triumphs and then moved up and were the factory Pontiac team for several years with uh, Elliot Forbes Robinson and Bob Lobenberg and then sold off cars and one of those is here with uh, Epsman aboard. Mike, what is the attraction particularly about this circuit? We just saw an example there, going into Andretti and then losing out on the, you know, it's all very well making a move up the inside, but you've got to really make a, a definitive move to be able to get the out, uh, sort of to get around the outside into turn three, haven't you? There are corners here that you don't see anywhere else, and here's one. Here's cork, one of them. You know, the corkscrew, the demon drop, yep. uh, where you come down 8, 8A, and then Rainy here, yep. turn nine is the longest turn on the course. Into 10, there's still a little bowl at 10. You get a good dish right there, so get some good launch out of 10. And is then that turn still cambered now yes. with the new service? Yep. Okay. And then turn 11 is billiard table flat. That's interesting, because it wasn't, was it? Yeah, it's hard to say. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on which line you were yeah, on. Well, exactly, but it looked as though it drops off. or it, Now it's flatter than it was, but uh, you could still use that runoff. <laughs> here comes Liebenberg. Makes the pass for second place. Yep, and on, it is uh, on Hildebrand. From on Hildebrand, yes. Yep. Another famous racing name, of course. So I'm not sure who's in the car today, whether it's John Hildebrand well, or whether it's JR, uh, better known to IndyCar fans as JR at Hildebrand, yeah. who did race Art Miller's car in, in uh, Trans Am in our Group 8. So could be either. They're could both, be either, they're yeah. They're both quite talented. <laughs> I know, we, we, we had a. Uh, uh, Alex McAllister and a, uh, uh, what's the other McAllister? Chris. Chris. And uh, we were trying to work out who was in the car. It didn't matter. Fellows Lindbergh, Hildebrand Jr., Epsman, Rincon, Hines, Jeffrey. I'm sure you probably know most of these guys out there, right? Well, a lot of them run in the 66 to 72 yeah. group. Uh, Liebenberg does, so does Epsman. Uh, Hines takes care of a couple of those cars. Jeffrey's in the group. And also, uh, let's see, Bill Ockerlin and Nick DeVitas run both, uh, both Trans Am groups. smoking up the hill. That's not a good sign. 
not that much anyway. So we'll see if that comes to naught, but uh, there was quite a bit of uh, what looked like oil smoke going up towards yeah. the uh, corpse crew there. But we'll find out. So Epsman and Hines kind of nose to tail there in those two Firebirds. And yeah, got two, well, we've got three distinct little battles going on, haven't we? Yep. And then it spreads out to the Walt Brown All Pink Pink Panther car. Right. And now, yeah, as you say, coming out of 10, down the main straight again. You can see it from the drone. I, I'm, I'm actually enjoying the modern use of the drone to give you some perspective on what's ahead. It, it gives great play-by-play. -play. Now, the first time at Fox we tried using drones for the first season, NASCAR would let us fly them anywhere except over the racing surface. And then other race sanctioning bodies started using drone camera footage for play-by-play -play and give you a video game view. And so now uh, it's much more accepted, much more accepted than it was. Yeah, no question. And uh, I, I take my hats off to the pilots that do this because it, it's a skill in its own sense because you, you really do know, have to know what you're doing and, and where you are, your, your ability to see where you are above Certainly. and follow. All right, here comes Rick Jeffrey in that number eight Camaro. Uh, he was just out there two sessions ago with historic Trans Am and trying to pull down on the number 10, uh, which is a Firebird. They're the same car except for the nose and tail decals, Camaro and Firebird, when it comes to this series. Nah, Rick is a gun. demolition contractor out of uh, the San Francisco Bay Area, has uh, I think three different cars entered here and gives them all a good drive. This is a good little battle. Yep. Through Rainey. Now into the right-hander. And somebody pulling off by the looks of things. That's Ken Epsman. Yes, it is. Headed it? for the uh, garage. Now, here's our first look at the 28, Walt Brown. Now, we had, we thought, well, at the beginning, it's Chris Hines that's in that number three, and Walt's in the... Yeah, Walt's in this one, mm -hmm. uh, which he, he greatly enjoys driving. Um, he has been a vintage car dealer and restorer, but... His main business is he builds health clubs and gyms uh, all across the country and very successful at it, but loves to get in these cars and uh, give them a good drive. That must be a, an interesting part from your point of view of being part of historics. You have your world of, you know, of, of following racing and commentating, but you are pe meeting people from all walks of life because there, you couldn't put a name on who, who does historics. And it's no. interesting when you really dig down as to who some of the kings of industries that we've got here, oh, but yeah. it's not what you think, is it? We have us that run huge corporations. We have people that demolish buildings. <laughs> um, you know, we have people who talk on TV, and uh, we have accountants, lawyers. <laughs> I mean, comedians. Runs, Adam Carolla has occasionally done a, a few Trans Am races. Who's that? Adam Carolla. Um, no, because Trans Am. The under 2.5 cars are a completely separate group, okay. so he's not run with us. Yeah, he uh, he did a run uh, in historic Trans Am, um, let's say two seasons ago, and unfortunately uh, hit a wet patch coming out of three and whoops, didn't didn't do it good. Yeah. Initially, when Trans Am began in 1966, it was all one class. Yeah. And the, in fact, an Alfa Romeo. Uh, I believe Jochen Rint won the first race yes, outright. Bob Tullius was first in the uh, five-liter class in a Dodge Dart. But two things happened eventually to change that, as we've got a pass here with the uh, Olivetti car coming up the inside, taking nice the line move. away from that Rob Dyson Firebird. Chris uh, Dyson currently, of course, still racing in Trans Am. Sure, and his dad was quite a oh yeah quite a gentleman gentleman shoe. Um, first thing was they had to get the 911s out of Trans Am. SCCA finally had to put their foot down and say, okay, the 911 is a sports car. It's not a sedan. And Porsche went, but we have four seats. Too bad, so sad. You're a sports car. Go race with them. So that happened. And then they took the under two liter class and split it off, gave them their own race. And, and that worked out very well for three or four years at least. And it's funny, growing up in England where touring cars would be the equivalent, right. um, it's always been tricky around the world, whether it be DTM, whether it be British touring cars, or even in Australia and New Zealand, 
you know, to get that balance right with what's acceptable, what's it not. Oh, you can't bring that, that thing in here, it's too powerful, or that's too yeah. modern, you know, and so on and so forth. So it's been a tricky thing for the guys that organize these championships over the years. Well, when I was growing up here in the States, I guess you Brits were calling this saloon car yeah. racing. Yes. Which means something very different. Yeah. And interestingly us. enough, we've got a Group 14 saloon car race, yeah. but that is full, of course, of British cars, which are what we call saloon cars, yeah. Right. Or, or, or European cars. A lot of alphas and a lot of minis and so on and so forth. But the same essence is the truth, which is they are what you would go to the grocery store in, or effectively uh, the car that you would recognize, uh, basically built out for racing. Obviously, this is the and next that's extension it. to choose. And, so on. and that's the great thing here, is all these cars with maybe the exception of that Mustang with the big, huge imps of blistered fenders mm -hmm. are all very recognizable as the road cars that they represent. And that's important to the people up on the hillside. Do you think they've done well with the Gen 3 car and NASCAR in trying to bring it back to a little bit more recognizable? Well, it's that started with Gen 6. Where the nose and tail, it, we got rid of the Gen 5, what Randy LaJoy aptly named the Twisted Sister car, <laughs> which was all aero. And then Gen 6 got us back to what real cars look like, and now Gen 7, yes, very much so. And with larger wheels and tires and things, so it's more like the high-performance cars on the street today. One thing I wanted to ask you, knowing you were coming up here, was our current Trans Am is now getting a host of youngsters, yes. teenagers who are signed up uh, with Toyota Racing Development or with, you know, have interest there. Justin Marks is racing, obviously runs Trackhouse. Uh, and, and because we're doing so many street courses and road courses, it's starting to get a lot of more interest from NASCAR in terms of the, the talent that, that is coming through Trans Am. So True. it's starting to become a feeder series in me. In a yeah, way. yeah, very much so. And, you know, these young kids, they found a place to race. And... Uh, I don't know. Do I do I want to suit up next to a 14-year-old in a car of that power? Yeah. I'm not ready to make that leap yet, but smarter people than me are running that series, and they've determined it's appropriate. Well, look well. at that great drive for that Mustang. What a, just a great glide down eight and eight a and and into nine. I mean, Steve Schiller. You could almost you could almost imagine taking your Fox Body Mustang, your street car ordering up a set of wide wheels and tires and a set of fenders like that, bolting them on. And even if you don't ever do that, uh, driving yours, you sure uh, imagine it. We saw the 77 there. That's a Chevy Beretta, uh, a not lamented street car. It was a little, you know, four cylinder front engine, front wheel drive, kind of better than economy level coupe. But Chevy said, all right, this is what we're going to race in Trans Am. So tell me about the Beretta. I do not know what I mean, obviously, I'm thinking, when I think of Chevrolet and Trans Am, we obviously think of the Camaro. Camaro, what yeah. If, what, what is the Beretta in, in the difference? The Beretta was kind of a junior-sized Camaro. Okay. Um, the Beretta was the two-door. The Corsica was the four-door. Um, they were not the economy-level cars. That was the Cavalier. But they were, you know, kind of a, a personal luxury small car kind of, kind of statement. Uh, they didn't last in the showroom too many years, <laughs> uh, but Tommy Kendall had, had great drives in these, and as did others. Still out front, Ron Fellows looking very good indeed in the number two as we take a look at the 77 coming through. Pick check once again, Nick DeVitas in the Beretta we just mentioned. Up the hill he goes. I think it's him that's puffing the smoke up the hill. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, he races a Mustang in, in historic Trans Am, and then in this GTO Trans Am group, he has that uh, Baja Boats Beretta. When you come to these events, are there other groups that you like to have a sniff at and have a smell at and see, what, see what's up going on? I love them all, from the ragtime racers to the Formula One cars. I, I love them all. I just think it's so great that these cars, instead of languishing in a dusty museum somewhere and maybe getting exercised once a month in the parking lot, that's not the place for race cars. You know, and I was saying this when the ragtime guys were out as Ron Fellows crosses the line again, looks as though he's getting the last lap sign. But yeah, if you had a 10-year-old son or daughter who was interested in this and you brought them to this event and you could say, there you go, this is where it all began in 1908 yep. or pretty much. And now look at 27, the open wheels, and you really can follow it through and go, there you go, and there's next year's Corvette. <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah, soup to nuts. It's some, really something for everybody. 
My favorite driver out of this whole weekend is Ed Archer. Ed is in his late 80s, and he runs with the Ragtime Racers, and he has a Model T Ford pickup or st steak body truck that he drives his race car up onto at the end of the day, and then he drives to, I think, Hayward. So he drives somewhere on the east side of the bay on the public highways, and that's it. That's his, uh, his tow vehicle. That's his ramp truck. That's his tow vehicle. That's great. Ron, Mike. Ron Fellows, what a talent. I know. I mean, just what an amazing talent. He's, of course, here for Chevrolet, drive some of those show cars, have some fun, and, and wheel this and give us a good good look and a good memory to what these these great cars were all about. And what a stunning history. He has a very humble gentleman. I hadn't met him until this morning, came in the booth, and, you know, uh, it, it, it was quite a pleasure to sit by him and listen to some of his stories about how he got started. And yeah, He yeah. said he was on the podium and the head of Chevrolet was given the prizes and said, hey, I need you in a Chevrolet. And he goes, okay. Let's go. <laughs> Let's yeah. go. <laughs> exactly. Checkered flag. There is the checkered flag. And Ron Fellows then takes the checkered flag as he's done so many times before in the number two this time, though, for our Group 4, 1981 to 91 GTO Trans Am. Lovely sight to see and a lovely sound to hear around the hills of Monterey. And also great to hear the dulcet tones of Mike Joy. Uh -huh. I'm sure you're enjoying your weekend. But we didn't mean to make you work, but hey, it's great to have you and get your insight into what these cars are all about. Well, glad to stop by. It's I, I hope the folks watching just appreciate the hours and hours of maintenance, repair, and updating that goes into keeping all of these cars uh, in shape to come out, come out here and run on the track. It's a, it's a labor of love, and uh, you know we enjoy getting out there and showing these cars and sharing our love of them with the fans. Well, I hope you enjoy the rest of the weekend. And between you and your son, Scott, you, you get something out there tomorrow because I we know shall. you had a mishap today. But, yep. uh, well, you'll enjoy the weekend. Obviously. You bet. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Yep. Appreciate it. So that concludes our coverage of Group 4. They'll be back in action again tomorrow. My thanks to Mike Joy once again, who will be out there in uh, well he may not be out there but one of the joys scott will be out there tomorrow he'll be he'll be doing the chief engineering bit uh, and, and cheering him on if nothing else mike joy one of the great voices of motor racing in america delightful to have him on board just for a moment to hear about our group four here at the reunion for 2023 so the cars come off track and we'll take a short break and we'll be back from the corkscrew and laguna seca as the sun shines down here beautiful California. Stay with us.
Well, welcome back to the 2023 Rolex Monterey Motorsport Reunion, where Group 11 are getting set to go. Historic Formula One cars. But if you're an IndyCar fan, you'll know the name Dario Franchitti. But he finds himself at the moment behind the wheel of a 1974 Brabham. Dario, thanks for taking time to talk to us. How excited are you right now about to go out in this one? Ah, really excited to drive this car. Hopefully, uh, it's, hopefully it goes okay. We had some fuel issues yesterday. We're running out of uh, a fuel surge, so. Yeah, hopefully it goes okay, but it's so much fun to be on this grid with these amazing cars. That car next to us, that M26 McLaren, I used to watch that drive around Ingleston when I was a little boy. So, yeah, I'm having, having a great time. That is the great thing about these events. Doesn't matter what age you are, you're going to see a car that you drooled over as a kid, aren't you? And when we look at the Formula One cars here lining up, some of the noisiest and some of the most exciting as well. Uh, what, what, you know, what an era of Formula One these cars have come from. Yeah, exactly right. All the, the Cosworth DFV powered cars and, you know, from, you know, this is 74 cars, a couple of 84 cars, the FW7, so iconic. I mean, James Hunt's M23 McLaren just over there. That's just brilliant. Yeah, we've got a Nicky Lauda 1976 car through the back there and, and modern names from Formula One as well, are here as well. Zach Brown, used to see him on the pit wall. He can't wait to get behind the wheel of these things at every opportunity, can he? No, and uh, Eddie Irvine's here too, on, on the sly, having a look. Oh, sneaky. <laughs> yeah. We didn't know that, you just left that out. So uh, so what's the game plan then this afternoon in this session? You're all racing drivers, but it's a show event, but I imagine you can have a little bit of a go. Yeah, I'll have a go. I've got to warm it up now. Thank you. I'll watch my ears. Let's stand back for a moment, because they are incredibly loud. Cars with engines, Formula One cars, I've got to step back, because they really will split your eardrums. Well, we just thought we'd let you enjoy the sights and sounds of Formula One rolling out here at Laguna Seca. And what a sight it is. I, there's no question. Uh, I was listening to some of the qualifying notes and sounds of yesterday and everybody absolutely thrilled to hear Formula One. And of course, we've had Can-Am and we've had Formula 5000 out here. And I'm delighted to be joined actually by one of the Formula 5000 drivers. His name, Alistair Chalmers. And how did you get on? Because you were out in Formula 5000, yeah? Yeah. Um, qualified yesterday in ninth place. Had a bit of problems on the last three laps with just being bolted with cars. So started a little bit further down the order than I wanted to, but got a good start, got going, got past a few guys and finished seventh. So that's my starting place for tomorrow. Now on my, on my leaderboard or on my little notes, it says Hastings, New Zealand, but you're clearly a Brit like myself. Well, about eight years ago, my, well, no, about 18 years ago, my elder son had emigrated to New Zealand 
and uh, after being out on a number of visits we thought you know why are we putting up with the UK we could live out here so we did and it was down to him that I ended up with a Formula 5000 car which are really popular in New Zealand. Very. I, I mean, you can talk to this. Absolutely. I, I, I've been telling everybody all day, you have no idea how popular 5,000 is. It is. And in Australia, they're Australia. now a modern championship. Yeah. Well, we have a, cha we have a series in, in New Zealand as well. And for this round, we brought four cars from New Zealand and five from Australia across to compete. Um, and I have to say that the uh, New Zealand one is pretty fiercely fought. Um, so it doesn't take prisoners, which is good. It makes you focus, and normalising the speed of them is the thing that's difficult. Um, just how fast the corners actually approach you. Yeah, and just to give some of the audience who may not be aware, I mean, you know, it, you can't be a fool and get in one of these Formula One or 5000 cars. You, you really have to have your wits about you, your fitness about you, and your understanding of the mechanics of one of these cars, because it can, it can bite. Quick. Oh, they can, yes. Um, there's an awful lot of weight at the back. Yes, they've got very big tyres and small ones at the front, but there's an awful lot in the aerodynamics of them. And the 5000s particularly that were prevalent from 68 through to about 81, 82, have got a lot less tech on them than the F Formula One cars that are out there. Um, they're getting into the, the area of um, sequential gearboxes and carbon brakes and things. Uh, whereas we deal with steel brakes and manual gearboxes, um, you know, you've got a double D clutch to change gear. So it keeps you on your toes. Yeah, no question about it. And I take my hat off to any of you um, because, you know, we've marveled at the guys that ran them originally. But I think you've almost got to doubly admire the guys that step into them and aren't 22 and looking to become a factory driver. You know, no. I mean, it was all out for... for, uh, for King and country, wasn't it? Absolutely. I mean, I've been involved with motorsport since I was 17. Right. But I've only had the Formula 5000 car for two and a half years. And, you know, I keep thinking which silly old fool at my age would go and buy something as stupid as this. But I tell you what, it's one hell of a blast. Oh, I bet. Yeah. Hard to maintain? Uh, once you get a grip on the car, it's okay. But the thing on it, you know, they've got more adjustment on rose joints than I've got socks. Yeah. So... Every time you adjust one thing, you have to check eight or nine others yeah. just to make sure that you've not lost the balance that you'd found before. So you think, oh, well, you know, we'll do a ride height adjustment. Suddenly that's corner scales, camber gauge, caster gauge, tracking gauges and everything else just to go through it. I'm very fortunate that my son Rick helps run the car uh, along with a friend in New Zealand called Mike. Um, so I've got a good few guys around me who help me run the car. You can't run a, a Formula 5000 car on your own. No. I can't even do up the seat belts in that cockpit. Right. I can't twist my arms far enough round to clip the buckle together. And you want to be part of that chassis, don't oh, you? Oh, trust me. You. <laughs> there's an old saying now that, you know, pull them tight. And when you think you've got them tight, pull, pull again. them tighter again. Yeah. 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 Well, we've got an interesting group of different cars out here and some really interesting drivers driving them and pedaling them. We've got... Quite a few Tyrrells, got a Lotus, a couple of Marches, uh, several McLarens, and uh, a couple of really important Williamses, the FO7B from 1980. Zach Brown at the wheel of that one. And uh, yeah, some, uh, some really interesting, it's kind of ironic, we just saw Zach Brown and McLaren, as is his won't, he is the CEO, but he's here out in his own Williams that he owns. And he's been trying to do the Formula 5000 races in the Lola. Yeah. Unfortunately, with no luck. <laughs> So we yes. are under, uh, under the safety car. We're doing the two laps, as has been uh, the way so far with this new surface. How have you found that here at Laguna? Well, normally we have two warm-up laps in New Zealand because, oh, okay. because the tyres take a bit to come up to temperature. Here it's a little bit easier, but you have to go through a tyre warming procedure fairly strictly, otherwise it'll spit you off on the first corner. Yeah. Um, here they go. Here we go, then. Formula One. Group 11, or Reunion Class 11, 66 to 85. The roar, the sound, the beautiful sound of what Formula One should sound like. And I don't think <laughs> many people would argue with me. Just a political point, just a start us off. <laughs> Adrian, if you're listening, let's change that sound. So the 43 of Steve Romack from California in that Tyrrell 12, making his way fast and furious through turns three and four. 
But it's a joy to hear that sound. And I mean, oh. no joking aside, it's the one thing that everybody says, boy, I miss that sound. Well, we have a sticker in Formula 5000s, which is ridding the world of fossil fuels. <laughs> one race at a time. Um, but yeah, they make a glorious noise. No question about it. Danny Baker out there, another man who's uh, got plenty of hours in Formula One historics and has driven for many a year around the circuits of the world. Look at that, over the corkscrew. Three wheels there, a little wheel up in the air for a moment there, taking the perfect line through the corkscrew. And I'm sure there'll be a few indie fans out here watching as Formula One goes about its work here. It's great to see these Formula One. Oh, that was a little close for comfort. Somebody getting a little bit... Uh, I think that was Dario Franchini with either getting out of the way or I think he might have been getting out of the way of Cal Mika there. Uh, Baker up to third place. Charles Nurberg, another man who's... Uh, well, he's been in the booth here for uh, a couple of sessions. He's coming back after this session. But it is Steve Romack that's leading the way and setting the track alight with a 121.8. That's pretty impressive. And a quick look in the mirrors. And that number 27. And really, in many ways, as we look down... At Zach in the F07, you know, these are when I started back in the early, uh, late, late 70s, early 80s. This is when my eye started getting uh, attracted to Formula One. And I do remember Alan Jones and Jody Schechter and many others at that time in Formula One and really getting excited. Going to Silverstone, I'm sure, like you did, you did yourself, and Brands Hatch. Yep. There's Danny Baker. He won't be afraid to use this new track at all. But I, I mean, it just, it got an excitement in you. I remember going to Brands Hatch and just, you know, as a kid of like three or four and hearing that thunderous sound, I was frightened to death, hiding behind my oh, dad's yeah. knees. Yeah, but yeah. I wanted to see more of it and I yeah. wanted to see it. Well, the, uh, the Formula One circus, you, circus used to use Alton Park in Cheshire. That's right. Which was my home circuit. So I've raced there a lot, but I used to go and watch Formula One and the Can-Am cars when they were prevalent and the big group C sports cars. Alton Park, the Gold Cup, was it? Well, the Gold Cup is still running. Okay, it's still running. Um, and they use Formula 5000 as their premier single-seater challenge. Um, unfortunately, the scene in the UK seems to be a bit quieter at the moment. Mm -hmm. They're not getting as many entries. Well, it's an expensive but sport. I don't need to tell you yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I bet you Dario is enjoying this because <laughs> you can tell you, you can tell body language sometimes in a, in a race car. Dario is showing all the signs of been really enjoying being back in a fast single-seater. Former IndyCar superstar, of course, and now a great driver coach. Cal oh. Mika really pushing on here in the 14 and really having a good fun time out there. Cal's had a, a big weekend already. Cal in that 79 Zero. Tyrrell, 009 F1, right behind Dario. Chasing the problem. And if I seem to remember, Dario loved Laguna Seca in Indy, so this will just be all times for him in many yeah. ways. Yeah. I got a chance to talk to Pato Award last year, who got a chance to go around Laguna Seca in a modern uh, McLaren. Oh, brilliant. Uh, Mika Hakkinen was here, yeah. and yeah. Uh, both of them talking, and, and the smile on Pato's face. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I know he's now tried, you know, the current modern Formula One, but just a chance to, to get in a Formula One car and go around this circuit, yeah. a real opportunity. And it's interesting the differences between the uh, series here and, and the Formula One series through the world. You know, that these guys are much more in charge of, of what they do in America. Yes. Um, oh, somebody spun. Oh, that oh, was a big spin. Luckily, everything's A-OK, -okay, but that was Mika. Yeah. Uh, he was pushing on on Dario, maybe a little too hard, but he spun the car. But if you ever had the question that this was some sort of exhibition you were watching, well, think again, folks. These guys are putting the metal to the pedal. Pedal to the metal, and there's no question. And I've got one of the drivers from 5000 here with me. And delighted to get your insight into this kind of racing. Is it this uh, racy in New Zealand as well? It certainly is, yes. I'll bet. Uh, although we're not quite as young as some of these guys. <laughs> <laughs> It doesn't make us any less competitive. No, and I was talking to Charles Nurberg, who's out there right now, and I said, it keeps you young, this doesn't it? It certainly uh, does. He says, yeah, you yeah. have to stay fit. There's no yeah. way you can get in one of these cars, uh, you know, with a hangover or a, a oh. hard, hard night out. No, no way. way. <laughs> no way. James Hunter used to manage well, it. Well, 
but you know most of most of the rest of us are just mortal there are anomalies in any sport <laughs> yeah. and james is definitely one of them he certainly was <laughs> was i'm sad to say but great hero and great to see mclaren out there in those famous marble colors and also great to see those jps colors it's interesting since the tobacco sponsorship died how those colors you know bring back so many oh, memories of the yeah. Tonka toys yeah. the matchbox cars yeah. i'm sure you had them as i did uh collection on i still got them yeah, <laughs> yeah. emerson fittipaldi yeah mario andretti loved it no, i was just saying earlier on it's interesting when you talk about williams and mclaren and have to remind modern fans that kind of came into drive to survive and that's their experience of formula one and, and they're yeah. just as equal to any of us who've been around it for a long time yeah. but having yeah. to explain how mclaren and lotus and and williams were all started off beaters. yeah yeah and you know in the early days they used to haul things around europe yeah on on trailers behind bedford vans yeah and, and in old buses um, and just go from race to race there was none of this, so oh, let's load up all the transporters, guys, and have big hospitality suites. Yeah, and that's it was the, a much more basic. Well, you could uh, talk to this. Uh, I was talking to several Americans today saying what they loved, including Dan Gurney, when they were in Europe. Um, they were saying that uh, Dan said that, that, that the love he had was to be able to go to Alton and to, to Snedderton and, and then to Spar. And, you know, and that yeah. was a regular yeah. week for, for yeah. a driver in the, in the 60s and 70s. That, that yeah. They did all sorts of Formula 1, Formula 2. Yeah. I was very fortunate when I lived in the UK that I got the opportunity to go and race a uh, small two-seater sports car, but at some of the best circuits over there. And uh, it's not until you actually drive some of them that you realise just how brave these guys were yeah. to take something like that round them. And as I'm now driving a Formula 5000 car, I'm realising it even more. I bet. Yeah, I almost think that sometimes the Formula 5000 were even more larry than Formula 1. There was you know, more, not experimentation, but th those things were beasts. And they just wanted to go help out for leather. Well, they were in the early days of aerodynamics yeah. as well. So, you know, whatever you tried one weekend, you tried something, something else, else the, next the next weekend. So there was no continuity necessarily uh, between them. Um, and it was, well, let's see what works. They used to do races that included both Formula 5000 and Formula One. And there were a couple of occasions when Formula 5000 won the race. And this was against established drivers. They were all good guys who were out there. They weren't necessarily championship rounds because they couldn't mix them. But this was before the big days of politics in Formula 1. Yes, it's a part of modern motorsport, as it we is. all know. Great to see Chris Locke out there in that 1976-77. Lotus 77, of course, in the famous JPS colours. Here he is. And it looks as though Cal Meeker's got it right in, in 14. Yeah, he has in that Tyrrell 009 from 1979 in the Candy sponsorship. It's glorious. Just want to sit and listen to him go around and around and around. Absolutely. Enjoy the noise. Yeah. How hard is it on getting tyres now? Because obviously the tyres have developed, but... There are specialised companies that actually make the original yes, tyres. Yes, re regrettably, Avon are pulling out of making the size that we use in Formula 5000. So the likelihood that in the, the next 12 months we'll all be using Hoosiers or something similar. Interesting, um, that's a shame. Up until now, we've been able to get the Avons that they were using originally back in the day. All right, with more modern rubber compounds on them, but the same carcass build that they used. But... Uh, one of the fortunate things is because the Formula 5000 races tend to be 10 or 12 laps, we don't burn through them too quickly. They're not, a, they're not a cheap thing to replace. No, I can imagine. Looking at that March from 1976, 7-6-1 in the hands of Greg and Gray from Houston in Texas. I was amazed when I got, I live in Texas at the moment, and I was amazed at the amount of Formula 1 cars that are actually based in oh. Texas. Well, I mean, I know there's a lot of money there, but you just surprised me. Yeah, but what you've got to think is that every year, the next series of Formula One cars come out. Right. So what do you do with the old ones? Yeah. You sell them off to guys who want to have one. Yeah. And, and those cars eventually end up in collections and private ownership, or they get used in series like this, where they get some young, up-and-coming talent to drive it, which adds to their experience. 
And if they get the experience in something like that, stepping up to the next level becomes a lot easier. Now, of course, Patrick Head, Frank Durney, we've been talking about designers for much of the day because Adrian Newey's here this weekend, as is Gordon Murray. But, you know, two, and two other great names that came out of the Williams factory uh, in Frank and, and Patrick, and, of course, Patrick Head, and now uh, Frank Williams, no longer part of that great team. Great to see Pat Fry going back to Williams, and I think Williams now rebuilding themselves into a name, and we hope... Uh, some people say that they're almost 20 years behind now in terms of what they've lost. Yeah, but, uh, they're, but, they're, but they're still there. They're pulling themselves back up the grids. Yep. And full full marks to, to Zach for getting McLaren back up there at the top with young uh, Oscar and... Um, Mr Norris. Mr Norris, yeah, Lando. I used to go and watch Lando in his G14 Ginetta <laughs> yes. at, at the circuits around the UK. Um, and yeah, he was, a, he was an inspirational lad then, he was quick. Yeah, he came to New Zealand actually, funnily enough, did the Toyota racing yeah, series when I, he was about I was, 15. I was at Taupo when, I, okay. when he was there. Well, we were um, there. Yeah. Yeah, that car that uh, Zach's pedalling right now is, uh, well, was driven in the day from 79 to 82 by the likes of Alan Jones, Clay Regazzoni, Carlos Reutemann, yeah. Eddie Rosberg, of course, winning a title, Mario Andretti and Derek Daly. Yeah. Of course, uh, Connor Daly pedalling well in Indy at the moment. Just uh, got back into a seat with Ray Hall Letterman. Good to him. Great, great character. Love yeah. Connor Daly and Derek. Yeah. But it's amazing the number of personnel, the, the drivers who've passed through Formula One yes. uh, over the years. And with the best one in the world, you forget the names. Right. You, know, you, <laughs> you look at a car and you go, well, uh, I think Alan Jones drove that yeah, one. Yeah. You know. But, uh, and of course, the Tiddle, Tiddle is a name that's long past now, unfortunately. Yes, I got a... He was the last privateer. Yes, I was very lucky. My Formula One day started right at the end of Ken Tyrrell's era. Ken Tyrrell and Harvey Potter's way yes. era. Yeah. So I was lucky to meet Harvey, another great uh, innovator, designer, and of course, the mighty Ken Tyrrell. And yep. it is Tyrrell winning again here in the hands of Steve Romack coming to the finish. But yes, another name, sadly... No longer part of Formula One at the moment, but uh, great names, great hit. having almost a rebirth here in the States of late. Uh, absolute record figures on ESPN at the moment, over a million viewers yeah. in each and every race. Yeah. So Formula One is back with a vengeance and it's great to see. Um, but in many ways, um, a lot of that began in this era. Absolutely, and they've not got to forget that. They've not got to let that disappear. They've got to try and maintain that heritage into what they're doing now. And I mean, I think you're up to three, three races in the States now? Yeah, yeah. three races, Miami, Austin and uh, Las Vegas in November. Yeah. So Charles Nurberg, <coughs> as I almost expected, gets the fastest time at 119.8. And I'm breaking all the historic rules by telling you the time because we don't really talk about the time. No, it's... it's but, come on, new surface, well, Formula One... Charles Nurbeck, he's been coming here many a year. I knew he wanted to get a, a nice fast <laughs> nice, time. Nice fast time. We were all told in no uncertain terms by the organisers that this was not a race meeting. This was an exhibition. But unfortunately, <laughs> racing drivers are like fridge doors. Yes. When you close the door, the light goes out. Right. You know. That's a, I like that. And we're all racers. I might borrow that. We're all racers at heart. <laughs> but it's true. It's true. You can't, I mean, you can't tell anyone whether they're 68 or 22. <laughs> not to race these wonderful machines absolutely once you're, once you're strapped into one of these yeah uh, judgment is, gets the better of you but actually the judgment is absolutely fine because these guys know exactly what they're doing mm. and to put it on a display and to be able to spin a car and not harm it and in the case of Cal Mika who's a very experienced driver may add uh, and so too Steve Romack who won the race yeah Charles Nurberg taking second place at the fastest lap of the day Danny Baker another very experienced, historic Formula One driver in third. And the mighty Dario Franchitti. Great to see him back in a single-seater in fourth place. Ahead of Martin Lauber. My thanks uh, for coming into the booth. Um, and just great to see you, Mr. Chalmers. And you've got a coughing fit there. <laughs> I was, was going to throw it to you and then I thought, no, he's coughing his head off. I'll leave him to it. But thank you for coming in. You'll be back out in action tomorrow. Back in action tomorrow. Oh, he's, he's going to get his water. He's having a coughing fit. But he's all right. Trust me, he's an athlete. <laughs>
He's from my part of the world. I can have a rib or two with him. He's from Manchester in Lancashire, and I'm from Burnley. So, yep, there's a fair few racing drivers have come from that part of the world over the years. And he'll be back out in the Formula 5000 later in the weekend. So that's our first look at Formula 1 and an absolute joy to see them on track. Well done to Steve Romack. We'll take a short break here from the reunion. Join us after this break.
Welcome back to the Rolex Monterey reunion for 2023 at the Dry Lake or Laguna Seca as it's better known. It's been racing here since the mid 50s and this is a reunion of, well, effectively the history of motorsport quite simply. And it really has been a fantastic event so far as it always is. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined, well, delighted and saddened to be joined by James Alder who is usually a perennial member of this troop out here in Group 12, in his Jaguar, but sadly not out there today. James, um, from Reno, Nevada, a long-time member of Historics here in the States. Um, what, what gives? I think, first of all, I'm happy to be here. I love this event. I love being here. I feel so fortunate to have this as a hobby. And thank you again for having me in the booth. But yes, I'm normally in this group uh, in my XK120. Uh, as you know, I'm, I'm somewhat infamous for driving the car from where I live in Reno, Nevada, over the pass, sometimes in snow, racing and driving home. But that's as it should be and as it was. Well, that's, that's kind of how I feel. I mean, when I first started, I just didn't have the finances for a tow vehicle uh, and a trailer. And so I didn't, you know, I thought that was the only way to do it. And that's, after all, the way they did do it. And, yeah, I was kind of the redheaded stepchild. Uh, you know, it was a little bit of an embarrassment. Uh, but over the years, I managed to win them over because the other participants could see that I was having about twice as much fun as any other two participants put together. And, and then, you know, I kind of won people over. But I couldn't make it this year. Now, it looks like they're doing two pace yes, laps. Are, yeah. This is the beginning of the second pace lap. And we've got a car stuck Yeah, here. you know, that's a Lotus 11, I think. And that's super cool. Uh, I don't know what the deal is, but it looks like he's ready to go, but has to do a standing start from the hot pit. So I'm not sure what that's all Unless about. Unless they let him get onto this next pace lap after everybody's gone by. But the 164 yes. is parked up at the moment. Uh, in front of our commentary booth, which is how we know about that. And uh, yes, and of course the Jaguar, the first ever winner here at the Pebble Beach Races back when it was run in 1950. Uh, so yes, a, a car that is full of history and very much a part of the history of Laguna Seca and of Monterey's racing. Um, so sad that you're not uh, in your oh, Jaguar. Well, again, that's, again, that's very, very kind. I miss it terribly. I'm broken hearted. But again, I feel very fortunate. Of course, you were referring to Phil Hill yes. driving the uh, XK120 that won the very first Pebble Beach Road Race. Now, also here, not in our broadcast booth, but is Hammond Edwards, my friend, who is the son of Sterling Edwards. And Sterling Edwards had the idea for the Del Monte Road Races because they couldn't sell the lots on 17-mile drive in Carmel. For, for housing? For, yeah, well, for whatever. I mean, yes, to put residential lots. Right. So Sterling Edwards said, hey, let's have a road race. That's what became the Pebble Beach Road Races. And his son, Hammond, is my friend. He's here. Now, by the way, Jonathan, there's a great mix of cars in our group right here. Oh, yeah, no question. I, I mean, uh, you know, on the pole, you have Greg Meyer in the Sadler. And I met Bill Sadler. And I think he's a resident of Canada, and I'm not sure if he's still with us or not. But he designed fantastic cars, and Bill Sa uh, uh, Greg Meyer is in the car that's on the pole. There's a huge disparity of performance in this group. 1947 through 1960, front engine racing cars and GT. So there's going to be as much as 15 to 20 seconds differential per lap. Now, also on the second row is the Tatum that I believe is being driven by the son of Mr. Tatum wow. that built this car, that built the special. There's also a D-Jag that was owned by Ray Sayer that was a Reno resident. He's no longer with us, but he used to take that D-Type to the grocery store. <laughs> it's owned by Bill Rookledge, and this is its debut event after a multi-hundred-thousand-dollar restoration. So we still have a double yellow. And that's because the car that we were talking about is still at the exit of pit lane and therefore in a precarious position for the start of oh, a motor I race. I see. I'm with you. Yeah, I think yeah. That's, that's just Dorsey being 
quite quite rightly because we've got safety right. trucks and a tow truck effectively right. uh, in the pit lane at the moment which you can't see here but no. that's why we've rolled we roll around for another pre-lap but that gives you a chance to keep going because it, Carry on. Well, okay, so for instance, this D-Jag out here, that it's a brand new event, it was raced in 1956 by Jack Douglas. Jack Douglas was a comedy writer for Hollywood. Brilliant. Uh, he actually wrote comedy for the Jack Parr show. That became the Johnny yeah. Carson yeah, show. Yeah. Okay? He sold the car to Ray Sayer in Reno after he had a spin in, in Pebble Beach that just scared the living, you know, <laughs> yeah. what out, out of him. I'll bet. Uh, so let's see. Then Ray raced it here in 1958 and 1959. Later that year, Sayer sold the car to Tom uh, Grosskritz of Casta, uh, Costa Mesa. Tom drag raced the car. Now, by the way, you don't think of a D-Jag as a drag race car. No. <laughs> but it would do a 0 to 60 in 4.7 seconds, wow. which was faster than a 427 Cobra. It had unbelievable acceleration. Um, in any case, he entered it in a vintage race at Riverside in 1979 and showed it at various car shows. After that, Grosskitz put the car in a garage, disassembled it, where it sat until he died in 2021. Bill Rookledge inherited the car and presents it here after a two-year restoration, which again was multi-hundreds of thousands of dollars. I, I, I probably shouldn't say the exact number. No, maybe not. Right. Uh, and other than the Pebble Beach tour yesterday, this marks the car's maiden voyage. Now, James, here's something you don't often get to say. Talking of Jaguars and Jaguar XK120s, one of the drivers out there is actually running for president. That is true. <laughs> Lars is true. Mamstead, who is a regular to yes. historic racing. But yes. Somebody said that to me last year, and I said, what? And they are. They're running for president uh, Under of the, the United States. Under the Libertarian Party. Yep. Lars Mapstead. Lars at lars 24 Dot com. Well, the way things are going, he might have a chance. Well, yeah, that, that's right. And I tell you what, he has a, he has a common sense approach, and he's going to fire everybody. If he were to have, if he were to get involved, he would drain the swamp, and I mean the swamp underneath the existing swamp, because I think there's multiple layers of swamps there, and he and he wants to get rid of it. We're looking for talking a green of dry flag. lakes. <laughs> <laughs> we're looking for a green flag, and there it is, finally. Yeah. Yes, Greg we've got Meyer jumps out in the Saddler. I mean, that thing is super fast. And Greg is a top-notch driver. Again, Jonathan, you know, a lot of these guys are amateurs, but man, some of these guys yeah, no are really good, are really good. Yeah, and this is an interesting group. I know you, we've got to know each other over the years. You, you, I mean, you've always raced that Jaguar and always brought it over from Reno, but it, it, it's an eclectic group too, isn't it? Like oh, yes. you say, you might get a, a, a quite a, a big uh, discrepancy in, in speeds overall in this group, but it's got a real history to it of very different cars. Well, and then that's of course how, you know, post-World War II racing in America, you know, it was an open uh, paper open for season, design. Open season, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, and, and, and look at this now, you have the Tatum, which is a General Motors truck engine, an inline six cylinder, that's the white car with the blue stripe yep. that's in third position. And I'm not sure, check the car right in second place right now. It's either a Lister Chevrolet or a Lister Jaguar. Now, what number are we talking? Well, it's in second position, it's silver. Oh, that's the number six. Yeah, that is, the, this is the Lister Nobly, yeah. From 1958, and that's Al Asario, who's at the wheel of that. Well, yeah, and, and that, that also, uh, you know, that is, that is the car that Archie Scott Brown raced, and he was famous as a driver. He had a deformed arm. He had his, his hand was attached to his elbow. Right. And he would get it in a Lister and take it up to 100 miles an hour with a babe in the passenger seat, and then light a cigarette, and take a puff, and hand it to her. <laughs> I See, mean, these are the I real mean, this, stories. Yes. <laughs> this is multitasking at its best. That certainly is. Hey, that Lister is is hanging with uh, Greg Meyer. Yeah, I mean, the Saddler. Yep. Yeah, uh, that's uh, pretty impressive. That's oh. really impressive. I don't know, maybe Greg Meyer wants to make a race out of this. 
which I'd love to see. There is no joy in a faster driver just running away from everybody. That's not what this is about. What this is about dicing, this is about interacting with other cars, and I don't care if it's for 25th position. It's the dicing that one or two, or I mean, you know, that two or three cars can have together. Well, like uh, the character, was it Michael Delaney in, the, in yep. the movie Le Mans? Yes. You know, that was played by Steve McQueen. He said, racing is living. Everything right. else is it's just, just waiting. waiting. Yeah. I know exactly what you mean. Now, as we watch these guys in Group 12, I know you want to be out there, but just give our audience a little bit of an insight as to how many years you've been coming to this event alone. Okay, well, as a participant and or a spectator, this is year 47 for me. Wow. I don't know what year it is as a participant. I haven't kind of figured that out. But, Jonathan, you know, I live for this. I work hard. I run a company. I try to make money so I can spend it on this. And as you've heard me say before, this is absolutely the most fun you can possibly have with your clothes on. Yeah, I think you're right. As we take a look at that 56 Lotus coming across. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. Which can be giant killers. Yes. And watching it go through its paces just at the top of the court. Well, this is, I, you know, I think the Lister is taking a little bit of a defensive line coming out of 10, going into 11, because that Lotus is right there on Yeah, him. there he is. And you can see the nimble Lotus, but when they get this straight here, that away because the Lotus just doesn't have quite enough. But going into the Andretti hairpin here, he'll start to catch up again. That's Brian McCatcher. Uh, this is, you know, and Jonathan, I'm not the only guy that loves this. These guys here, they live for this. Oh, yeah. I mean, and, and how can you blame them? How can you blame them? There is no other better place to be except here right now in the world. Right? Yeah, and the one thing I've learned about motor racing, although I've never participated in uh, anything of any level, I've done a fair few race schools and had some karting experience, but the joy of being on your own and not having to deal with anybody else except what you're doing on track, I think it was Paul Newman who famously said, you know, I love being an actor, but nobody judges what I look like and my eyes and That's right. my, my career and all the rest of it. I'm just a racing driver. And if I'm any good, I'm at the front. And if I'm not, because it's a true test of, of who you are. Yeah. And I thought that was a great comment. I learned I, that I, at Lime Rock recently. No, I agree. I agree completely. And, and he really enjoyed being just a regular guy mm -hmm. at the racetrack. Yeah. And he enjoyed actually being one of the boys rather than being, you know, pestered and, 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 and being idolized. Look, if I was James Dean, or, uh, uh, you know, or Tom Cruise. I mean, if I was a Hollywood guy, yeah. I would be here. I would be racing a vintage car if I, if I wasn't, you know, yeah, yeah. racing, you know, Patrick, whom I'm thinking of at Le Mans. Um, you know, what do they call him? McDreamy. I can't, I can't remember his name at the moment. I apologize, Patrick. But Dempsey. Yeah. And, Patrick and, Dempsey. And so, you know, look, I would be, if I had the money and the means, I would be here. Now, I don't really have the money and the means, but I'm still here. Yep, exactly. <laughs> and it kills me to not have my car. Now, this is the Parkinson special that yeah. is leading the Curtis, and that's John Buddenbaum yes. in the Parkinson, which started life as a regular XK120. It crashed at Pebble Beach quite badly. It was rebodied by Parkinson, and it's kind of Allardish looking. It's the white car. I think it's number there it three. Is, yeah. There you go. And then right behind it is Rob Manson in the Curtis. Yes. And these guys S. race together all the time. They go at it tooth and nail, and they're like best of buddies. But it's, again, the camaraderie of this is, it can't, I mean, there's nothing better. Well, when you mentioned 47 years, you must know these guys like brothers. I mean, you're yeah. racing week in, week out. Yeah, I mean, I, look, I've been very fortunate. To, you know, I've been granted this notoriety because I'm the only person that's crazy or stupid enough <laughs> to not trailer the car. And over the years, people has, have really, really learned to appreciate that. But believe me, I've been broken many times wandering the pit trying to get somebody to help me for whatever part I needed to have either fabricated or mended or whatever. But I bet you got it done. I love to see the classic Lotus colors with the oh, yellow yeah. and green. Oh yeah. And the British flag emblazoned on the side. Well yeah, the, the emblem, you know, that's on the side of a Spitfire. Yeah, exactly. <laughs>
Colin Chapman lives on. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And a lovely shot of it coming down the corkscrew. Oh, Whoa. doors open. Uh -oh. <laughs> just give that it give it a little wiggle. Me a close. little bit of Ken Miles in the Ford GT40. Yes. You know, he had trouble with his door. It would yeah. not stay shut. And here that Lotus has got that passenger door open, if you want to call it that. It's kind of a uh, horizontal flapper of some sort. Uh, let's see if he's able to reach over and close it. Or, or maybe does a little wiggle uh, at a safe place and kind of brings it shut. As we take a look at the 272, that's Nick Gruel in a well, seven, Lotus 17. Right behind that is the Johnny Von Neumann MG Special, which I, I think is turbocharged. It's very fast. The red, you know, MG TD race car. So why the British cars? Why, why did you fall in love as an American? It's always interesting to get the stories of, of why, if you will. Well, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, I suffer most of my life from what I refer to as the James Bond syndrome. Uh -huh. And every vehicle I have is made in the UK, including motorcycles and Land Rovers and Jaguars. <laughs> However, I just recently acquired a Ferrari. I mean, I bought one, but I haven't, I haven't taken possession of it. I'll tell you about that later. Okay. But, you know, when my friends were building 57 Chevys and 63 Novas, you know, I wanted a car that would go fast in a corner, not just a straight line. And that had to be a sports car. So yeah. my first car in high school was a TR4. Oh, yes. My mom wouldn't let me buy it, even though I was working. The dealer was going to carry a note. The price was $600. And she wouldn't let me buy it. I, there's Lars. Yeah, there's Lars right there, the Tell presidential candidate. Tell us about the 120, candidate. because it's an interesting car. It looks unwieldy. As you see Lars... Uh, wheeling it there. Oh, absolutely. It looks like it's a handful. It's a well, heavy it's, car. Well, it's heavy. It's 3,000 pounds. I think Lars's engine dynoed at about 250 horsepower, which is a lot. Mine only dynoed at about 223. But they are great cars. They're generally speaking dead reliable. You can drive them to the races. You can race competitively and drive them home. And if you look at an XK120, it's visually beautiful. Yeah, it is, yeah. I absolutely. mean, look at that, look, look at that car. Oh, it's, it, that it's, is classic British yeah. styling, absolutely. Yeah, and, and you could have, that car could be primer gray, it would still be <laughs> It'd beautiful. It'd still look good. Yeah. Now also, if you look at the profile of that car, you're gonna see that it appears, you know, it has this very long bonnet. And you'd think that obviously it was weight bias to the front. Yeah. But the engine is so far back in the chassis, the, the weight distribution on the 120 is actually 4951. So that's why it's become a that's, successful well, that's dip, why even it, in the day. It handles so good. Yeah, okay. Now in the 140, the next model, to appeal to the American market, they move the engine four inches forward to create more room in the cockpit. As a result, a 140 does not handle like a 120 because they lost that weight distribution advantage. Now, I know I've had this conversation with you before, but I know there's a lot of British fans tuning in. Why do we have the E-Type and you guys never adopted that name? Oh, as opposed, they adopted the XKE. Yes. Well, you know, I think some Americans are a little slow to the start. I mean, it, it, you see, had they really been on their game, they would have realized that the XK120C, which was commonly referred to as the C-Type, right. then the next eleva uh, the evolution D. of that was the D-Type, then the next letter in the alphabet it's was E. e. Yeah. <laughs> and so it, they, it should be called the E-Type, but yeah. the Americans wanted to call it an XKE. Oh, okay. Because they were so used to the XK120, the XK140, 150, and now the XKE. How about this? The 1958 Byers Volvo Special. What do you know about that, if well, anything? Well, I believe I raced against that car for many years that it was owned by a Swedish guy, I think, named Sorensen. At that time, it was red. Now it's been painted a fairly light green, pretty close to Aston Green. Yep. Really cool car, really, really rare. Uh, I Honestly, I wish I knew more about it. Volvo Power, strictly a sports racer nice to look at and 
again, that car is being shared with us. It's a super rare car. It's being shared with us. I know, that's the beauty of all of this. All of this thing is being shared with us. Chevrolet Mistral, got a quick glimpse of the 1955 just going through shot. Uh, Wesley Abendroth at yeah, the wheel. Yeah, Wes Abendroth. I race against that car a lot. Looks, like, looks like the Volvo. Just as, uh, yeah, just as we bring it into mention. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I... You know, the golf announcer will, will say there's just a short putt to clean it up, <laughs> yeah. and that puts the jinx on That's it. That's it. It's I all over. I don't have that problem. Well, here is that 55, Wesley Abendroff. Yeah. No, no, Trump. that's another 55. Oh, right. Yeah, that's an MG TD race car. Wesley Abendroff, I believe, is in another car, 55, which is a Chevy-powered Mistral. And that's right. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, and I'm that's a burgundy car. That's the one fifty-five. Yes. Wes is from Carson City, oh. and has uh, various Corvettes. Uh, he's a really good driver. Uh, you know, I, 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 I got to tell you, I did beat him once uh, in uh, the Velocity Invitational. Uh huh. Uh, passed him on the inside of turn ten, which scared both of us. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, that's good. Gets yeah. your heart going. Yeah. And Jonathan, thank you for giving me this uh, airtime. Oh, know? not at all. It's greatly appreciated. Now, I got to talk. I don't, we, I, we haven't seen the DJAG number 54. No, not I yet. think it's out here. Will it had a chair? problem. D-type Jag, but yeah. This is well, look, this is the car that race. was struck uh, in the pits oh, earlier. Okay. That's the Mark Sang okay. in and the it's moving Lotus along. Le Mans. It's moving along now. Finally got going. By the way, Mark Sang is a great driver. I have raced with him for years. He had a really early Elva that was polished aluminum, and uh, he was he was real fast in that. I think I spun next to him at Sonoma at one point. <laughs> then we had a little chat after. Well, I'm glad he's out there because the preparation and the time it takes, and you could attest to that. Oh my God! Uh, especially driving your car here. Um, yeah. You know, the work that goes on all year round to maintain these cars and to bring them to these special circuits to go to these special events. That's right. Is, it's countless hours. No. Now, I know it's hours of joy and love, but yes. at the same time, to not be able to get out there, which I thought was going to be the case, it's great to have him out there. Absolutely. I, I could not say more. And it's oftentimes a love-hate relationship. I'll bet. But remember, if it looks good and makes you feel good, it's probably going to be a pain in the ass at one point or another, whether it's a car. I mean, we can... <laughs> I know where you're going well, with yeah, this, okay. Alda. Be careful. Right, okay, sorry. <laughs> but I do, I, I concur. 148, fastest lap out there, and that's the man in second place at the moment, Al Marciero. 140, was that the Lister? Yeah, that's the Lister that... Uh, that's, yeah, we just wow. About, yeah. He did a second, well, he did three quarters of a second faster than Greg Meyer in the last lap. Rule in ninth position, and behind him, Ramson in the number 11 MG, J.D. John Newman Special. That's, That's right. That was the car I was telling yeah, you yeah. about. And just drifting into the distance there, and then up to the corkscrew. There he is. That's a pretty little thing, isn't it? Oh, yeah. And, and what, you know, racing one of these cars here is, well, and I don't care what group you're in, it's an art. It is. Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> this is like playing the violin. Well, even this Sadler that's leading the race, I mean, you know, it's a handful around uh, Laguna. You can feel the wind here up in the booth, and you can see it over the bridge there, the Rolex bridge that they're just going over there. So. You know, you've got to have your wits about you, and he makes it look easy, but uh, he's taking that Mark IV and putting it through its paces as he comes through rainy. Well, you know, I mean, Jonathan, when you're out on the track, you've got to think about one thing, and that's what you're doing. So if you're normally thinking about something else, whether it's future girlfriends, the stock market, <laughs> past school, I don't, it's not you've got to put that stuff out of your mind and concentrate on what you're doing. Well, I can tell you that this man, Greg Meyer, is going to take the checkered flag and win here. And somewhat appropriately, a man from wow. California winning here wow. at Laguna Seca. Nice. That was a nice show. Yeah. I mean, they, you know. And he is from just down the road in Carmel. Yes, yes. Well done. Then you got a, you know, a Lotus 11 and third. That's, that was a pretty 
tight group, tighter than I expected. Yeah, you to be said it would spread out, but it didn't spread out too much, did it? And just a little further down, Asirio in second place, Makachin in third, and then Colonna in fourth, like Tatum in fifth place, Rob Manson sixth, Bruce Miller seventh, and Nick Roll in eighth position, Jeff Abramson in ninth, and Mike Former. Now, any relation to the other former, you think, Mike Former? I don't know. Yeah. I tenth don't know. position. Now, I recognize Bruce Miller's name in, in his Lotus, and he has been racing. I believe longer than I have, and that's a Lotus that used to be raced by Jackie Ix, I wow. think. It's got really cool history. What a wonderful group this is. So on the slow down lap, that was group 12, and they'll be back out in action again, and hopefully James will join us for that. 1947 to 1960 front engine sports car racing cars and GT cars, a lovely display, and quite an eclectic group, as you quite rightly point out at the beginning. And interesting group well there was a huge change in technology yeah. from 1947 to 1960 and of course cars from the late 40s were drum brakes uh, you know then a little bit more in the mid 50s Jaguar developed the first production race car with four-wheel disc brakes which was the D-type they did experiment with Dunlop disc brakes at the latter uh, production of the C-types the XK 120 C C being for competition, yep. and that's, that's how the letter got started, mm -hmm. was the C for competition, then it just became the C type. But a huge difference in technology, and that's why there is a pretty big disparity in performance in this group. But nobody cares. The only person that really cares about winning is the person that is the winner. <laughs> but everybody else are winners. I mean, you know, I'm oftentimes having a dice for 20th position. Doesn't matter. It doesn't, doesn't matter. matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> well, James Alder, thank you for joining us. Sorry you're not out there, but we'll get you back in the booth and hopefully back, back in later today and also tomorrow. My thanks to James. Uh, we'll take a short break here from the reunion, the Rolex Monterey reunion for 2023. The sea is finally glinting out over the bay on the peninsula of Monterey as we sit high atop the corkscrew. We'll take a short break. We'll be back with more racing after this. Corvette E-Ray. The quickest Corvette ever, with 0 to 60 in 2.5 seconds. An electrified all-wheel drive that handles all four seasons. A supercar of contrasts. It's everything you never expected. One like none. Welcome back to the 2023 Rolex Monterey Motorsport Reunion, where the next group is about to go out. Group 13. Look at some of these cars. Le Mans cars, World Endurance cars, and lots of others in between. And sitting up the front of the grid here, uh, Mr. Porsche himself, Patrick Long. Patrick, great to see you at the front of the grid. Uh, a super looking car, but tell us, one you've driven before or not? Uh, yeah, I've driven this Leighton House 962 at Long Beach a couple of years ago. Had a great success there with uh, the tread shoring. Ed Pink, guys, I'm uh, super grateful that Tom Malloy has had me back in this car and uh, James and the boys have gone to work and rebuilt this entire car since the race last year. We didn't do more than about five laps in succession, but it's definitely got the potential. We think we've got all the bugs worked out of it, but we've got a couple of uh, very modern cars behind us with the R8 and uh, Daytona prototype. and. I know young Spencer uh, is gunning for us, so we should have some fun out there. Yeah, I'm sure you will. I mean, this one, what are we talking about here? 19, late 1980s? Yeah, this is a 87 Kramer. Uh, obviously, Leighton House with uh, its lineage in, in racing is a pretty uh, historied story. Um, Adrian Newey, of course, with his Formula One car, but this was before that time. Um, and uh, these cars had some good success. Uh, obviously, the 962 reigned at the top of world sports car you know gtp racing and uh love getting opportunities to drive these cars we're ramping up for run sport at the end of september so a lot of homework being done right now 
Yeah, absolutely. And a quick word about the circuit as well. There's been a lot of work going on here at Laguna Seca the last few months. New track has gone down, new bridge has gone down. Have you been out on it at all? Uh, and what do you expect from this track if you haven't? Yeah, they've done a great job. It's still Laguna Seca. That was my biggest concern. Would it still have its character and layout? Uh, the grip is much higher now and it's a lot smoother. So uh, we're going to go give it one now. Fantastic, Patrick. I'll leave you to it. The guy's got the three minute board up. Good luck and thanks for talking to us. Thank you. Thanks. All right, so Patrick Long going out there on his 1988 uh, Porsche 962. And behind him, as he says there, we've got that Audi R8 with names all over it, including the name of uh, Mr. Le Bon himself, Tom Christensen, just behind him. And then the uh, prototype Daytona as well, going out car number three behind that. The atmosphere down here at the start of this is just incredible, I have to tell you. The noise is like, well, something else, but the atmosphere is great. A lot of the mechanics who work on the cars as well, they're guys that would have worked on them in the day, in the era. So uh, different drivers get to drive them, but the mechanics who keep them running, a lot of those are original. And there's a real air of excitement as the guy puts up the number two board, two minutes to go till the start of this one then. And as it is getting incredibly noisy, I'm gonna to have to step back and step away. And Johnny, I'll hand to you. Let's go racing. And why not? Because that is a cracking car. One of the most famous here, and it has been uh, around America for many a year. Travis Engin has peddled this car for many a historic race. And you can see on the side the history it's got. It is one of the most storied Audis, and we celebrate that fact on Christensen here this weekend working with Audi and of course was a big part of Audi's success at Le Mans, his own with nine wins, Christensen. Tom Engen's pretty handy in that car too. Spencer Trenere uh, also involved in this in a Riley Daytona prototype Gen 1. Good looking car. And as we heard from Patrick Long, it was great to have Patrick in the booth here earlier. I don't think you heard what he was saying but uh, obviously always an interesting driver just retired from professional racing after a brilliant career and looking forward to doing more racing like this I think uh, it's a great opportunity for professional drivers to just take it in their words a little bit easier than they might take the pressure off just a little bit so we turn our attention now to 80 one to 2007 Group C, DP, WSC, LMP, and GT1. Bit of a mouthful. What was happening in the 80s? Well, the Iran hostage crisis ended in 81. Ronald Reagan became the first president to address a joint session at the British Parliament back in 1982. Microsoft Windows operating system released in 1987. It was all happening. The Galileo spacecraft launched by NASA in 89. So. Just a few bits of trivia here to put you in the mood for what you're about to see. That was what was going on at the time. And as we saw that Riley, uh, that's an ex-Wayne Taylor racing driven by Wayne Max and ex Ricky Jordan Taylor also involved. And of course, uh, the Taylor family here in America, if you don't know them, um, they are one of the most famous families of racing. And still racing to this day. Great to see that Jaguar 44 out here. I love that car, one of my favorites. There's a, a Celine out there as well, the S7. American hand-built, high-performance sports car design and built here by Celine Automotive. And as if by magic, my good friend Charles Nierberg is back by popular demand, I may add. You are having fun out there. I'm having fun. <laughs> How was it? And all those people I paid to vote for me are obviously doing their job. They're good. <laughs> How was it out there? Uh, it was good. You know, it, it was good. I just didn't quite have enough for Steve today. Yeah, he, he was, was doing he was well. It, he? I ended up with fastest lap, but I didn't. I saw that. I didn't string them together quick enough. I chuckled when I saw it because it was what the penultimate lap you got it on. Or? No, actually, it was just before I started getting into traffic. Uh, it was close to the end, but it was just before we started getting into traffic. But anyway, 
I've got you. I'm glad you've come up for this group because it is an interesting group. And these these sports cars. I mean, I remember many of these cars. I went to Le Mans back in the 80s and uh, followed a lot of uh, racing then, and was just learning about sports cars. But that Leighton House car that uh, Patrick Long is, of course, that Audi that Travis is in. Yeah. You know, these are these are these are cars that you know you could have a poster of every one of them right <laughs> oh for sure yeah this was the glory days of well i don't, I don't want to say the glory days sports car racing but is it, certainly, yeah it was one of the high it, it was one of the high points of of, of of prototype sports racing uh in the day and of course uh you know patrick long is no stranger to porsche he's a <laughs> consummate porsche shoe so he's really wheeling the latent house and uh you know a lot of other 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 really good drivers in the field with great cars uh you know uh let me just t I'm sorry, I just got out of my gear, so I'm trying to no, you see what the grid is. Take your car. I've, I've got it here for you. Here you go. Ah, lovely. There you, you go. As we continue to look at that bright green Leighton House, those colors, when they came into both Formula One and sports car racing, you never missed a trick because they were just so different to look at, Leighton House. Absolutely. Absolutely. What, yeah. what, what springs your interest straight away? Oh, you know, I mean, uh, Spencer Turner, he always yeah. wields his uh, Riley really well. And, uh, you know, all these guys are, you know, are, are quality drivers for sure. Cal Meeker is very quick in his spice. And, uh, he had yeah. a little spin in his uh, Formula 1. Yeah, did he? I didn't, of yeah, course, you, I didn't you see were, it. You weren't there, but, so uh, you didn't. But he, uh, yeah. yeah, he got that candy carpet sideways and then went, yeah. went around, but he was okay. Yeah, Chris Liebenberg, he... Uh, from out of Three Dog Garage in Pennsylvania, you know, he's uh, driving Ross Meyer's car. He, he does a fabulous job of prepping the cars and is a good shoe himself. He's, he's in that uh, Selena 7R. And, uh, you know, Rob Kaufman has a, has a, has a really beautiful, uh, the, the actual All-American Racers Toyota that's the predecessor to the car that I have. And, um, yeah, this is, this is really good. I, Taz Harvey, all, you know, he's got that spice. That was a, you know, that was a, you know, a lights, what they call the lights car, and a very, very quick car, uh, driven by some really good, you know, some a lot of good California drivers uh, drove that car. You know, I mentioned Travis Engen in that Audi. Uh, oh, for he'd sure. He's been, what, racing historics for over 20 years. Right. Uh, in fact, actually started out as an SVRA Rookie of the Year way back in 99. 100%. So, uh, uh, yeah, definitely a guy that you often see on the timesheets wherever you're racing yeah. around the US of A, if you don't know that name. Yeah, He's absolutely. He's been an endurance champion and an HRS, uh, an HSR yeah. champion in the past. So yeah. definitely one of the, the top drivers of historic racing here in the USA. Yeah, that spice car is interesting. Uh, Steve Cameron from up in Sonoma drove that car, I believe, got a win at Daytona in that car, along yep. with some other drivers for sure. Parker Johnstone, that was the leaping stone for him into IndyCar racing. I think Parker Johnstone won a championship with that car. I'm not sure it was that car, but certainly... You know, I, I, but I don't know that it wasn't either. Sorry. Okay, the pace car is in, and Patrick Long's going to lead us to the start of this one. We've got a racing start as Travis Engen goes on the outside and tries to make it to Andretti first, and he's done just that, but well and behold, oh! oh, oh Argy-bargy. A little bit of argy-bargy, as they say, but he holds the line, and the 16, Patrick Long. <laughs> Spencer's right in there. Yeah, he's gone into second. So yeah. Travis got uh, his nose out of joint a little bit there, but a good racing start by the Audi, and I think he's going to use that power to his advantage. But uh, that was good driving from Patrick, not holding back. Yeah, Spencer's got the nice V8 grunt in his uh, Riley. Yeah, and he's trying uh, to put it into good use here. He can't quite make it use here. Yeah. But as they go up the hill, it might just come into play. Yeah, and it has. Look at that, around the outside, nicely done. That was well done, yeah. It's, uh, you know, the you know the Porsche has to build a little. I don't know if that Leighton House is a single or a twin turbo. I don't know what generation it is. If it's a single turbo, you know, it's a, it's it's definitely more of a handful than the twin tur the later model, what they call water water cars with twin turbos. Uh, I just don't know what generation the Leighton House uh, 962 is. But oh, and there's yeah, yeah, this is a great group. Well, pretty close to start with, but already Spencer pulling away as they come to complete the first lap. Long in second place, and then Engen in third. Across yeah. the line they come then, Spencer with a 124.5. Long second, Engen, then Cal Mika, Alex Kirby, 
George Crass in sixth place, Taz Harvey in seventh, and Joe Robillard in eighth position, Rincon ninth, and Macron in tenth position. Yeah, they're motoring. Glorious days for Audi. What a, a moment in history of motorsport for them around the world, not just in Le Mans, but IMSA as well. Uh, that a group of Audis that uh, just seem to have a, an unending series of cars, and it didn't matter whether it was diesel or not. They, they just seem to power through. Yeah, you know, Audi, Audi sort of announced itself in motorsport here in the U.S. with their four-wheel drive Trans Am car. We were you know, talking about the Trans Am race earlier, and uh, I, uh, I am uh, at the Dallas Grand Prix. I remember, you know, the, uh, they, you know, they, do they really kind of dominated that year in Trans Am when they brought the uh, turbo four-wheel drive car over, and you know, a lot of people were crying foul. But it was all, you know, per the rules, and they kind of announced themselves. And then I think, you know, this generation of car like Travis is driving really, you know, showed their chops at the at the, at the top level. Yeah, no question. Ooh happened here a little bit of too much dust but no i don't think anybody's come to foul but somebody went a little bit wider than usual but all okay and they're pushing they're pushing on here and the times are showing it too oh yeah they're getting they're getting close to your your Pat sort of time in the f1 yeah patrick's just done a 121.6 yeah i figure it'll be interesting to see how this plays out I don't know how hard the uh, Riley is on its tires. We'll have to kind of... How would you say, in terms of preparation, these cars are compared to, let's say, the 5000 and the F1? Well, kind of jokingly, I would say the biggest hassle with these cars is all the body work. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost impossible for Good one point. guy to work on one of these cars. But, but, have, but that's just kind of a, you know... That's just kind of a joke, really. They, they, they do take up a lot of space compared to an F1 car. But to answer your question, you know, the, the, the Turbo 962, I mean, it, you know, it does take a lot of preparation. And uh, obviously it's built to run 24 hours. So yeah. it's, not, it's not the, you know, light the fuse kind of thing like the DFV Cosworth is. But you still have to, uh, you know, mind your P's and Q's on boost pressure and, and, you know, all the things relative to running the turbo. Yeah, so you need some know-how with you if you're going to bring these racing cars to the you track. Do. You, you do, for you sure. You can't just show up with a, yeah. a car and throw yeah. it out on the track. You've got to, like you say, get, get the pressures right and do all the things that need doing for it to run well. I can see from looking at, um, I can see from watching Spencer that the outside line into one is coming in. Yeah. You couldn't go out there last weekend. It was, it was not, there wasn't much grip there, but he's, he's using it effectively now. Yeah, the drone really gives you an idea of the it's, lines they're using as well. It's yeah, it's great. Really good. It's a good little battle. These two enjoying themselves out front. They are. Patrick Long back out in front. Yep. And they're swapping fastest laps. And the field spreading out dramatically. This is our first look at Group 13, which is Group C, DP. Little sports cars, LMP and GT1, Group C. You know, the Panos is an inter was an interesting yeah. car. You, you know, it looks like, we, I think we called it a roller skate when, when it first came out. <laughs> you know, it looks like, you know, you know what, you know, okay, so you're a Brit. Yeah. You remember the Clubman's cars. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. it reminds yes. me of a Clubman's yeah. car. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. You can explain to the audience what that <laughs> was better than I. Well, yeah, exactly that, a Clubman's car. What it, what, I, I guess what, what I would say is effectively an amateur's car that, that is built to, to, to race yeah. in club races. And, and, and actually, it. speaking of, of someone who's here this weekend, uh, debuting his new uh, T50 is Gordon Murray. And yes. One, one of Gordon Murray's first race cars he built himself was styled after a Clubman's yep. car where the driver is very far back over the rear axle for weight distribution. It's got a front engine, and you use the driver as a big part of the ballast for the weight distribution in the car. So it's, it's, that Panos is very interesting in that way. Yeah, uh, Don Panos and, and that history, uh, pretty brave to come and take on the mighty, to mighty benefactors and, and, and take them on their strength. Uh, no question about it. And uh, not many people would have dared. No, that was, that was uh, you know, he, uh, he, he was not afraid of a challenge. He was a uh, pharmaceutical manufacturer and used to complex challenges and certainly brought that to, uh, you know, to his Panos uh you know, endurance team. Interested to see that 
front wing, uh, not used very often at all. Yeah. Uh, it looks kind of odd, but uh, well. I'm works, trying to remember. Oh, sorry. I'm Go trying ahead. to remember who pinned that team. I can't quite remember who who, who drew up the uh, the panos, but uh, there's somebody pretty famous, I think. Got the got the jaguar, the jaguar, as you guys say. <laughs> I yes. love that jaguar. That and aluminium. Uh, yes, aluminium. We have to say that. Yes, it's that 962 with the the front wing that's catching my eye. Ross in ninth position. Um, that's it's a really interesting front wing that. Yes, we always say Jaguar, Jaguar. Love to drive in a Jaguar, as Pink Floyd once said. There you go. Uh, here's some more glory coming our way. The number 10, Joe Robolan in that 962 from 1984, the all purple. There he is. He's doing a nice job. Yep. Win sponsorship. That, that's a really pretty car. It is. Nice purple. Simple. Yeah, simple. In terms of the color scheme, but uh, yeah. doing exactly what the sponsor would want. You, there's no mistaking it. Yeah. Wins did a lot of motorsport sponsorship back in the day. Yeah. And uh, I've always been amazed at how in motorsport, you know, everybody said the, the death knell of uh, motorsport would be the tobacco sponsorship because obviously they were spending money hand over fist and yeah. then also people would say well the next death knell is when the manufacturers pull out of a series um, but it's amazing what changes over the years and now we see in Formula 1 especially the tech revolution I mean every tech company I know is now involved in Formula 1 including with Red Bull and Oracle Dell and so on and so forth so you know whether it be Budweiser back in the day spectacle kind of follow wins as you just mentioned there there's yeah. always a kind of a new group that sets yeah. sets, sets the uh, sponsorship going. Yeah, here here in the U.S., the Justice Brothers, uh, you know, uh, you know, sponsored a lot of drag racing cars and sprint, you know, midget sprints, dirt cars as well as sports cars. And Ed Justice is quite the historian of motorsport. Uh, get him talking about AJ Foyt sometime, and you'll be rolling in the aisle. That Jaguar. Uh, from 1984, that XJR5. I saw that run at uh, Le Mans and those famous Jaguar colors in the green and white, and, uh, or at least the colors they used that year for yeah. that 44. It's a, it's a car that's uh, embellished on my mind for sure. Those Jaguars were, they were beautiful cars. Yeah. And um, uh, was it Tony Southgate that designed those, I believe? I think you're right. My, my, my lifelong buddy Price Cobb, of course, won Le Mans in one. Yes, he did. Famously. Price, a good mate of ours. He lives in Austin, Texas. He does. Of yeah. He does indeed. He does. Good boy. Yes. And if you're listening, Price, we're missing you. Come and join us. And there's Jim Norman in the March 85G with the Budweiser sponsorship. That in 1985. Another, another, big, another big V8 in the back of that thing. Yeah. I love the sound of these cars. That's the, the other thing. I wish I was yeah. at the top of the corkscrew now, letting these guys, listening to these exactly. guys roll through. Right. You know, it's all good. It's all good. The uh, oh yeah. I wonder. I don't remember if Bobby Ray Hall drove that car or not. He he did. I think he did. Some, you know. He, yeah, it would seem the right. Yeah, it would be the had, right time. He had a lot it? of Budweiser sponsorship in the. At times in his indie car career, I would have certainly said it's something like Rolex. He probably would have done. True. He was still doing indie. Yeah. True. Daytona, yeah. of course. I'm talking about. Yeah. But be careful. They're all Rolex events. <laughs> the car sounds really good. Patrick Long continuing to lead here. Spencer Trenary trying to keep him honest. Travis Engin doing the same. That's the one, two, three at the moment in this our first look at Group 13 of 14 groups. The Ruby Tuesday coming into focus now. Coming down the main straight. Another one of the Porsches. I'd love running in this group with the uh, Eagle Mark III Toyota GTP car. It's, uh, of course, it's a highly turbocharged four-cylinder, so you have to really keep the, the wick lit on that thing. But it develops massive downforce. It's just phenomenal. So it's uh, had some really good battles out here with uh, Mr. Bruce Canapa and his... Yes. Uh, 
in his 962. So Where's Bruce disappeared, or did he not? Well, I don't know. Well, I, no, I think he's, you know, to be honest, I think he's just working really hard on the racetrack now. You know, there's a new management group. And, I see. And, and Bruce and, and a number of other stalwarts of Laguna Seca are on yeah. the management, you know, they're on the board. And, and, you know, the county made a big commitment to the track, spent about $20 million yeah. Yeah. for the paving. And, of course, the Mission Food Sponsor Bridge, Juan Gonzalez, who's a big, yeah. excellent driver and a big motorsport sponsor. Is, Great character, too. I see him oh, a lot in SVRA. He's a lovely man. He's a lovely guy and puts his money where his mouth yeah. is in terms of supporting the sport. He and, loves uh, his racing. He does. And, you know, it's it really bodes well for the future of this great historic circuit here. Yeah, very true. Uh, it's really nice to see. Well, Patrick Long has made easy work of it, and not surprising, not long retired from professional racing himself. Just a couple of, of years, he's been out of the real hard factory racing, and now he has just one more lap in that Leighton House Porsche to finish it off. But there's a good battle for second place going on between Travis Engin and Trenary. In fact, Engin's just gone into second place in the Audi. So let's see if he can hold on to that. That's well done. Yeah. It's been a good little battle. Yes, for sure. Yeah, that that color is so distinctive, you know, and the, the uh, yeah, they're very close back there. You know, the F1 Leighton House, you know, F1 car, same color, really so distinctive. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Didn't Adrian Newey, that's where he started he out did. with F1? He, he was involved with that car for yeah, sure. And, of course, people forget um, he spent a lot of time over here he in did. Indy before he became a famous Formula One He uh, did, and, man. And, and I wasn't the only one to predict that the uh, Red Bull, when they went to the back to the ground effect chassis, I, I wasn't alone in, in surmising that Adrian would have a bit of a leg up because I'm all sure the he smiled. He studied it at university. <laughs> it's well, like, it was like, oh, if Brown Effects ever comes back, I'm I'm the guy. <laughs> well, you know, all those indie cars he worked on yeah. were exactly that, and so exactly. he had a as a wealth of ex successful experience. So uh, yeah, and I wouldn't be surprised if he's over the years just pulled some of that talent from the states to help him out, whether it be a McLaren or a Spinner. It's the uh, yeah. Ford just going around there. Yep. What a shame. But there's the checkered flag for Patrick Long in the Porsche. And as the factory Porsche driver has done so many years, another win. Luckily, the car has righted itself and not got into too much trouble. Turns itself around. Let's see who comes across the line. It is Travis Engen who took the Audi to second place. Well done to him. Spencer Trenary in third place and Alex Kirby in fourth. Cal Mika finishing out the race in fifth. Well done. Yeah, good Nice, fun. clean race, no contact. These cars, these cars are big, and they're kind of hard to see out of. Yes. Um, at least that's the, excuse, er, that's the yeah. excuse everyone uses anyway. Oh, no, I can believe it. I've sat, <laughs> well, no, but I've sat in one, and, and, and no. you know, I, I always, it always amazes me when, when I used to watch them go down the mall sign. It's how the hell do you see uh, cars that may be either in front or behind because you're so low down. And you're right, the peripheral is not good. You look know, at those mirrors, they're tight. Yeah, yeah. You know what amazes me is, you know, during the height of the IMSA GTP series, you know, they were racing all these cars on street circuits. And yeah. talk about wow. tight and hard to see. Yeah, I that, mean, it's that's another level, isn't it? Pretty amazing. Yeah, I've done a fair few World Cup GT races at Macau, and I don't know how they do that. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, listen, thank you, Charles, for yeah. coming in, as always. Hopefully, we'll see you tomorrow, but uh, you'll be out again. And uh, that concludes our... Group 13 for today. We've got one more group to bring to you, and that's the Saloon Cars Group 14. So stay with us. We've got one more race to bring you today of day one of our Monterey reunion from Rolex. Join us after this break.
Welcome back to the 2023 Rolex Monterey Motorsport Reunion where Group 14 saloon cars are getting set and ready to go. And the man who's put himself on the front row of the grid is standing next to the most resplendent looking race prepared Ford Escort that I think you will ever see. Todd Willing. Todd, firstly, what a fantastic car you've got here. Just tell us a quick little word on this car, the history of it and how you've come to uh, own it. Um, well, I work for Ford Motor Company, so I had to race a Ford. It's, uh, it's been a race car its whole life. I found it down in Florida. It had been superbly restored by the previous owner. Um, and then by, uh, by various connections, I got, in, I got uh, in contact with the original owner who imported it to uh, Canada in 1969. And just tell us your weekend is obviously going extremely well. This is a race weekend. You've qualified. You're in first. And uh, you must be feeling pretty good about that. Yeah, but it's a very long race. So we're, we're, we're all going to do our best to survive to the end and, and have, a, have a blast. Yeah, one hour race with a mandatory pit stop window after 15 minutes, I think, between 15 and 40. Yeah, that's correct. Um, so I'll be using it wisely and get, get some rest and some fluids back in. Todd, it's a great looking car, we better let you get ready because the guy's going to hold up, I think, the three minute board in a moment. So you need to get your helmet on, get your gloves on. There goes Todd, keep your eyes peeled for car number 63 behind him, a beautiful Alpha and then a BMW. Now, as Todd was just saying, this car, this uh, race is going to last one hour. Mandatory pit stop window then after 15 minutes and before 40 minutes. So you've got sort of 20 minute window there, there are thereabouts to come on in. Some of the drivers you will see change, some will just use that opportunity to take a five minute break grab some water um, or do whatever it is they need to do in those five minutes but some will make a change when you come on down as well have a look at some of the minis let's find car 61 because uh car 60 61 and 63 it is or 60 61 62 i think uh pure minis that's peterman unsby racing enterprises it's the first time in 50 years that the three cars of pure racing will have uh, been out on track together now that is our man don racine who has mini mania based in nevada who owns i think half a dozen of the minis that you're going to see racing here today he's put the team back together for the rolex monterey motorsport reunion in 2023 and that's going to be quite exciting i forget exactly which one don is in but he's going to be swapping over at the halfway stage with doug peterson which is going to be fantastic and we might actually get don come on up to the booth for a bit of a chat when he uh, has done his swap. He did say to me just for the start a moment or two ago that he might, if he remembers, head on up to the booth and go and join Johnny uh, for a little bit of a chat. But yeah, one hour race on this one. It's gonna be a long race for some of these older engines. It's gonna be interesting to see how they fare, but as always here at the Rolex, we're talking about cars in some instances that are one of a kind and almost priceless, but these guys are really going to have a race. And I think of all of the cars and all of the classes that are racing this weekend, some of this might be the most exciting, some of their most evenly matched cars, potentially. So we should see some wheel to wheel side by side action. I've got a race control guy here just giving uh, our cameraman a little bit of a twirly finger. And I'm looking up to the far end of the grid to see the, uh, the grid marshal there put up the one minute board as I think we are getting set and ready to go. And I'm looking all the way down this pre-grid. I'm gonna have a quick little count up, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. There must be at least 20 cars in this one looking all the way down the pre-grid. There's Johnny, we got the one minute board up. I think we're gonna have to step away, the cameraman. George doing a fantastic job on the pictures, being asked just to step aside. So Johnny, I'll hand over to you. Here we go, the final one of the day. Group 14, salute cars are off and racing. And Kev, I reckon you should come up and join me for this because you and I grew up watching this. Kev Harris doing a sterling job uh, in this as we turn our attention to the final race of the day. And I always love this. Yes, it's been a long day and there's been a lot of different cars out there, but you can't beat minis and you can't beat a good Alfa Romeo and a Ford Cortina. What can you say? Great stuff. And as I agree with Kev, I think this is going to be quite a, uh, an interesting race because it is an endurance race uh, or a mini endurance race uh, because we are going to have a pit stop. So there's a bit of tactics, there's a bit of strategy involved in this. So uh, it's going to be interesting. And that window, as we mentioned, is between 50 and 40 minutes, an hour-long race. Uh, and so, yeah, you've got to have your wits about you for 
a long race around Laguna. An hour in any of these cars is, is a long time. And even though we're getting now down to twilight or close to, it's still pretty hot out there. So it's going to be uh, hardly contested and uh, hotly contested, I should say. And uh, this is going to be some fun, folks. Uh, got a host of different cars out there from BMWs to Fords to Alphas, as we mentioned, the Austin Minis, the Morris Minis. And uh, the old, ah, oh, we've even got a BMW, just a, uh, no, two BMWs, one 1600 from 67 and one from 65. So there you go. There's one of the BMWs just coming out of the pits, followed by an Alfa Romeo. There's the second. So this is going to be fun. Looking forward to this. Um, the pace car will take them round um, what is now a two lap this year with the new surface. We've mentioned it before, but some people coming into watching these races for the first time. We welcome you wherever you're tuning in to the Rolex Monterey Motorsports Reunion from Laguna Seca. It's been a good day and we're expecting a bigger crowd tomorrow because there's a lot going on downtown in Monterey. Quail event in full swing and of course a lot of people in town doing lots of different events. Auctions, Concord, you name it. Love those. Paddy Hopkirk. That reminds me of those famous rally Paddy Hopkirk days when he made that car so famous. Uh, nobody thought it would be a great rally car, but the Mini is just, I don't know, it's one of those cars that you just, you can't say enough about it. It, it just doesn't look like a race car, but it looks like the most fun you can have. And, and weirdly, even though it looks like a tiny car, I've seen six foot plus people jump into a Mini and be quite comfortable and not cramped at all. This is one of those strange, weird, deceptively great little cars to go and have fun in. And if you do want to race, uh, a Mini's a good way to go. So up the hill they come, led by that Ford coming down the hill, down the corkscrew. And back in the mid-60s, the expansion of slew car racing pretty much started in Great Britain, which of course became onto the British Touring Car Championship, which it now still is. Um, but it all kind of began in the mid-60s with these sorts of cars racing in Britain. And of course, it spread across to Europe and so on. And, and then became very popular, of course, in Australia and New Zealand. And they have their own Touring Car Championship, of course, supercars now in Australia. But uh, these were the sort of early beginnings back in the 60s, before all that, and now got Super Touring et al. So early beginnings, and of course, many of these cars raced over here in the States, taking on the mighty muscle. And here we are again, 2023. James Aldis joined me again, and um, maybe not as familiar with these cars, but love the British cars and there's plenty out there to look at. There's also some very nice Italian cars out there and a few German BMWs as well to enjoy. But uh, always a lot of fun saloon car racing and they love, they're as passionate about their racing as anybody else, right? Absolutely. This is a very reasonable way to race. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I'm not the only one. I, well, Jonathan, when people ask me what I wanted to be when I grew up, uh, and I still wonder about that. But, you know, I would never say an astronaut. I wouldn't say a fireman. I want to be a race car driver. Yep. I still want to be a race car Me driver. Me too. This is, you could have, you know, a Ford Cortina, a Mini Cooper, a BMW 1600, an Alfa Giulietta, you know, uh, and drive this car to work and race on the weekends and be competitive and live out your fantasy. And that's what these guys are doing. Yeah. It's truly remarkable and a lot of fun. Well, you know, the Mini Coopers are front wheel drive and they have that engine mounted on the front wheels and it gives them really, really great handling. And they will go around the corner so fast and of course so will oh, some of these other cars. You will see them on three wheels. Yeah, no kidding. Oh yeah, that's definitely a, a part of the game. 
Yeah, and you'd think the Mini would be the oddest thing to take down the corkscrew, but it sticks to the ground. It's almost like it has its own ground effect. They're giant killers. Yeah. They're giant killers. You can have big cars with V8s and a lot of horsepower and have a Mini just beat them up. And I've just seen one of the Austins coming out of the pit, uh, which is a really pretty car. It's uh, an Austin A35 in um, well, bright green, and it's just, just headed out. William Rookledge uh, at the wheel. Yeah, that's Bill Rookledge. Yeah, Bill. And, and he generally races an XK120 in my <laughs> I know, group. this is quite different for him. But that's right, but he's here uh, with the DJAG that didn't run in Group 12. I haven't quite got to the bottom of that okay. yet. I'll send but, you out to find out. Yes, but he's got the... Uh, one car coming the in. Austin. Yeah, one car coming in. I, I Some can't sort tell. Of okay, they're heading for a green flag here. I think. Yep, here we go. So Ford versus Alpha at the front. And away goes the Escort from 1968 to lead the field to green. This a one-hour endurance race with a pit stop. A little bit of strategy involved. A bunch of minis and a bunch of Alphas, BMWs name it and they're all out there having a good time and a Morris Mini a Cooper S out there as well from 1966 well you know they've really got to be careful in these first couple of laps because you know to finish first you have to first <laughs> first finish, finish. yeah and the adrenaline and the adrenaline and the excitement is so great on these opening laps but you got to calm down this is an endurance race yeah yeah you, you, you just got to keep your wits about you but when you're when you're doing something that's, that's like oftentimes the most exciting thing that you've ever done, and you love it so much, it's hard not to go crazy. I can, I can in understand. In fact, I'm an example of going crazy. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> David Murray in the 42 from uh, Woodenville in Wisconsin. Sorry, from Washington State in an Alfa Romeo. Julia T.I. from 1965. Keep an eye on him. Almost 30 cars involved in this. So big group. Big, Very big group. big group. Boy, it's cleared up nicely. Finally, we've got some clear skies and blue skies above. We started off with a rather muggy day. You know, I always thought it was Steve Earle that arranged the weather. <laughs> I mean, we had, we've had we always had beautiful weather. So, uh, But apparently it's not Steve. I'm, maybe it's you. I it don't could know. be me. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> No, it's always, uh, Laguna seems to me anyway, the, the times I've been here or even covered it from the UK, it always seems that early morning you get your fog and then it blows off. Doesn't always, but it does usually. And already Todd Willing is flying. He's got a good lead in the 63B Escort. And now the battle is on for second, third and fourth. Well, many of these minis out here are owned by Don Racine. Yeah. Well, Don said he might just pop up in here once he's done his stint. So he'll be he'll be a great guy to get in here. Oh, is Don going to come up? Well, he, he if he if he has a decent stint and he gets out of the car and he's happy, oh, he says, lovely. Come and join. Oh, lovely. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but you're right. Carry on because uh, Don does. He's a big part of getting this group together. Yeah, absolutely. He's the owner of a company called Mini Mania, and. Recently, a yellow Mini Cooper S has been nicknamed the Bumblebee. It says, John Unsby, the Mini's previous owner, kindly assembled his personal recollections together with the, photog the photographs of his racing experience with the Mini and passed this material along with the car. Don, who knows these cars as well as anyone, recognized the value of the records and commented one of the best parts of racing a vintage car is to be able to preserve and share its history and this story definitely needs to be shared so this is a reader board at his pit okay now i took a photograph of it uh but i can't really share it with you i don't know how to no, have it shared on the great. live feed really i can i can read perfect. a little yeah, bit that's perfect but it's the people that are here the spectators that are here that get to see these cars up close in the paddock and the reader boards with the information yeah I mean, that i think that's as a fan you want to see that you want to walk up to a car and maybe you know nothing about it but be able to read that little sign and that's always been a feature of historic racing is that oh we're under caution already so the clock will continue ticking but we, everything like, all the work like that todd willing has done yellow now that's going to be a full course yeah. yellow so there's an incident somewhere yeah looks like it so under a yellow of course there's no passing ah here we go 
Oh, okay. Well, it's one of one of the alphas, alphas stuck out on yeah. Andretti. Yeah. You know, should they consider that kind of an unsafe position? Yeah, it's a breaking part. You can't really risk that. And right. You do not want to hit one of right. those modern uh, trucks. And I've been in that position where I've been broken outside of the Andretti hairpin. Yes, I remember. Oh, and I'm, it's just, I feel so bad because I want them to get me in a different spot, pick up the car, move me, so the rest of the participants can have a green flag and continue racing. There's nothing worse than to feel that you were a cause of a, of a long incident involving a double yellow flag. That's what we've got right now. So this is our group 14, this one an endurance race. The clock on the top left tells you how many minutes we're ticking down to. There's a pit stop window from 15 to 40 minutes, so you can choose uh, when to take that, and that brings a little bit of strategy into it. So what I'll do, Jonathan, if it's okay, is I'll read a little bit more of sure, this go, particular go story, this, this Mini Cooper S. So it says, John Unsby raced quarter midgets as a youngster. His father's company maintained traffic signals for the city of Chicago. <laughs> that explains a lot. Yeah, it does. That's where I'm from, <laughs> originally. <laughs> uh, John's cars were always painted yellow, the same yellow paint that his father used on the light poles. That's funny. Uh, sounds to me like he might have absconded I with some say, city I say, somebody stolen property from Chicago. <laughs> That's public right. safety. John's car, okay, it says that, the yellow color was distinctive, John recalled, and there was always plenty of it on hand. Oh boy, that's convenient. <laughs> as a spectator at a race in 1967, he watched as a superbly driven Mini took on a group of muscle cars, with the driver putting on a real show despite his huge power disadvantage by combining extreme late braking into turns with an aggressive broad sliding cornering technique. John recalled the Mini's roof was about at the door handles of the muscle cars as he would lean over on them through the corners. The crowd was wildly cheering for the Mini and John remembered being completely caught up in the enthusiasm. Someday he promised himself he would drive a Mini that way too. Again, that's, that's so cool. Oh, totally. <laughs> I mean, what? we're already restarting. <laughs> oh, Green flag is waving. But yeah, I mean, I can imagine the American audience seeing a Mini for the first time oh, racing. Yeah. Would it, I mean, for me growing up, you know, my mom had a, a Hillman Imp and a Triumph Spitfire, so I thought that was the size of cars when I was five. Right. <laughs> and of course a Mini, but, um, you know, when you've seen the streets, and you know this well, when you've seen the streets of England um, and, the, and the bushy hedgerows, you need a car about that size. That's right. about as big as you want. Right. <laughs> Well, and of course the Americans had plenty of raw materials on hand and built big cars and yeah. put big engines in them. But you know, can you imagine the possible humiliation from people in American muscle cars? Oh yeah. With this little toaster looking car. Just that's, yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, that's literally the first thing you learn when you arrive in America is, is people talk about their love of cars all in the output, all in the, you know, power to the rear wheel. What's it got? You know, that's right. the first question. And that comes from right. a lot of drag racing, a lot of, you know, quarter mile stuff. And, 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 and I think that's where that culture comes from is what oh, output definitely. can I get from this engine? Well, and Jan and Dean and the Beach Boys. Yeah. I mean, um, what was the song? Shut Down. <laughs> Loved it, absolutely loved it. And little Deuce Coop. <laughs> Big moment there. Yeah. I'll tell you what, he was pushing through the corkscrew just then in that Alpha. So 10 minutes gone in our saloon car group 14 race. And at the moment in fourth, Dennis Racine. That's uh, Don's son. Yeah. Lights blazing. There's your leader. Now he built up a strong lead before the safety flags came out uh, while we cleared up that car. But uh, he's back to it, is Todd Willing, and uh, trying to build on that lead again. That is uh, Gear Ramleth in the 61 going through in the all orange and black there, chasing that Alpha. Well, I believe right now it's uh, a Ford, BMW, Alpha, and then Mini. Yeah, that's kind of cool. So evenly spread there between the marks. Nicely done. 
uh, the first four positions there are that's pretty tight. That's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. And, with uh, with ten minutes gone. Yeah. It's very cool. That's pretty good. Well, of course, the leader just a little bit further up the road. So this is the battle, I think, for second place. There's your leader. Tom yeah. Willing, just going so through traffic already. Yeah, got some back marker there. Yeah. yeah. But this battle, second, third, is really good. Four-way battle. At the back of it is Dennis Racine. Oh, look at this. Look, look at this <laughs> move right now coming up to the corkscrew. Took a very unconventional line. Can he get away with it? Oh, it's nip and tuck, isn't it? Well, he pulls out of it in the end, but he thought about it. Oh, man. He might be lining himself up to have another go at that. This is hairy. This is pretty hairy. <laughs> no. <laughs> Through rainy they come, then. The two little minis chasing down the Alpha and the BMW for second place at the moment as the Ford Escort from 1968 leads the way. Well, I think it was last year, you know, they had Mini versus Mustang. Yeah. Well, the BMW got sideways coming out of 11. Yeah, and that really illustrated that, that battle you're talking about right. of muscle versus nimble, yeah. That's right. This is a little bit more of a fair competition. Yes. Closer racing. You know, and they call this gentleman sports car racing. Believe me, these guys are trying. They're trying as hard as they can. Obviously, they don't want to trade paint. They don't want to have contact. But that's part of the reason why this is such a wonderful sport. There's no money. There's no trophies. There's no trophy girls. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, but these people do it strictly out of passion, strictly out of heart. There's generally no sponsorship. They're paying for the privilege to have the chance to risk damaging their car and or worse. And they live for it. Yeah, they do. You know, you mentioned that Mini Mania group which started in 74, uh, now based here in California, and has grown to become the largest United States-based supplier of parts for classic minis here. So this is kind of their home race, and that's why perhaps there are so many minis out there, is because it's, it's sort of almost taken over the place. Well, because of Mini Mania, in theory, I mean, I'm not a CPA, but Don Racine probably does all of this, and it's tax deductible because it promotes his company. There you go. <laughs> Third here last year was Don. Dennis, on the other hand, fifth here, and has raced this particular car. That uh, Morris Mini from 1966, uh, since 1984. So he's got a fair few laps under his belt if he's been racing it that long. And that Gear Ramlet car in the 1960 Austin Mini Cooper in orange. Don drove that a couple of years ago, but now it's uh, in the hands of Gear. That's, yeah, that's. Uh can't remember Gear's dad's name. A uh, great driver. I apologize, it's escaping me for a moment. But the son is, I believe, Oliver Gear. Uh -huh. And uh, I don't know what his experience is in, in the Mini, but he's doing really well, it appears to me. He's in top gear. <laughs> yeah. Parker McKean won this race last year in an Alfa Romeo from 1965. Alan Thom in the 1965 Julia TI Super. Just going through your shot. And we're getting about five minutes away from the window being open. Those tiny tires on the mini just. Oh, yeah. They just, it, it still always amazes me. <laughs> well, they truly are amazing cars. But now, here, this is, this is when, the, when the competition is this close. This is where you really got to concentrate on the line. You got to use every part of the pavement you can, including the rumble strip. And if you can fill the mirrors of the car that's ahead of you, that guy may make a mistake. He might be concentrating on the mirrors instead of his line. That's when he makes a little mistake, and that's when you got to take advantage of it. Looking down the corkscrew, into Rainey, over the drone, over the hills, revealing this wonderful two corners. And then into the mighty right hand to turn 10 before the final corner. And you've got to hold it really nice and tidy through there. Yeah, that 
That battle right there going into 11 right now is super tight, very, very competitive. When I go through there, I'm out on the Astro turf. Right. But I got a big heavy. Well, you've got car. a big heavy unwield, uh, unwieldy Jaguar to deal yeah, with. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever raced anything else? I mean, I know you've been racing that Jaguar for a long time, but never been tempted. You know, my friend Ian Ross, who races at Phillip Island in uh, in Australia, Brilliant. he has a GT350 Shelby, and he let me take that uh, for hot laps in a race course called Vinton, which is north of Melbourne. And I, that was great fun. Even though it's a big Mustang with a big V8, it felt lighter than my Jag and had lots of power. So I had a lot of fun in that. And then my other friend and Ian's friend named Phil Verwert had a car called a Graduate, which is a tool room copy of a McLaren M8E. And that car was wicked fast and it had aero, you know, it was uh, kind of a ground effects car. And it was hard for me to drive it faster than I thought the physics would allow it to stay on the track, but I needed to do that in order to get the aerodynamics to create the ground effects. So that was very uncomfortable for me because I'm just not used to that kind of thing. Yeah, you mentioned Phillip Island. I've been there a fair few years and its history very much parallels um, what we have here at Laguna Seca because Phillip Island was a circuit that uh, was on an island just off uh, the coast of Melbourne. And of course, they didn't have a license to go racing around Melbourne uh, at the time, so they took it on to this basically uh, nature preserve. Yes, it's a Island. wildlife preserve. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, and, and they did exactly the same as they did here at Pebble Beach. They ran them around the streets of Phillip Island, okay. around the wooden, you know, painted the painted the trees white. But of course, now they've got the resplendent Phillip Island circuit, which has kind of become more famous for motorcycle racing than yes. than car racing. But yes. I would love to see a race like this at Phillip Island. Uh, a crank, one of the greatest circuits, and, and, and it too has its own mini corkscrew dropping off there before the last uh, complex. But um, a great circuit to go. Well, they have a wonderful vintage historic event that's put on by the Victorian Historic right. Racing Register, and I actually raced my 120 there. Do you really? It's the only event that I didn't drive it to. That's interesting. Yeah. So you had you shipped? Obviously, you shipped it. Well, uh, you know, I, I got to tell you. Um, the Victorian Historic Racing Register allowed my 120 to what? go. Oh, that's a Dretti, a mini off there. Okay. That's a local yellow for now, but it's going to become probably a full course given the wear it is. Yep, that's outside of the Andretti. Oh, he's got pit. it going. Good. Yep, I think I think that's outside of the Andretti hairpin. Yeah, it is Andretti. Okay, and that is the 68. Yeah, we've got the 63B, but that's the 68, and that's uh, Gary Dream in the Austin Cooper. That looks like a pretty early car. Yeah, 65. So going back to Phillip Island, um, the organizing body paid for a container of cars wow. to come from the US. And I somehow kind of conned my way into getting my car in that container. <laughs> and I received an award from Jack Brabham. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, I can only match that by giving my only kart trophy. And I was rubbish at kart <laughs> racing, but my trophy was given to me by John Surtees. And he oh said, congratulations, young man. And oh I went, God. you have no idea. Oh. Because I was a bike and car fan. Right. And this in front of me was the great yes. man. And, and of course, <laughs> yeah, I've, of course, I've tell, never I've dined out on that for years. Well, tell the audience why. Because he's because the only man to have won. He's the only man to have won both, both. driving championships on two wheels on and four wheels Amazing. and two wheels. That's right. And an absolute gentleman. Oh, yeah. I had the pleasure of meeting him here. Yep. I mean, over the years, I've had the pleasure of meeting Sterling and Lady Susan and Phil Hill and Juan Fangio and John Surtees and Dan Gurney, George Former. That's a good dinner table, isn't oh, it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> But it, and, and it's only because of the sport of historic racing. It's the opportunity for a regular person. Now, this is not a scheduled stop. No. Because we're at the 41 minute mark, so you're not officially allowed in. I think that's the 137 of Stark, Sh uh, Stark Shelby uh, in an Alfa Romeo Julius Super. 
Yeah, maybe it looks like they're, an they're equipment issue. Some, yeah, they're fixing something. It could be his hands device or something with the roll cage. But there's somebody definitely trying to get on top of what's gone wrong. It might, I think it's probably uh, it's probably his uh, uh, either position in the car or a hands device. Oh, look at this move right here. Here we go. Bonsai, Bonsai. Absolutely. Oh man, he held it off. This is, oh, oh here we go. There you whoa, go. Whoa, whoa. Ollie, I think he's pitting. Must be. Yeah. Because he looked like he just was standing Suddenly still. Suddenly stood still, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's coming in yeah. in the Alpha. And we are getting to that window now, so we're starting to see the cars coming in. And that is the 63 again. Jonathan, I wish I was out there, you know. I'll I bet. I do have a valid medical card. I've got my driving gear. <laughs> no one has come up to me and said, hey, Jim, would you drive my Maserati? Yeah, no, not yet. <laughs> well, the 59 is making an official stop, so okay. that's good. And here comes our second driver. Okay, but it looks 59. like the deck lid is up for some reason. It's Parker McKean of Seattle. Uh, you know, the, the boot Albert. lid. Yeah. The, they call it in the UK. So I don't know what's going on there, but uh, I don't think they want to take out a spare tire. Maybe there was a fuel cell issue. Looks like they're making a driver change. Yeah. So we're going to see the first. This is the first, if you like, of what will be many pit stops. Everybody's got to come in. Some are changing drivers, some aren't. And now we're starting to see more cars coming in. This is not quite up to the F1 standards of <laughs> two and a half seconds. No. Max Verstappen would be a bit bored with a pit stop that long. <laughs> he might fall asleep. Yeah. I thought he was going to fall asleep the other day. Well, I haven't watched it. Was it that uh, easy a win? Well, no, but he was literally like, telling his engineer, I, I must concentrate. Newgarden did the same in a, in a race in Indy. <laughs> it was like, I, I need to concentrate. Yeah. Well, and you do. <laughs> if you start drifting, yeah. if your mind starts thinking about something else, you can get into trouble in what they would refer to as a New York second, which is yeah, not no, very kidding. much time. And that's shorter than the New York minute. That's right. Billy Joel will tell you. <laughs> so Dennis Racine in the 177 going about his business, doing a great job so far. And currently in, what, fourth place at the moment, just ahead of Ramlet. And Matthew Polk in sixth. Parker McKean. People pipping horns and all sorts going on down there. Ah, I can actually look out the window and watch the pit stops. I hadn't really given thought to the fact that I can actually see where. Now, now look going here. On. You know, it appears that 61, the the Mini Cooper, got ahead of the Alpha. Remember, he was behind yeah. for a very long time, but now there's been a position change. Yes, and in fact, the one with the, the lights blazing has also pulled away from this battle because it was much closer between the three of them a lap before. So we're in that pit window now. So we're going to see a flotilla of different cars coming in at different times. And drivers jumping in and getting their chance to run. We might even get Racine up here if he's in the mood to tell us about his experience. That Alpha number 11, it was just going through either turn five or six. The camera angle was such that you could clearly see that it one wheel, the left inside wheel was up in the air about three inches. Well, that's Richard Stewart Milne, who is racing out of Uruguay in that 68 Alpha. Well, he's Romero. pushing it. He's pushing it, and that's great. Into the pits comes the 94 right in front of us. That's George Calfo in the BMW 1800, all white. So I'm just keeping an eye on the pit stops as well as watching the race from one eye and watching the pit stops change. Yeah, what a tribute to the European cars of the era. Yes, yeah. I mean, look at this BMW 1600 four-door, you know, saloon or sedan. Great car. Look at the, an American car of that year. I mean... Yeah, completely different. <laughs> yeah. That's the bonnet, as we call it. Yes. Being lifted. The hood, as you might say. Have you gone to English terms, surely, with a Jaguar? Oh, absolutely. Good, man. In fact, so I do even now... you use your boot? Oh, yeah, the boot, the deck lid, the bonnet, there you go. the hood, of course, which is the roof. Yes. Um, and also the schedule. Ah, good for you. Well done. <laughs> we'll have you saying aluminium before we know it. Yeah, I actually do. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Ah, the snobbery of it all, huh? Of it all, huh? <laughs> no, I love it. I mean, like I told you, I suffer from the James Bond syndrome. <laughs> syndrome. Here's our leader, talking to James Bond. Todd Willing, and he is just that, that escort flying. That was one of the first cars I fell in love with, watching an escort do rally in Rally Wales. Right. And I thought to myself, well, look at that thing go. Well, and they get airborne, and they're on dirt. I mean, talk about cojones. Yeah. Well, they had a big Ford uh, expansion in the UK, and they were very dominant in rally terms in the 70s. And uh, absolute joy to watch. So I can see out of uh, the pit box here, they're making signals to the drivers and letting them know and waving them down as each and every car now deciding to continue battle or come in and make the uh, Well, that was pretty stop. tight right there. That was pretty tight, the Andretti hairpin. Yep. And so Don, I think, in 177 is coming up on a back marker, but they're, you know, they're really kind of going at it and dicing that BMW, that early, I believe, 1600 coupe. Don is now cleanly through, but, you know, as a, if you're a slower car and faster cars are coming up, I think you have an obligation to be a good backmarker. Yeah, that's you know? a 69 BMW uh -huh. ahead of him, or the one he's battling with. Right. I have those wing mirrors mounted on the fenders of the 120, and I make sure they're convex. So it gives yeah, me idea. a wide yeah. field of view because, uh, you know, I, I use those mirrors. I really need them. Beautiful sights and sounds here at Laguna. I hope you're enjoying our 2023 coverage of the Rolex Monterey reunion. Weekend, part of the Monterey week here at the WeatherTech Raceway. Great to have Mission Foods on board and also great to see the facelift that Laguna has gone through some 20 million dollars spent in the last couple of years to give it the upgrade it needed I did contribute to that good uh, but one well, thing in, that in we, entry fees alone <laughs> oh, well, yeah yeah I don't you know when I first started running the Monterey historics the entry fee was it was the most expensive event pretty sure it was hundred and fifty dollars <laughs> things have changed over the years and Jonathan Another thing I have to mention is, look at the coverage that you have somehow arranged. I mean, I presume that there's a drone up in the air yes, yep. that is giving us this footage. Absolutely. <laughs> One of the reasons I enjoy the movie Grand Prix so much. Ooh. Oh, Ooh, really, that alpha was really in trouble. action, great action right there. Yeah. Go on, why do you, what, go on, why do you enjoy that movie so? Well, because... It was when they had in-car camera technology, and that allowed the person watching the movie to get yes. a feel for what it was like yeah, yeah. in the car. Now, they also made a movie that's a documentary called The Making of Grand Prix, yeah. and it's narrated by Jim Garner. Yeah. And, of course, he plays Pete plays Aaron yeah, in the exactly, movie. Yeah. And the camera car was a GT40. I don't know if you're aware of that or not. That's, yeah, that's pretty I, cool. I have a copy of the making, but it's very special to me. Now, Mr. Garner is no longer with us, but in 1985, I raced the 120 in the Palm Springs Vintage Grand Prix, and they were going to have a celebrity race. James Garner was going to drive my 120. That would be cool. <laughs> well, I had terrible mixed feelings about it because, like, oh, my God, what if something happens? You know, but <laughs> what, it, what it ended up happening was a hurricane came through <laughs> and blew down the grandstands. Oh, no. And they canceled the celebrity race. Oh, no. So I never had to really never cross that, that bridge. <laughs> now, we're going to have to wait for Mr. Willing to come in because he hasn't been in yet. But he's trying to put in some fast laps to keep his advantage in the escort. I'll tell you what, that escort has not missed a mark. No, I mean, it, it is very consistent. I have not been checking times on him, but... Uh, he's planted, yep. He's also the fastest man out there. He's doing a 146 currently. And, wow. uh, yeah, he should be in fairly quickly. And I think he's trying to put the hurry up on just so he can come in and maintain his lead. Boy, 146, that's, that's very really fast, moving. Yeah. I mean, my lap record in my XK120 is about a 
you know, a 201. Lars Mapstead, who, as I mentioned, yep. is running for president, the Libertarian Party, he did a 159. Wow. Pretty impressive. Very, yes, in an old heavy car like that with drum brakes. Thomas Diaz has just headed out of the pits, a man from Paso Robles, where they make the good wine. He's in a 1965 Mini Cooper S. And he's just done his pit stop. We'll keep an eye out for him. But it's still Willing, Murray, and Rancine. Ramel is still fourth. Stuart Milne in what? Fourth, fifth position at the moment in that 11A. Richard Stuart Milne. And I said earlier, who's from or racing for under the Uruguayan license. You know, I recognize a name in ninth position, Dehan. I raced yes. many years with a gentleman named John Dehan. And I don't know if there's any relation there. Well, this is CJ. Okay. Dehan. Okay. From Scottsdale, Arizona. I don't know if that helps you. Not necessarily. Uh, there's some action going on here. Uh, oh, this is this is great. This is just great. There's 29 and a half minutes left in this. Well, this is interesting. Here comes your leader, but yeah, we're watching a bit of tactics going on here because they're what what's happening is the drivers are now choosing when to come in and sort of tactically saying, no, you you're going good. You got free space. You got free air. Keep going. And, uh, and waiting a little bit on, on the driver change. If, you, if you've got it going and you've got some uh, clean space in front of you, it's all about traffic, isn't it, really? Right, and managing that properly. Yeah, so getting back to John DeHaan, uh, I was, he was a passenger in my XK120 at one point, and he's a forensic scientist. Right. And so the Jaguar has wooden floorboards and the <laughs> And the exhaust set the floorboard on fire. Oh, nice. I, however, I had a forensic scientist with ah. me. <laughs> so it's very so convenient. <laughs> there's another, there's a good TV idea. NCIS <laughs> car race. Yeah. So 28 minutes to go in our saloon race, group 14 of our reunion. The last group of the day and all 14 categories, including the ragtime races, will be out tomorrow. And the Rolling Bones, I may add, really enjoyed the hot rods. A bit like yourself, I don't know if you saw any of the hot rods parked out there, but I did. lovely cars yeah. they put together. Drove from New York all the way here, took no. them five days. Yep. I did not know that. Yeah, they, they, all those cars drove from New York to, to the Guinness. Well, talk about bucket list stuff. Yeah, no kidding. I mean, my buddy Luca, who races the Bugatti, that's eligible for uh, Monaco, the Monaco Historique, yep. right? Yeah, yeah. That I think they do once every two years. Two years, yeah. So if I could just get hold of a billionaire, <laughs> I got a good way to spend a pile of money. We're going to enter the Bugatti in Monaco and then ship a container of XK120s to Europe. Ah. Tour Europe race with Luca at Monaco and then continue the tour. I'm in. <laughs> I would do some of the historic racing in Europe in my 120, drive around and tour. I just, I just haven't found the billionaire yet. <laughs> I did that event last year with... Uh... Ah, here we go. He's in. Mr. Come and sit down <laughs> with us. We've got Don Racine. We've been talking about him and he's joined us. But yes, I had the pleasure of working with Tiff Nadell and Alex Brundle last year. At Monaco, and it was a real, real joy. Don, come and join us. I'm going to plug you in. We've just had the the mighty Don Racine, who's just been out in the thick of it, in the fray, so to speak. First and foremost, how are you enjoying the new surface here? Ah, uh, great, great. It's uh, very smooth. Uh, I like the traction that it has. It really, uh, I can drive almost any place in the mini, of course, anyway. But this is even better yet. So. No, it looks like you have a lot of choice of lines, particularly with the smooth pavement. Oh, yeah. So yeah. I, I think you, uh, you know, in the 120, I mean, my car is really, really heavy and big. I really only have one line. But you, looks like you can drive wherever you want to. I can drive almost any place I want to, yeah. That's oh, the man. neat part about a Mini. Front wheel oh. drive, you can just go. And, and, you know, we've got some new drivers in the cars, and they're still going like a bandy. Uh, you know, you look at the uh, Oliver in the 61 car. That's Oliver Gear. 
Ol Oliver Ramless. Ramless. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Oliver Ramless. Is, okay. Is in the 61. In fact, he just came into the pits. Yeah. Uh, just oh. came into the pits. You'll uh, need that fuel. Yeah, that one needs fuel. That's the yeah. one car that needs fuel. Get some Sunoco in it. And yeah. out he comes. Yeah, he's oh, got to come out. He's a tall figure, too. <laughs> I, said, you, you, I, I was saying this at the beginning before the race started. That, you know, it do, the Mini is, is just this weird space machine. It's like a TARDIS. I mean, he's got to be, what, six foot or close to, and yet he looks quite comfortable in it. Yeah, when he gets out, he should, very so he should never get in it. And it's the first time he's ever driven the Mini. Listen, oh, is, is it really? Oh, yeah, first time he's ever driven the Mini. You know, he's just doing fabulous in the well, car. There is so more space on the inside of a Mini than there is on the outside. I mean, you've got to be careful... On the street, you know, you think somebody's in a little car, maybe not a big guy. You can have a big guy get out of one of those. and Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> Don, yeah. we've been talking about the mini explosion, if you will. <laughs> uh, excuse the fun. But, you know, since the early 70s, you've been getting these minis over here and, and, and getting them running. Um, obviously, uh, they mean a lot to you. But I, I never expected to come to California and see this amount of, of, of British machinery here, yeah. especially the mini. Um, why the Mini and, and, and how, has, you know, how has that experience and growth of the Mini uh, Mania Club been? Yeah, the, the Mini has been, well, it's been with me for over 50 years. I mean, I've been doing it for over 50 years. And, and uh, the real short story, I've told it too many times, but I'll tell it one more time. <laughs> when I first started racing, I was racing a 356 Porsche. And I was doing that on the East Coast. Oh, right. I, I know the story. You know the yeah, story, yeah. 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 <laughs> and when I moved to California, still as a young kid, the insurance company said, I got you, you're driving a Porsche. And I remember the only thing that used to beat me back there was a little gray-haired old man in a Mini, and now I am one. <laughs> that is a good story. Yeah, yeah, so. And I suppose the insurance wasn't quite so high. No, 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 no. They, they considered it a Volkswagen. They didn't care. So the, the Mini is just such a, an attention getter. I mean, we, we have such tremendous appreciation for the Mini. I mean, everybody that walks by it just absolutely loves it. By the way, that's my son driving that yes, car. Yes, that's Dennis. Yeah, Dennis, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's been having a good battle. He's had those lights blazing. Oh, yes. He's irritating everybody with those <laughs> lights. Uh, uh, he bugged that crap out of me this morning or yesterday when he was behind me with those lights on. So what yeah. is the hardest part, if you will? As a Brit, I can say this, but uh, parts, uh, you know, the British, the British car industry kind of disappeared from my neck of the woods of Wolverhampton and Oxfordshire and all the rest of it. Is it harder now to, to maintain and keep the parts going? No, I don't, I don't think so because, you know, I just came back from racing over at Brands Hatch and Minis and, and, you know, the the uh, appeal over there is every bit as strong as it was yeah. here. You know, we had a full day of nothing but mini racing all day long. It must have been, I don't know, two, three hundred cars, different minis in different classes. So it's, it's really, uh, it, it has enabled us to get all the parts we need typically. Because they're so popular. And are people in Britain, I'm sure they are, surprised at the amount of minis and the amount of time you spent over there. And if you like, showing huge respect to what is what I would call a normal car. And, you know, yeah, I grew and, up watching yeah, these tiny, tiny little Spitfires and minis. And Most Englishmen I know have owned a mini at one time yeah. in their life. You know, it's just that simple. It's I've never owned a mini. I've owned an MGB. Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. The mini what, is... What are the two? Go, go ahead. No, but yeah, it's either one of the two, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The, the Mini has just been such an icon. Which is just um, a giant killer. I mean, you know, I've seen Minis beat up much, you know, higher horsepower cars. I guess they handle so well. Yeah. You know, they don't have any horsepower, but they sure corner well. Yeah. That's, well, that's, that's the, yeah. Let me ask you about that. I've always wondered. The wheelbase of the Mini looks so small, and so too the wheels themselves. When you get a touch of oversteer in a Mini, what actually physically happens? Because you very rarely see a Mini sideways now when you see Paddy Hopkirk or somebody like that or, you know, any of these guys that, that they're able to, to take them rallying. But I'm talking about on a, on a track. They, they, they look planted. Yes, they are. And, and the key to the Mini is to keep your foot in the gas. Ah, okay. Uh, 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 you just don't, you know, you go into an apex and you have your foot on the gas long before you hit the apex and you hold it flat all the way through the apex. That's fun. Yeah, yeah it really <laughs> is. Uh, this Jaguar driver to your right is going, ah. The car, the back end just will not come around if you have your foot right. on the gas. It's just that simple. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, it, well, it, I mean, of course, it's pulls being you driven by the... Right? Yeah, it pull, pulls you around the corner. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, so the front wheels do everything. They, they steer, they power, they, you know, everything. Brake. Everything is done with the front wheels. So but Don, I, I mean, I know that you've uh, driven a lot of cars over the years that are true giant killers. Of course, I remember 
the aardvark. Yeah, yeah, I told that for <laughs> I a mean, long, long time. Yeah. Little aardvark never hurt anybody, little but it would beat anyone. up yeah, a lot yeah. of big cars. Yeah. yeah, it's always fun. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think the mini is is uh, kind of taking its place in my mind. Right. You know, it, it is still a, a, a little itty bitty car, always outclassed. You know, I'm sure we're the smallest displacement motor out there. Uh, you know, there's 1800s and lots of 1600s, of course, mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. uh, what, did you, what do you think of the modern progression when it was taken over and it basically became sort of a Mini Cooper BMW-made car? I mean, did that put you off or...? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, at the, the first generations of them were nice. They were, they were still sporty and small. Now they've gotten so big that you yeah. must as well buy a they're, they're, Nissan. They don't, don't even look like a Mini anymore. They don't look like a Mini at all anymore. So, yeah, totally different cars. Uh, you know, there, there is still, you know, it, it, particularly over in England at Brands, it, it was interesting because there was still an awful lot of new Minis owners that were there mm -hmm. watching the classics run. Interesting. So, you know, that was satisfying in that respect. Uh, you know, they were still paying attention to it. And, you know, it's still one of the, you know. And of the competition out there, is it the Alphas, the BMWs? What, what, uh, what, what gives you the hardest time out there? Say that again, I'm sorry. Uh, of the competition out in the saloons out here, you know, a mixture it's, of Alphas. It's, it's very tight. Uh, you know, the top number of cars, I don't remember what the lap times are right now, but the top number of cars are very close together. Um, you know, it looks like my son is still in fourth place. Yeah. Uh, so that's pretty good. Uh, I think he's already had his pit stop, so that's very good. Well, here's our early leader, Willing, coming down, the main straight down towards Andretti. He's now currently in third, and so we could have a good grandstand finish to this one because, as you say, uh, there's been quite a change around since the pit stops. Todd deciding to come in later than some of the other cars, and now he's going to have to make his way through. But he's got a good 19 minutes. And tell us, what is the strategy, if you will? I mean, how do you decide whether you want to come straight in after 15 minutes or, or wait a bit? Depends on how strong your, your co-driver is. Okay, yeah. <laughs> good point. <laughs> I happen to have an extremely talented co-driver, it's Doug Peterson. Ah. And Doug, of course, is... Ah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Doug Peterson. Yeah. Trans Am Doug the, Peterson. Yeah, Trans Am. Oh. Yeah, yeah, you know, ah, I didn't know that. Imps uh, everything. Oh, know, yeah. He's... he's uh, well, I do, I do current Trans Am with Doug, so I see him every week. In fact, I went up to the three-dimensional factory uh, uh, when we were in Detroit, so okay. love working with De Doug, and he's a good pedaling. And the next yeah, Trans Am champion. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, just... And a big fellow, too, so he's proof of the fact that you, anybody can get in these cars. Yeah, 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 yeah. I just wanted to give him an experience to drive one of my cars. Oh, I can't wait know, to his, ask him his, about his. His feedback will be great to understand, you know, how was the car and, and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. What a real change around from a, a 550 brake horsepower Mustang that he drives usually. Right. That is that is wild. Oh, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing him. Uh, I'll see him at Watkins Glen in a couple of weeks. So, yeah, I will definitely ask him about running around in your Good stuff, good stuff. So. By the way, Don, I do have a current medical card, and I've got driving gear with me. Okay. All right, <laughs> all right. Well, you know, I, have, I don't have enough cars for the number of people that want to drive them. <laughs> okay. You know, it's just that simple. You know, I, I was going to say, is the interest even growing still? Oh, the interest is phenomenal. Yeah, absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. We have lots and lots of people that want to drive a Mini. You know. Well, and haven't you rented them in the past? Oh, uh, I was asking, haven't you rented those cars in the past? Aren't they available as a rental? As a rental car? You know, to rent to the race? Yeah. So that's, uh, I, I know you've rented them before, and uh, I might be a future customer if I can't fix my Jaguar. <laughs> so now that Doug Peterson's jumped out of the big muscle cars, it looks as though we've got another taker. <laughs> well, popular as ever. And this is our final group of the day. And how do you enjoy this event particularly? Uh, I mean, obviously you have a part to play. It's a busy weekend for you. Yeah, very busy. Weekend. Do you enjoy yeah, it? Yeah. And do you like to see the other cars as well? See what's yeah, going on? yeah. I mean, obviously I've been doing this for over 40 years, so yeah. Uh, you know, there isn't many of these cars I haven't seen or raced with actually. Yeah, I'll so bet. It's just all been good. Yeah. So, so uh, Gear Ramleth now leading the race in his 1960 Austin Mini Cooper. Uh, the yellow and black. Todd Willing now up to second place, and then Richard Stewart Milne uh, in third in that Alfa Romeo. That's Oliver, by the way, not Gear. Oh, excuse me. I know it says Gear, but that's, ah. that's his dad, and his dad couldn't make it. So ah, Oliver's driving. Oliver Ram. Thank yeah, you. So. See, that's why we got you up here. Oh, okay. And Gear is his dad's first name. Yes. Okay, that's the gentleman Ram I know. 
Right, and he's super fast in a like a 23B Lotus. 23B, yes, oh, yes, 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 oh, yeah, I've yeah, seen yeah, him. Yeah. I mean, he really knows how to drive. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so, so yeah. I mean, I noticed we've got Uruguay on on the board there, uh, mostly America, uh, but some interest. Are you starting to get attraction from from different parts of the world wanting to come here and race and, and take on the mighty? Oh Laguna? yeah, no, we've had some some guys from England come over and drive these cars. That's yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally different cars than they've got, but yeah, it's good stuff. So. I did Macau. I lived in Hong Kong for a long time, and, and a lot of people came and brought minis, obviously over to Hong Kong. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, a lot of interest in mini racing there right, too. We're gonna we're gonna try to do a uh, an event next year called the fastest mini in the world contest. Okay. We ran it. That's what we ran over to Brands Hatch to run. So we're gonna try to do that next year in, in Oklahoma. Uh, and how I, ex would I expect some minis from England and Japan and Australia to ship their cars over here. Oh, what, a, what an event. Show, show that off, sounds yeah. like a lot of fun. Oh, it'll be a great event. Yeah, a great event. I mean, anything, it'll be an anything goes class, you know, that any, any engine you want as long as it looks like a Mini. <laughs> <laughs> love it. So, yeah. yeah, over at Brands, they had one Mini that had 440 horsepower. How the heck do you shove that in a Mini? It was a 2.3 liter uh, Vauxhall motor <laughs> with supercharged. Good work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so. That's stuffing a lot of power into yeah, a tiny space, that's, that's, that's for sure. That's a lot sure. of power, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, he's doing a pretty good job. I need to run. Okay, you go. I, I need to run. Well, you better go and celebrate with Sun. He's, he's out there, blazing away. Yeah, he's blazing away. He always does. So, it's great stuff. Hey, thanks for coming in. All good right, luck tomorrow. For me. And hope it all goes according to plan. And uh, thanks for coming in. All right, thank you. Bye. Well, we've got some, what, just under 15 minutes to go in this race. And... It's been an interesting one. Todd Willing now back at the front in that escort. So he's done the business. And now it's a case of whether Gear Ramlith, uh, Oliver Ramlith, excuse me, uh, now I'm corrected quite rightly, can get up there. Dennis Racine currently in fourth position. And this could be a nice, a nice little grandstand finish. But while I've got a moment, Kev Harris has just joined us. Um, You've been having a lot of fun, my friend, haven't you? Hey, Johnny, once again, I've been having a whole lot of fun. And uh, so good to have Don come up here straight from the car into the hot seat and give you a, a driver's eye view on this one. No, but I've been having so much fun, as always, running out and about uh, around the paddock because we've been doing chatting to so many people, seeing some priceless cars, and then, and then just sort of standing by and watching them go wheel to wheel out on the track. Well, we've made this man happier than he was. James Alder, usually running his XK, 120 but unfortunately not this year but he's I'm, here i'm still having a great time good and you can't not i mean just even walking around the paddock and talking to the drivers and the mechanics and seeing the change in technology and these fantastic cars some of which should be in museums yeah that are racing out here against each other what better sport is this and there's no conflict of interest they're not racing for money like i said there's no trophy girls yeah. This is, tr it's a true no sport. No trophies either. <laughs> no, no trophies either. Now they do give special awards on certain occasions under certain circumstances. Right. In fact, Peter Miles is here. Ah. Ken Miles' son. Yep. That we all know from yeah, the movie. For, yeah, I have a picture of Peter and I, and now when I and see And he was him, a saloon car driver when he started Oh, uh, yes. Well, I, you know, uh, Kenny, I mean, is a many people's hero. Yep. And it's been, really well promoted with the movie Ford versus Ferrari. Yeah, I know. Very well done. Yeah. Christian and, Bale was and, brilliant. And I practically, you know, come to tears when I watch the movie when Kenny uh, is killed, of course, yeah. at Willow Springs and, and Peter is there. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I know. It's just, it's tragic. Mm. And of course, the movie Grand Prix was tragic. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah. Yves Montan, yeah. the paid, played Jean-Pierre, the Ferrari driver. Yep. I mean, he was uh, the mature driver, you know, and then he started wondering what was going on when his car didn't show up, questioning Ferrari's loyalty to him. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's, it can be brutal, but that's real racing. Yeah. We're talking about historic racing, and historic racing is allowing these people to live out their fantasies of being a race car driver. I can't even you got to shut me up. Now, help us out here. Kev's been beavering around the pit lane, and he's always interested in characters. James has been coming here 40 years wow, to on. this event alone, or at least Laguna Seca. Well, actually, this is year 47. Oh, my word. So who, who should how, how give, give me a thought? I, know, I, was, I, was, I was, was just six, at six months old when I arrived. Yeah, first race. Know. You first exactly. race at six months. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But who is there a character we should get to know? Is there somebody we should... Uh, 
ferret around for us. Yes. Who, who are the some well, of the names? Well, I, I, I have to make a list. But okay. I mean, there is, we'll take it. There are so many interesting people here, and, that, and that's, uh, that's the part of the thing that makes this such a great sport. I mean, it's wonderful to see the cars, and it's wonderful to wander the paddock, but when you get to know these guys, I have made such wonderful friends just through the historic racing, and these are honorable people. Yeah. These are people that are accountable for their own actions. Uh, it's just, it's, a, it's, it's the right crowd and no crowding. Yes. We did, I bet you didn't know this. There's a man running for president out there today. There is he was in Group 12, Lars Malmsted, running right, for the yes, Libertarian yes. Party. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And in fact, I, I've, I've actually known this. He, he races quite a lot uh, in historics, but uh, uh, he's well known in these parts, and he is wow. running for office for the president. Well, good luck to him. I yeah, say. exactly. Why not? Let's Come put on. a racing driver in there. Why not? <laughs> exactly. Well, he's, he's promised to clean house. I there mean, you go. Who knows what his chances are? And everybody goes racing. But like I said, before, you know, there's a swamp under the swamp, and he's going to clear out both swamps. We're going to get in trouble, I'll tell you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's, it's been a, a good day. You've enjoyed it? Oh, it's been a fantastic day once again, Johnny. I mean, uh, what were we here first here a couple of years ago, and once again we're back. Um, just great to chat to so many people. Uh, Rob Manson from the California Specials, I enjoyed talking oh, yeah. to him. I mean, that guy's an encyclopedia yeah. on, on, you know, road racing in this part of the world, and then yes. how it came to be here at Laguna Seca. Well, he owns a bunch of specials, of course. Yes. And then and there's the Parkinson special that raced against his Curtis. Right. And it's, you know, Rob, you're absolutely right. I mean, you interview Rob. Yeah. He will give you a lot of information because of his life's experience and history with racing. Yeah. yeah. He's, a, he's a, a, a very good friend of mine. And he's now doing the trophy, the perpetual ongoing trophy uh, called the Del Monte Cup. Yes. And... I was very fortunate to be the recipient of that last year. So the Big Cup has the names of the people that won back in the day, From you know, like Phil yeah. Hill, yeah. that's right. And then they add the names that are racing now. That's cool. And so I that's got good. my name on the same thing with Phil Hill and now the likes nice of accolade. Phil Hill. Oh, that's very, really uh, yeah, cool. I'm very fortunate. That's really, really cool. That's a great accolade. Yes. Um, and speaking of characters, what about Dennis from Rolling Bones this morning? Ah, fantastic. I mean, those things, those Rolling Bones hot rods, they're something else. Uh, he, uh, James didn't know. James one of the few guys that drives his car across the Reno Mountains. But these guys drove across America. Yeah, exactly. And they're just, they're incredible things. They're put together. They sometimes take, you know, a year or two to put together. But when you look inside his car, they've searched all over the place to find little dials and little switches to go in those cars. Mm -hmm. They're proper enthusiast cars. Mm -hmm. They're works of art. They really are works of art. So I enjoyed talking to Dennis an awful lot from Rolling Bones this morning. We're well, watching uh, Richard Stuart Milne here and Troy Ermish. They've just put their fastest lap in in the Alpha. Uh, currently in third position. And you can see they're pushing on a little. Oh, they're pushing. This, that's the Alpha that I was talking about. Yeah that I believe going through five or six, you can clearly see it's on three wheel, wheels. Wheel comes off, yeah. Well, Willie's still doing it in the 63B, and I can see your excitement. You're like me when you say, whoa, look at that Ford Escort. I grew up watching those. <laughs> yeah, I know, I do. I enjoyed, and I enjoyed chatting to uh, our man Todd Willing about his Escort down there. It was immaculate. But also as well, when you watch this saloon car racing in these cars, I think you mentioned it earlier on, and some of the lines that some of the cars yeah. take it's some pretty interesting lines because they're all having a go, aren't they? And some of them are being more, you know, more gentlemanly with their driving than others. And others are thinking, no, I'm going for this. I'm going I'm to put one up the inside. I'm going to make it stick. Well, Don just came in and said, I could put my Mini anywhere, anywhere. on the anywhere track. Anywhere on the track. Yeah. <laughs> as long as he keeps his foot in it. That's it. Yeah. So if you back off for one reason or another, maybe you get a little nervous or something. That's when you can start to have some control issues. Yeah, that, that sort of hesitation, that kind of just creates a little bit of doubt in your mind that that's right. not good. But it goes right. against yeah. all your instincts to, to, to kind of go towards the apex, still accelerating. Yes, <laughs> yes. yes. Sometimes speed is your friend. Yeah, can that's be, right. certainly in a Mini. Yeah. Well, and these are momentum cars. Yeah. yeah. you yeah. got to get them going and keep them going. In the Jag, you know, I really got to try to get the brakes working as yeah. good as I possibly can. Yeah. And that's always a challenge with four-wheel drum brakes. I can imagine. 
And I'll tell you another thing that struck me uh, this year, Johnny, is just how good the circuit looks. Yeah. Obviously, the tarmac's been relayed, but more than that, it just looks immaculate, doesn't it? The new bridge, the new tarmac, the whole place has been, you know, John Norwegian and his team have spent an awful lot of money making this place look great. And all four of these pictures, they're billion dollar pictures, aren't they? Look at this. Oh, this is great. Still and yeah, and you're absolutely right. The upgrades that they've made and the changes that they've made, yeah. the bridge itself now able to take, um, you know, golf carts yep. and, and wheelchairs. You know, these are things that you, you must do now. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I'm glad to see it happening. And yeah, I, I think it's put itself in a good shape for the next 20 years or so. Oh, definitely. So just five minutes to go in our final Group 14 race. Uh, what's the highlight for you? Any any particular cars that you've really enjoyed? Oh, where do you start? Where do you start? Uh, I will say today, I mean, too many highlights to mention, but I've just name-checked him. I'm name-checking again, Dennis from Rolling Bones. Yeah, I've yeah. really enjoyed his company down there. I love seeing those cars. I thought they were fantastic. They're kind of, uh, they're an amalgamation of different parts from here and there, and they all go together, and there's a little bit of kind of ingenuity to make a car that's, you know, uh, right for the era, right for the age that it was racing, but it's done, you know, with, with sort of, modern, uh, what's the word, modern engineering to put it all together, but you end up with this thing that's completely unique, and, and you look inside it, and you sit inside, you're like, this, this is an airplane seat I'm sitting yeah, on, yeah. but it just feels right in this car. It's and no great. mean feat to get in the show, as they say in America. Yeah, uh, not you know, at all. Th this is not an easy place to come, as you heard earlier from Barry, um, 400 cars here, 600 yes. were looked at, and yeah. 200 told, sorry, that is coming. One of the great things about this event, it has to be authentic to be here. Yeah. Look at this. Who we got on the screen here? The 177. Living out their dreams, as we were saying, James. Well, look at it. People yeah, that's, 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 Dennis. To that's, that's, that's uh, Don's son out there. So Dennis. That's why, yeah, that's why wow. uh, Don headed out. Because I think yes. he wants to go and celebrate with him. Yeah. Because he's doing a good job. And he's about to finish either in fourth or possibly third. Here's your second place man, Oliver Ramlet. Oh, squeak those tires, won't you? <laughs> now that's Gear's son. Now, yeah. I, I have not met him other than I just kind of talked to him a little while ago. But his dad is really good. I'm going to go down there and celebrate with those guys and have a beer. Yeah, yeah you should. You should. Always very social down that alley where all yeah, those guys Yeah, we, we went up. a couple of years ago, didn't yeah. we, when they were there having a beer and everybody was swapping stories, as it should be. It was proper, what I would call, clubman racing uh, chats mm. about who had this, who had that. You know, I have to, I, I've got to compliment you guys, because if you're in control of the drones or this coverage, yeah. I have never seen coverage this good. It's good, isn't this, it? Oh, it's the great. The pictures are a billion it's dollar great. pictures. It's yeah. great. I mean, the technology yeah. that exists now to watch motor racing has never been better. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. Uh, the drone has changed the aspect for people watching. Uh, and certainly from, you know, above, you get a completely different perspective. Uh, you I, do. Wish, I wish we could add the onboards as well at the same time. But, oh, uh, imagine. Look so at they this. just wave the, you know, the blue flag with the yellow stripe to let this car know that a faster car was coming through. Yeah. yeah. But the scariest flag there is, is the yellow flag with the red stripes because that means the surface has changed. And the only thing that's keeping these cars safe and these drivers safe is the consistency of the, yeah. uh, of the surface. And if you have somebody that blows their, their water because they don't allow glycol on the racetrack or their oil sump, all of a sudden you can be in big big trouble way over your head yeah so that that flag is so important and and again uh, the turn workers i don't know if they're professional or volunteers most but of all you gotta you gotta say thank you to those yeah, guys big time. yeah a lot of volunteers involved in this event and all the events at laguna and they're very proud of that uh, continued support by those volunteers it's something that laguna is very very uh, keen on uh, emphasizing if you look at the program there that they have a you know um, a very big part uh, and it, it, there's an association you know, say the volunteer association with an executive committee and all the rest of it so yeah it, there's no question that it's an important part of this event so just a minute to go and we do it all again tomorrow hope you've enjoyed it it looks as though Todd Willing is going to do what he set out to do which is take the win away from Ramliff there he is coming out of the last corner Probably to take, if not the white flag, it is one lap to go. So there you go. Here he comes. 
the man from Ford winning in yeah, a Ford. So works, works for, for the Ford. company over here. Over here, yeah. wow, yeah, brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he sounded like an Aussie. He did. I think I think actually a Kiwi. I think ah, is it, is it, is it okay. either an Aussie or a Kiwi? I'm not sure. Gotta One be or careful, other. you can get in trouble for I know you can, wrong, you know? can't you? You're gonna offend. It's like a Scotsman and Englishman, you don't it want is, to mess that it up. Is. But uh, yeah, great interesting chat to talk to. Uh, obviously Ford's future is electrification. He works on the design side of EVs, electric vehicles, but he's loving, loving driving his uh, internal combustion engine around here at Laguna Seca, yeah, I'm sure. Bet. What do you, I mean, do you have to put sound effects in an electric car? Well, I mean, they do, they do in actual <laughs> like, fact. You know, yeah. I, I actually talked to, um, uh, Go on. Audi. Elon Musk. <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, the Audi drivers, um, uh, uh, the Scotsman, Dario Franchini. No, forgot his name. Yeah, Alan McNeish. Alan McNeish. Say it out loud. I forgot his <laughs> oh, name. Oh, oh, Alan McNeish. <laughs> but I talked to him about when they developed it, uh -huh. and he said that, that, that they literally had to pipe in the engine noises yeah. just to get used to uh, not having that sound in there. Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah it's, it's something. Why, Alan McNeish? Of all people to forget. <laughs> It's been a long day. Yeah, it's been a long day, and Johnny, you've done a fantastic job. I've been bobbing around the paddock area doing, you know, little inserts, but you've been up here holding the fort, and, uh, oh, boy, you've done it well as we're, as we're on the final lap. Yep, and it looks as though Todd Willing is going, God willing, to make yeah, it all the way to the final he is. corner. Here he comes. And it's been a good display in that 1968 Ford Escort. And he takes it across wow. and takes the checkered flag, as many have done since 1955 right here. Or 57 to be more accurate, but hey, you could mark it back to 1950. And the Pebble Beach races won first by Phil Hill, the great world champion from America. Somewhat of a great footnote to say it all started that way here on the Monterey Peninsula. And we continue in the Monterey reunion. My thanks to James Alder and obviously to Kev Harris and all of the guests we've had here today. Been absolutely inundated with some great stars of motor racing uh, and a part of the fabric of American racing history. Uh, been absolutely charmed by the likes of Charles Nierberg. Uh, great to have Ron Fellows, uh, Patrick Long. I know you've talked to some very interesting folks. Dario Franchitti, what a gentleman. Great gentleman. Adrian Newey. Oh, How yeah. About that? You started your day with him. <laughs> I know. Not a bad star. Not really. And still enjoying it as much as ever. Still very much at the sharp end with Red Bull in Formula One. And we'll be back here for Austin. And of course, the big Vegas race to come in November. But well done to Todd Willing of Franklin, Missouri for taking the win. I think he's an Aussie or a Kiwi, but it doesn't matter. He's the winner here at Laguna Seca, and many have come before and after. I'm sure will enjoy that sensation. But, of but just to finish, flag. I mean, just to finish a one-hour endurance race in a 70-year-old, 60-year-old. I mean, that's look, these yeah, guys. You, uh, these yeah. guys are all winners. They're it's all good, winners. Good there, is, there are no losers here. Yeah, it's not like we had a bunch of breakdowns, is it? No. Yeah, a few guys ran wide. Whatever. Guys yeah. had a spin here and there. But these cars are bulletproof. And I, I think you're right. I think that's a great footnote to our first day here is to show just how brilliant these designers, makers of these cars, to have them running at these speeds here at this modern Laguna circuit is incredible. Well, thanks to all of you joining us here. I hope you've enjoyed our coverage here. And I hope you've enjoyed this celebration of a bygone era for the enthusiasts around the world that love motor racing. Hope you've enjoyed our coverage here from Laguna Seca. We'll be back to do it all again, all 14 categories. We're having fun. Join us tomorrow to do the same. Until then, from me, Jonathan Green, and the rest of the Greenlight crew, bye-bye for now.